Honorable Senators, the President. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this Parliament, and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Gambri peoples, who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area, and pay respect to the elders, past and present, of all Australia's Indigenous peoples. Are there any documents to be tabled by the clerk? Clerk. Uh, Mr President, I table documents listed on the dynamic red. I understand there are no proposals for committees to meet during the sittings of the Senate today, so I'll call Senator Rustin. Uh, I move that intervening business be postponed uh, till after consideration of government business notices of motions number one and three, and I move that the question now be put. The question is that question be put. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. The question now is that the motion moved by Senator Rustin be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Rustin. Um, no. Oh, sorry, I'll call I the clerk. You... Sorry. Government business notice of motion oh, number one okay. standing in the name of Senator Rustin. Senator Rustin. Oh, I move the motion. Thank you. The question is the motion moved by Senator Rustin be agreed to. Government business motion number one. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. So, so the, to the, I'm just checking that I'm not missing anyone on the screen. Those that, to the contrary, no. The ayes have it. The clerk. Government business notice motion number three for the exemption of bills from the cutoff order. Senator Rustin. Move the motion. The question is that motion be agreed to. Senator Seward. Yes, hey. I've got Senator Waters. Is that your? Yes. Yes? yes. You're trying to draw my attention to Senator Waters. Senator Waters to contribute to the debate remotely. Senator Waters. Thanks very much, President. And I rise to speak on what is once again an abusive democratic process. Um, the government, sadly, with the full support of the opposition, is proposing to ram through three electoral bills uh, in the shadow of an election which is a feeble attempt to shore up their own grip on power. Now, there's a reason why the vote for the big parties is the lowest that it has been in history. It's because the community is sick of being put last after the interests of big corporate donors that seem to run the show in both the Liberal National Parties and the Labor Party. So what we have here is a proposal to ram through electoral legislation that hasn't even passed the House yet and to exempt it from the cutoff order, meaning that the Senate would have to uh, consider and deliberate these bills in almost record time with very little chance for scrutiny and debate. And perhaps it's not surprising that the two big parties have ganged up to ram through this anti-democratic legislation. Uh, because the effect of one of these bills would be to make it harder for smaller political parties, and in particular new political parties, to even nominate themselves uh, for 
uh, availability to be voted for at an election. So rather than actually have a contest of ideas and have the two big parties put themselves to the mercy of uh, the public with some decent policies, which might not be a bad idea, uh, instead we see the two big parties are ganging up to lock out new entrants to the political system. Well, as I said, it's no wonder that the vote for the two big parties is so low these days. It's at historic lows uh, because, frankly, it's hard to tell them apart most of the time. Um, and everybody knows they don't put the interests of the public first. They put the interests of their donors and their future employers um, in various vested interest sectors. So uh, it's not surprising, but it is still an absolute abomination that the two big parties are ganging up once again, like they so often do, this time to try and stitch up our electoral laws to shore up their own power. So the, the bills that they want to ram through uh, without proper scrutiny, without a proper inquiry, without a proper debate, uh, with a minuscule speakers list in the lower house, I, I understand, um, would restrict the ability of new parties to put themselves forward to be voted for. Now, one of the reasons the government says they want to do this is that they they want to make sure that small parties have the support of Australians. Well, you know, memo, the way to check the support from Australians is at the ballot box. Uh, the fact that you want to eliminate other people even putting themselves forward just shows how feeble uh, your grip on power is. And frankly, you should take a look at your own policy platform and the priorities uh, that you put to the voting public if you're worried about your diminishing vote. Uh, so we will be opposing this exemption from the cutoff order. It is bad process and it is bad process that is in aid of entrenching the two party system, uh, which I think sadly everybody's used to these days, but it still doesn't make it acceptable. So you can't just treat the Senate and the parliament as a plaything. This is meant to be a house of review. We are meant to be doing a job to scrutinise legislation. The Greens and the Crossmen want to do that job, but the Liberal and Labor parties are ganging up to ram through this legislation. Legislation that conveniently will make it harder for competitors at the ballot box. I just think this is ringing the rules in favour of the two big parties who are clinging to uh, diminishing power rather than actually revisiting their own priorities and putting the community first. Um, and putting the climate science first and putting the public interest first. No, instead they just want to lock out new parties. They want to increase the number of members that have to belong to a political party and then they don't want anyone using any name that even vaguely resembles um, anybody else's name. They just can't handle competition because they know that their policy platforms are so mediocre uh, that that's why their vote is diminishing. So the Greens will be opposing this exemption from the cutoff order. We don't believe that legislation should ever be rammed through, certainly not legislation that would benefit and entrench the two parties and diminish democracy right um, in the shadow of an upcoming election. Honestly, just when you think it couldn't be any less safe to go in the water, um, this government and the flaccid opposition that seems to forget that it is an opposition once again deliver the goods. Senator Rustin. I move that the question now be put. The question is that the question be put. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. Aye. The ayes have it. Senator Seal, would you like to have the Greens' position recorded? Just about. I was waiting for you to call it. Yeah. The <laughs> ayes have it, Senator. So the Greens' position in opposition to that procedural yes. motion is recorded. I'll Thank now you. put the motion, Government Business Motion Number Three, moved by Senator Rustin. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it, Senator Seawood. Can you please record our position as opposing that? So recorded. Vote? Um, and Senator Patrick, you can't vote, but you'd like Hansard to record your opposition to that government business motion number that's, three. That, that's correct, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. President. Thank you. So uh, recorded in Hansard. Um, I will call. Ooh. I have a bill. I have received a message from the House of Representatives forwarding the Surveillance Legislation Amendment Identify and Disrupt Bill 2021 for concurrence. Senator Rustin. I move that this bill may proceed without formalities and now be read a first time. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. The clerk. A bill to amend the Surveillance Devices Act 2004 and for other purposes. 
Uh, Senator Rustin. I table a revised explanatory memorandum relating to the bill and move that this bill now be read a second time, and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated into Hansard. Is leave granted? It is. I will now call Senator Keneally. Is the debate continue? Senator Keneally. Thank you, Mr. President. I rise to speak on the surveillance legislation amendment Identify and Disrupt Bill 2020. The Identify and Disrupt Bill was, serves as another example of how seriously Labor takes its commitment to constructive bipartisan cooperation on national security legislation in the national interest. Another example of how seriously we take balancing the needs of law enforcement agencies with the protection of privacy and civil liberties. One way that Labor does this is through the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security. Labor committee members work diligently and carefully to weigh the significant powers being introduced, the operational needs explained to us by our law enforcement agencies, and the views raised by industry, experts, and community groups. The Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security made 33 substantial recommendations and I note that the government has accepted and sought to incorporate the vast majority of these to this bill. This bill is a better bill because of these amendments, and as such, Labor will be supporting this bill today. I will shortly turn to the amendments. However, let me first note that there is a perennial tension between how quickly criminals can adapt their tradecraft and how long it takes to properly scrutinize and introduce the legislation required to counteract and disrupt criminal activity. And that tension is certainly laid bare in this bill. Technology is constantly changing the threat environment, creating new places for, criminals to for crimes to take place and new methods to disguise and hide identities and locations. Cyber criminals are increasingly taking advantage of accessible, easy to use and cheap technology to obscure their activities. And in this environment, the Australian Federal Police and the Australian Criminal Intelligence Commission have found the tools afforded to them by the existing electronic surveillance powers lacking in the fight against serious and organised crime. As the AFP Commissioner told the committee during our hearings, it's like fighting crime with one hand tied behind your back. It is to address this problem and this technology that the Identify and Disrupt Bill uh, will amend the Surveillance's Device Act 2004, the Crimes Act 1914 and associated legislation. It inter introduces new law enforcement powers to enhance the AFP and the ACIC's ability to combat serious and organized crime that is facilitated by the dark web and other anon anonymizing technologies. We often hear discussion of, shadowy, of the shadowy world of cybercrime, but it's really worth understanding what it is that we're talking about here because these definitions are key to understanding the intent of this bill. Anonymizing technology is a technology that disguises a person's activity, location, and true identity. Many people use this technology to protect their personal information for very legitimate reasons. The dark web refers to those parts of the internet which cannot be accessed without special browsers, like tunnels running below ground. And then there are the dedicated encrypted communication platforms, devices designed for and marketed to criminals to use to avoid law enforcement detection. There are three powers being granted to the AFP and the ACIC by this bill. First, data disruption warrants will enable the AFP and the ACIC to disrupt data by modifying, adding, copying or deleting data. They might do this to frustrate or prevent a crime as an alternative course of action if prosecution is not necessarily the most expedient or effective outcome. This could be particularly valuable for preventing access to child exploitation material. If the identity and the location of participants is unknown, a data disruption warrant could at least enable authorities to remove the content. Secondly, network activity warrants will permit access to the devices and networks used to facilitate criminal activity, allowing agencies to reveal the scope of criminal operations and the identities of those involved. And thirdly, account takeover warrants will provide the AFP and the ACIC with the ability to take control of a person's online account for the purposes of gathering evidence to further criminal investigation. Currently, agencies can only take over a person's account with that person's consent. This power facilitates covert and forced takeovers. 
The bill also proposes an expanded oversight remit for the Inspector General of Intelligence and Security to cover the AFP and the ACIC activities under network activity warrants. I will now want to turn to the amendments proposed by the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security and the government's response. The government has implemented wholly or substantially 23 of the PJCIS's 33 recommendations through legislative amendments or changes to the explanatory memorandum to this bill. Significantly, these changes include issue, strengthening the issuing criteria for warrants, including considerations for privacy, public interest, privileged and journalistic information, and financial impacts. Reviews by the Independent National Security Legislation Monitor and the PJCIS. Sunset powers in five years. And good faith immunity provisions for assistance orders. These are significant recommendations made in a bipartisan fashion by the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security, and I am pleased that the government has taken them up in the form of legislative amendments to this bill. Of the other 10 PJCIS recommendations, four have been accepted by the government and will be incorporated into its response to the comprehensive review of the national intelligence community conducted by Dennis Richardson. These are that the ombudsman's powers be expanded to cover the AFP and the ACIC. The government has noted this was recommended by the Richardson Review and accepted by the government and will be implemented as part of the government's electronic surveillance reforms. The committee also recommended that the issuing authority for these warrants should be a superior court judge or an eligible judge. These are extraordinary powers, and committee members felt that they required a higher level of authorization. The government has noted that the Richardson Review recommended a comprehensive reform of all the surveillance laws to bring consistency, avoid duplication, and avoid ad hoc amendments across several acts, including the Telecommunications Interception and Access Act, the ASIO Act, the Surveillance Devices Act, and the Crimes Act. This does include issuing authorities, which Richardson observed were inconsistently applied across these powers. The government has confirmed to me that it has initiated this review and that the Slade bill will be included in this review, and the government will be consulting publicly as part of this process. The committee also recommended that the government review the definition of serious offenses, again noting that there were inconsistent applications of that term across several acts. The government has confirmed to me that the Richardson Review recommended that serious offenses will be defined consistently across all legislation as crimes uh, with the sentences of a minimum of five years. The government has accepted that recommendation. And the committee also recommended that the post-warrant concealment powers must be exercised within 28 days unless approved by a superior court judge. The government noted in its briefings with me, and the minister has confirmed, that this is an issue in other legislation, including TOLA, and noted that the Richardson Review recommended the comprehensive reform of all electronic surveillance laws to bring that consistency, avoid duplication, and avoid ad hoc amendments across the various acts. The government confirms it's initiated this review and that Slade will be included in it and the government will be consulting publicly as part of this process. Another recommendation that the, the uh, government has accepted but is not progressing with this bill but as part of another process is the committee's recommendation that a public interest advocate must be appointed when warrants are being sought in relation to journalists or media organizations. The government does note and accept this recommendation, the minister has confirmed to me, noting that it is responding to this recommendation um, as part of its response uh, to the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security's report into the impact of the exercise of law enforcement and intelligence powers on the freedom of the press. I do note that three of the recommendations were rejected in essence, by the government that go to the expansion of the PJCS oversight to the intelligence functions of the ACIC and the AFP, as well as expansion of the IGIS oversight to the intelligence functions of the AFP. Uh, the government takes a view uh, that parliamentary oversight exists through the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Law Enforcement Integrity, uh, and they note that the Richardson Review uh, did not uh, endorse expanding the IGIS's oversight to the intelligence functions of the AFP. I think it is useful uh, to note here that while Labor acknowledges that is the government's position, nonetheless I would like to make clear uh, that Labor in government 
would implement all of the PJCIS's recommendations to the Slade Bill. Uh, I would like to publicly thank the Minister for Home Affairs, Karen Andrews, uh, and the Department of Home Affairs for their readiness uh, to, to provide briefings and advice to my office in our consideration of this bill, and particularly in understanding the government's response to the PJCIS report. I would say that it has been an example of uh, the national interest and acknowledge that the Minister for Home Affairs, uh, since taking the role, has sought at various times to work constructively with the opposition in the national interest to deliver uh, uh, much needed uh, reforms and powers to enable our agencies to keep up uh, and to protect, to keep up with the changes in technology and to protect the Australian community. Uh, I will note uh, that uh, the government has added two amendments uh, that when a national emergency has been declared, the minister's power to modify administrative arrangements does not apply to account takeover warrants, bringing the bill into conformity uh, with the Surveillance Devices Act and the Crimes Act, and aligning reporting periods for the ombudsman uh, with other reporting periods for agencies uh, to the ombudsman as recommended by the PJCIS in the bill. Um, and uh, I acknowledge those amendments and uh, advise that we are pleased to see them. Uh, these are extraordinary powers. In reviewing its support for this bill and in its committee considerations, Labor accorded the highest priority to ensuring the government had provided the strongest case that these powers were absolutely necessary and proportional. The explanatory memorandum sets out that these powers apply to the most serious of crimes, including child abuse and exploitation, terrorism, the sale of illicit drugs, human trafficking, identity theft and fraud, assassinations and the distribution of weapons. Those calling for these powers embed their justifications in the context of these most appalling and chilling crimes. In many ways, they're right to do this, for dismayingly, dismayingly this is how the worst of criminals think. We must also alert, be alert, though, to any surveillance creep. It's obviously must, much easier to justify the introduction of extraordinary powers by focusing on only the most serious of crime types, especially crimes like child abuse, exploitation and terrorism. But it's incumbent on the government and the agencies to engage in the more difficult task of justifying the ex introduction of extraordinary powers by reference to how the powers could actually be used. And Labor is concerned that the definition of relevant offences under the Surveillance Devices Act includes all offences against the law of the Commonwealth that are punishable by a maximum term of imprisonment of three years or more. And that does include the type of crimes that I have listed above, terrorism and child exploitation, but it also includes tax offences, trademark infringement and a range of other offences which objectively do not fall within the categories of child abuse, exploitation, terrorism, the sale of illicit drugs, human trafficking, identity thought and theft theft, uh, and assassinations, and the distribution of weapons. The Intelligence and Security Committee heard, con heard concerns from experts that this is too broad a focus for these powers and encompass too many minor offenses. And that's why Labor members added additional comments to see that this bill do is tied to, to serious offenses. It would be an important constraint on the use of these new warrant powers, and it would limit the application to offenses that carry a maximum of at least seven years in jail and other specified offenses. However, um, I do note, as I just did, that the government is progressing the recommendations of the Richardson Review, and this will go some way to addressing this concern. Labor does not play politics with national security legislation. Our committee work and our negotiation on amendments regarding the Identify and Disrupt Bill testifies to that. Which is why I cannot conclude my remarks today without noting we were very disheartened when in June Mr. Morrison tried to blame Labor for somehow delaying this bill. The, amendment, the amended bill only passed the House yesterday. It only came out of the committee very recently. Yet almost three months ago, apparently, Mr. Morrison said Labor was blocking its passage. Three months ago, the Bipartisan Intelligence and Security Committee, chaired by my colleague who sits opposite Senator Patterson, was still conducting its consideration, conducting its hearings and drafting its report. We were still doing the work of scrutiny that the Australian public would hope its elected officials do and that we take it seriously. And we were doing that together on the committee, constructively, bipartisan way, and in the national interest. And I acknowledge my Liberal colleagues on the committee for that commitment that they bring. It is cause for dismay that Mr. Morrison would publicly seek to undermine that bipartisan cooperation. And it's cause for dismay that Mr. Morrison simply flat out lied on an issue of national security. Labor's goal in supporting this bill is to ensure that our agencies are at the tip of, have the tip of the spear when confronting the most serious 
cyber-enabled crimes, and that the AFP and the ACIC have the settings appropriate to a crime landscape that's forever changing with this technological process. It is a more robust bill as a result of the PJCIS's recommendations, and as a result, uh, Labor will be supporting it. It is vital we continue to work constructively in the interest of national security. Thank you, Senator Keneally. Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Acting uh, Deputy President or Deputy President. I rise to speak on the Surveillance Legislation Amendment Bill. Unsurprisingly, the two major parties are in complete lockstep with each other and they are leading us down the road to a surveillance state. The bill proposes to amend the Surveillance Devices Act 20, 2004 the SDA and the Crimes Act 1914 to give three new powers to the Australian Federal Police and the Australian Criminal Intelligence Commission, ACIC. They are data disruption warrants to allow offensive data disruption powers to stop the suspected commission of an offence using a computer. These warrants can also be given with compulsory assistance orders. These orders compel any person and with relevant knowledge or expertise help the AFP or the ACIC to disrupt data. If they don't help, they could be landed with 10 years imprisonment. The second are network activity warrants. These enable the ACIC or the AFP to monitor the computer-related activities of criminal groups to collect intelligence instead of, say, investigating an offence to obtain evidence. And third, account takeover warrants, which authorise the AFP or ACIC to take control of online account that is suspected of being used to commit an offence to enable an investigation. The Greens are the ones who led the push to get this legislation reviewed by the committee when the government, with the help of the opposition, mind you, tried to push this through the parliament. We tried to refer this bill to the Legal and Constitutional Affairs Committee. However, this failed and it was referred to the closed shop Labor and Liberal PJCIS. So the Greens aren't allowed or into that committee to make decisions or contribute to those decisions, nor is anybody else. It's a closed shop between Lib and Lab uh, who may as well join as one and uh, forget the rest. In effect, this bill would allow spy agencies to modify, add, copy or delete your data with a dis data disruption warrant. Collect intelligence on your online activities with a network activity warrant. Also, they can take over your social media and other online, online accounts and profiles with an account takeover warrant. What's worse, the data disruption and network activity warrants could be issued by a member of the Administrative Appeals Tribunal? Really? It is outrageous that these warrants won't come from a judge of a superior court that is appointed on their personal capacity. The bill also limits court oversight in decisions concerning the issuing of these warrants when criminal proceedings have already started. It is not clear that these powers are needed. The Richardson Review recommended that law enforcement agencies should not be given specific cyber disruption powers like those in this bill. The Richardson Review concluded there was not a material gap in existing investigative powers, which could justify effectively placing the AFP or ACIC in the position of judge 
jury and executioner. The proposal to give specific intelligence collection powers on the AFP and ACIC under network activity warrants does not clearly identify a gap in existing powers. So you're not telling us everything, expecting us to make decisions without real, genuine, informed consent. The scope of the new powers is disproportionate compared to the threats of serious and organised cybercrime to which they are directed. There is a lack of evidence justifying the need for warrants of this nature beyond those already available to the AFP and ACIC. No other country in the Five Eyes Alliance have, has conferred powers on its law enforcement agency that this bill will. What's more, the government moved 60 amendments in the other place as a block at the last moment, and now we're all here expected to jump through hoops without the time to scrutinise the legislation properly. I foreshadow a second reading amendment in my name and also further substantive amendments that would go some way to improving this terribly flawed, problematic legislation. This country lacks a robust human rights framework that would provide adequate protection against the abuse of powers contained in this bill. In the absence of those safeguards, the Australian Greens cannot endorse the expansion of the already considerable powers possessed by the Australian Federal Police and the ACIC to intrude on the privacy of everyday law-abiding people. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Thorpe. Uh, we have Senator Roberts remotely. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. The Surveillance Legislation Amendment, Identify and Disrupt Bill 2020, is a series of amendments to the Surveillance Devices Act 2004 and Telecommunications Interception and Access Act 1979. The intention is to broaden the existing powers of the Australian Federal Police to pursue cybercrime and, in particular, serious offences relating to child exploitation, terrorism and the dark web criminal syndicates. That's all laudable. The intention of this legislation is to give the Australian Federal Police more power to spy on those they deem to be terrorists and criminals. The difference between the existing act and the amendment is the ability to damage criminal data without an arrest, prosecution or knowing the identity of an offender. These two aspects of the bill open the door to unexpected consequences and undesired applications of these new powers. A well-drafted bill, on the other hand, would not suffer from these shortcomings. A major reason for the bill is the increasing use of encrypted apps, including TOR, Tor. The Tor network is an encrypted platform that cannot be accessed by third parties, including law enforcement. The only way to get to a Tor site that is disseminating child porn, for instance, instructions on terrorism and such like, is to take over the server and intercept users accessing the site and uploading material. This bill allows the government to add a tracking routine to an image or video and then, when the video is played or the image opened, it dials home to the federal police to advise the location of the user. Now that sounds reasonable. That entails the government to pose though as a user and upload tagged material. This legislation gives the Australian Federal Police immunity for uploading illegal content in this manner. That is acceptable. However, the checks and balances on how that will work are deficient. They are not adequate. If those planning freedom rallies, for instance, are classified by the Federal Police as terrorists, then the government has the ability to upload tracking tags that will identify people whose only crime is exercising their right to freedom of protest. This legislation could be used to roll up entire organisations in one action that was simply critics of the government if in the case of COVID protesters, their activity was deemed illegal. 
The Senate's standing committee for the scrutiny of bills remained concerned with the authorization of coercive powers and a general lack of consistency with justification for the issuing of these warrants. It also raised concerns about the use of emergency circumstances to conceal things done to execute the warrant. These are also my concerns. It's clear from the sheer volume of objection and recommendations that this bill has privacy and human rights issues to iron out before it could reasonably be passed to the satisfaction of industry partners and associated private sector companies who handle the data being surveilled. Twitter, for example, has an unresolved dispute that the scope of these powers may leave them in breach of international laws where their servers are housed. These focus on privacy during the takeover warrant, and they wish to amend the bill to reflect practices that are consistent with established norms of privacy, free expression, and the rule of law. I know it's hard to imagine Twitter arguing for uh, free expression and the rule of law because it, it doesn't provide free expression itself, but nonetheless, we need to take note of what that what, what is just said. Amazon Web Servers has made a specific recommendation for good faith immunity to cover digital providers during the execution of account takeover warrants. Now, various recommendations have been made for the bill to be withdrawn by the Queensland Council for Civil Liberties, Liberty Victoria, Electronic Frontiers Australia, and the Australian Privacy Foundation. Madam Acting Deputy President, there is no inherent problem with increasing police powers to hunt down anonymous perpetrators of serious crime online. However, these measures do not afford innocent parties enough protection from being mistakenly targeted by increased police power and political power. The haste with which this bill has been ushered through Parliament is a disgrace. It looks like it's another dodgy deal by the Lib Lab Uni Party. Is it that Senator Wong and Senator Birmingham behind closed doors are the government and the Senate is their rubber stamp. This parliament no longer allows the principles that comprise the foundations of our democracy. And that brings shame on the Liberal Party, the Nationals and the Labor Party. And I want to take note of some, some points that I have, have from notes uh, that we've been given in our briefing. There are considerable objections being raised by committees and third party digital platforms and other independent groups. So while we recognize the basic need for this, there are still severe objections. And let me go through some of these. Criticism cited by committee recommendations related to the increase of police powers in relation to privacy laws and inadequately stated definitions regarding their application. It may be worth proposing a further amendment to ensure that these powers of surveillance and interference are strictly contained rather than implied to matters of particular criminal offences. Perhaps a deliberate exclusion may be used to ensure they are not invoked for what may be considered political crimes. We're giving people, police, enormous powers to intrude into the lives of people. And that needs to be very carefully managed. It is doubtful, for example, that the original act would have allowed privacy violations, the takeover or disruption of data in pursuit of political protesters or those with online accounts which speak out against the government. A direct exclusion may be the easiest way of clarifying. If it is refused, then the amendment switch from being perfectly sensible to potentially dangerous. The bill has been referred to the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security. 23 submissions have been published to date. There was also a public hearing held on the 10th of March, 2021. I read from my notes, the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Human Rights has not formed a final view. It has asked for further and received advice from the Minister to which questions still remain regarding safeguards. In essence, it wants an amendment to ensure propor proportionality and oversight recognise that the bill will promote some human rights in relation to liberating the victims of cyber-based crime, but also limited other rights related to privacy. It was also among those concerned about, inadequate, about adequate safeguards. The Senate Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Bills also submitted a report on the January 29, 2021. This committee noted a concern that the increased warrant powers have the potential to unduly trespass on personal rights and liberties. 
and insist that given the scope of these powers, efforts should be made to tighten their application. Efforts should be made to tighten their application. The minister's response made a minor clarification regarding who can issue warrants and sought to justify the 90-day period for the warrant. The committee remained concerned with the authorization to, to coercive the authorization of coercive powers and a general lack of consistency with justification for the issuing of these warrants. It also raised concerns about the use of emergency circumstances to conceal things done to execute the warrant. Further committee concerns exist regarding the infringement of rights for third parties caught up in the executing of these warrants, particularly during a search of the target premises to which the minister reiterated that criminal network of individuals needs to remain broad enough to cover any unwitting third parties. It is clear from the sheer volume of objection and recommendation that this bill has privacy and human rights issues to iron out before it could be reasonably passed to the satisfaction of industry partners and associated private sector companies who handle the data being surveilled. They all agree, as I would suggest we look at, that there is no inherent problem with increasing police powers to hunt down anonymous perpetrators of serious crime online, especially against children and for sex offences. Instead, this bill, though, highlights previous failures in Australian law, which do not afford innocent parties enough protection from being mistakenly targeted by increased police power. These recommendations highlight and recognise that the system has a poor record when it comes to regulating itself. It just seems that this has had far too little work done and ignores some fundamentals. And before finishing, Madam Acting Deputy President, I would like the Senate to note that One Nation did not support the exemption of four electoral bills earlier from, from committee consideration. We did not support those bills being exempted. And uh, we have grave concerns about this bill now before the Senate. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Thank you, Senator Roberts. Um, before I move on to Senator Patrick remotely, I might just um, ask Senator Hanson Young, are you happy to move the second reading amendment on behalf of Senator Thorpe? Thank you. Uh, Senator Patrick remotely. Uh, thank you, uh, Acting, Madam Act, uh, Acting Deputy President. I just want to make sure that you can hear me properly because I've got a few glitches on my end. Um, Senator Patrick. Is it, so, Senator Patrick, the, the uh, uh, camera doesn't Log off and log back on again. We can he hear and see you now, Senator Patrick, so you might be all right. OK, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for uh, allowing me the opportunity to speak on this, uh, on this bill. Uh, I must say I am very concerned that uh, it has been dropped on the Senate in the very uh, last uh, minutes or, or hours uh, we, we find out that this bill is on. And in fact, that's caused some difficulty for me because uh, there are some amendments to this bill uh, that I uh, intend to move, and I foreshadow, uh, um, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, that I intend to move uh, an amendment in the Committee of the Whole. Um, this bill seeks to broaden powers uh, in relation to the AFP, <laughs> and in principle, I support what it is that the government is trying to do. Hi there, Sean. But this this bill is again. Uh, further um, powers that are granted <clears throat> to our security forces, to our police forces, that are used in secret. They're quite coercive, uh, and uh, they require the appropriate checks and balances. And I know that uh, Se uh, Senator Roberts raised some concerns in this area as he uh, spoke as well, simply that these powers can potentially uh, be abused. Um, I intend in uh, the committee, committee of the Whole to move an amendment. <clears throat> it's an amendment that I've moved before that seeks to expand the powers of the PJCIS to look at matters that are operational and go to uh, information uh, gathering uh, by our intelligence services. The 
importance of this uh, is something that I raised in my first speech, basically pointing out that the parliament, of course, has the power to conduct oversight of our intelligence agencies. It simply doesn't because it's carved out uh, that ability in the Intelligence Services Act. The parliament has self-censored itself uh, or, or prevented itself from conducting intelligence oversight. Now, that is an aberration in amongst our Five Eyes nations. Uh, we see very strong oversight from the US uh, in the Senate. The same in the UK. We are effectively not doing our job properly. Uh, I have, uh, on several occasions, sought to remedy this. I mentioned it in my first speech. On the 7th of December 2017, I gave uh, much, much greater uh, detail. Uh, I, I've uh, moved uh, an amendment on the 9th of May 2018 to the Home Affairs and Integ uh, Integrity Agencies Legislation Amendment Bill uh, 2018. Uh, I've also, I also did it on the 26th of June 2018 to the National Security Legislation Amendment Espionage and Foreign Interference Bill. I've also moved a private members bill in relation to this. I, uh, mo I've moved a similar amendment uh, in relation to uh, the Counterterrorism Temporary Exclusion Orders Consequential Amendment Bill uh, uh, 2019. I did that on the 29th of July 2019. Uh, on the, uh, the 3rd of September, I moved it uh, again in relation to the Australian Citizenship Amendment Citizen Cessation Bill. Uh, uh, on the 10th of December, I moved it, an amendment to the Australian Security Intelligence uh, Organisation's Amendment Bill. Sorry about that. I think someone's testing some fire alarms. But uh, um, I have consistently sought to, to move an amendment to increase the ability to balance out the powers with some appropriate checks and balances. And I might point out that on each occasion in which I've done this, Labor has committed from an intent perspective. They've said they recognise the intent. In fact, they have their own bill that does exactly this. And people might recall in the last sitting week when I moved a motion in relation to a referral to the, to, uh, the Legal and Constitutional Affairs Committee in relation to the operation uh, that uh, grounds the uh, claims that are before the ACT court in relation to Bernie, Bernie Caleri and, uh, of course, Witness K, who has now been dealt with by the court. And Labor stood up at that time and said, uh, we will investigate this. We will move a, re a referral when we get into government after we have amended the Intelligence Services Act to permit the PJCIS to conduct these sorts of investigations. Well, Labor, money where your mouth is. I'm going to move this amendment uh, in the Committee of the Whole, and I anticipate that you will support it. You keep saying that you want to uh, have the PJCIS conduct uh, oversight, as, as it should, uh, but consistently you... Uh, Uh, I apologise for the delay or, or for the lateness in circulating this amendment, but that is caused by the fact that the government brought this on uh, basically unannounced this morning. Uh, as a crossbencher, we worked through with the government on legislation, uh, making sure that we understand what it is we're voting on, making sure that, uh, that you know, we can contribute by way of amendments. Uh, we don't need to be uh, blitzkrieged by, uh, you know, by bills where, and where we don't have an opportunity to uh, participate, to participate in democracy, to put forward amendments. Uh, I, I will also thank very much the clerks and the drafting office for assisting me this morning in getting this amendment circulated as, as quickly as possible. Uh, again, uh, the government uh, has not done democracy any favours this morning. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Patrick. Minister. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, I rise to sum up debate on the Surveillance Legislation Amendment Identity and Disrupt Bill 2020. And in the first instance, I would like to thank my colleagues for their contributions to the debate. I'd also like to reaffirm that the Morrison government's first priority 
is ensuring the safety and the security of all Australians. We make absolutely no excuses for that. It is therefore vital that our law enforcement agencies have effective tools to protect the Australian community. This bill is one part of the government's response to the challenges posed by anonymising technologies and cyber-enabled crime, such as offending perpetrated on the dark web. What we are now seeing and what we are aware of is the increasing use of the dark web and anonymising technologies has significantly degraded agencies' ability to identify and disrupt serious crime occurring online. What this bill does, and I do note the comments made by the Australian Greens, by Senator Patrick and by Senator Roberts on behalf of One Nation, but let's make sure we are putting this bill into perspective. This bill introduces three measures to enhance the ability of the Australian Federal Police and the ACIC to identify and disrupt serious crime online. It does this. Data disruption warrants authorise the deletion or modification of data. And we're going to refer here to child exploitation material. That is what they are looking at to frustrate the commission of serious offences online. On any analysis, I would say that child exploitation material is an absolute disgrace. Network activity warrants enable the AFP and the ACIC to collect intelligence on criminal networks operating online. And account takeover warrants allow law enforcement to take control of online accounts in order to gather evidence about a person's online criminality and the activity of their associates. What these reforms will do is equip agencies with the tools and powers they need to protect the Australian community from serious criminals operating online. And again, I would like to highlight, Madam Acting Deputy President, President the types of behaviour we are addressing, including terrorists, organised crime and those who seek to harm our children. The bill is also supported by strong safeguards and oversight to protect the privacy of Australians and ensure that the powers are only used where necessary, proportionate and reasonable. The bill will substantially boost the capacity of the Australian Federal Police, as I've said, and the Australian Criminal Intelligence Commission, as I have said, to identify and disrupt serious criminal activity occurring online and, again, particularly activity by criminals who seek to use the dark web and other platforms to evade law enforcement. That is what they are doing. They are utilising these technologies, the dark web and other platforms, to evade law enforcement. The arrest of more than 290 criminals as part of Operation Ironside earlier this year was a testament to the dedication and hard work of our law enforcement agencies. But what it also demonstrated is the persistent and ever-evolving threat of transnational, serious and organised crime, and their increasing tendency to seek out and use technology often operated exclusively for the criminal market to conceal their offending. In the case of Operation Ironside, ingenuity and world-class capability gave our law enforcement an edge. That is a good thing when you look at what we are now confronted with in 2021. This bill is just one more step the government is taking. And again, we make no apology for protecting Australians to ensure 
that our agencies maintain that edge. The bill has been extensively reviewed by the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security, with a report tabled by the committee on 5 August 2021. And the government thanks the committee for its review of these important reforms. Let me make it clear. The Morrison government does not accept serious crime in our communities, and neither should we accept it online. Our laws must keep pace with technology if our agencies are to continue to do the job that we expect of them. And that job is consistent with the Morrison government's first priority, to ensure the safety and security of all Australians. And with those brief comments, I commend the bill to the Senate. Thank you, Senator Cash. The question is that the second reading amendment moved by Senator Hanson Young on behalf of Senator Thorpe be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. no. I think the noes have it. Senator Hanson Young. Uh, thank you. In the um, spirit of not calling divisions, could we just please uh, have recorded the Greens' uh, vote in relation to this? Leave is granted. That's so noted. Thank you, Senator Hanson Young. The question is, uh, Senator Brockman. I'll just put on the record Senator Griff's uh, position supporting this amendment as well. Thank you very much, Senator Brockman. The question is that the bill be read a second time. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. I, I think the ayes have it. Senator Hanson Young. Thank you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. Again, uh, if we could have the Greens' opposition to this bill recorded, please, and uh, any others who uh, may need to have theirs uh, articulated as well. Thank you, Senator Hanson Young. Wonderful. I call uh, Senator Roberts. Are you seeking the call? Senator Roberts, you might be on mute. Senator Roberts, we will take it that you're seeking to record your vote against. We'll, we'll come back to him on that. We'll come back to you on that matter, Senator Roberts. Thank you. Um, I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the Surveillance Devices Act 2004 and for other purposes. Is it the wish of the committee that the bill be taken as a whole? There being no objection, there is so ordered. And the question is that the bill stand as printed, uh, and we have amendments from Senator Patrick. Uh, yes, thank you very much, um, Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, I might need a little bit of assistance uh, remotely. Um, I, uh, I move uh, all of. Uh, I, I seek leave to move all. Uh, amendments on sheet 1412 together. Is leave granted? Yep. Thank you. <laughs> leave is granted, Senator Patrick. Thank you very much. Um, uh, again, this uh, amendment is an amendment that has, the Chamber has seen a number of times. What it seeks to do is uh, undo the censoring of our parliament or the restraint uh, on our own parliament for conducting oversight of uh, intelligence operations and uh, associated information gathering. This is an important amendment that basically uh, seeks to provide a check uh, and balance against the powers that are being proposed by the government. Uh, as I said, in principle, I support what it is that the government uh, is doing. Uh, I do share some of, some of uh, Senator Roberts' concerns. These sorts of concerns could be addressed um, if the PJCIS were able to examine uh, those operations. There is a safety mechanism in this amendment to make sure that it, if, if there is something that is extremely sensitive that's going on, that uh, 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 the PJCIS could be prevented from looking into the operation until after it has uh, commenced. Uh, so it has uh, appropriate safeguards. This is a, a good amendment. It's an oversight amendment. It's something that Labor indicated on several occasions it will support but has failed to, um, uh, and I commend it to the Senate. 
Thank you, Senator Patrick. Senator Cash, the minister. Uh, thank you. And the government uh, does not support the amendment move by Senator Patrick. The government's view is that the remit of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security should not be expanded to include oversight of agencies' operational activities. Uh, we consider that it remains appropriate for ministers to primarily oversee operations and be accountable to the parliament. The Inspector General of Intelligence and Security already has extensive powers to oversee and inquire into the legality and propriety of national intelligence community operations, publishes an unclassified version of reports and appears before the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security on non-operational matters. Uh, we consider that existing arrangements appropriately balance accountability with the need to protect sensitive operations and capabilities, and that further oversight by the committee is not necessary. Senator Hanson Young. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I just rise to indicate that the Greens will be supporting Senator Patrick's uh, amendments uh, as circulated um, and uh, raise similar concerns with Senator Patrick in relation to the, the rushing of this particular piece of legislation. Uh, just to let you know, there is another amendment being circulated in the name of Senator Thorpe, which we will also need to deal with today. Thank you for advising the Chamber of that, Senator Hanson Young. Senator Brockman. Madam Acting Deputy President, is this an appropriate time to record uh, One Nation's position on the previous motion? I'm I getting an indication from the clerk. Perhaps it is. It would be uh, useful to do, Senator Brockman. Uh, I just recall the that from the um, clerk. what the One Nation Party was voting against. This was just to clarify on the second reading. On the amendment. second reading. Thank you very much for that, Senator Brockman. That is. Madam Acting Deputy President, on the second reading. On the second reading, thank you very much, Senator Brockman, for clarifying that. Um, I'll put the question, uh, Senator Keneally. Yes, Madam Deputy Acting President, uh, I would like to just say a few words about Senator uh, Patrick's amendment you may. before we vote. Uh, just to acknowledge that Senator Patrick, uh, while I'm sure he has the best of intentions, moves this amendment at every national security bill. Uh, and every time he moves it, uh, we make clear once again uh, our view that it is not an appropriate mechanism by which to deal with his question. Uh, that, and I note again, for the record, that Senator McAllister has a private senator's bill uh, before the parliament that deals with these very questions. Uh, Labor would prefer to take a holistic and systemic approach to this question and not deal with it in the piecemeal fashion uh, that uh, we see Senator Patrick's uh, amendment does. Thank you, Madam Deputy Acting President. In the interest of time and my desire to see this bill pass this chamber this week, I just wanted to put on the record our view on this amendment. Thank you, Senator Keneally. The question is, oh, Senator Patrick is seeking the call. Thank you for putting your hand up. Senator thank Patrick. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, um, Madam Acting Deputy. Uh, actually, uh, Madam Chair. Um, uh, look, I will just respond to Senator Keneally. I note that it uh, looks like she might have run from her office to get there, and I appreciate her uh, doing that to make some comments. Uh, it, is, uh, it is a ruse to suggest that uh, you won't vote on a, an amendment to a government bill that uh, basically includes uh, the provisions of a private member's bill in People need to understand a private member's bill might get voted on in the Senate and go to the House and never be seen again. The only way to give effect to change is to put amendments to government bills that the government has to deal with in the House. Senator Keneally knows that, and so you know it's a bit disingenuous to suggest that uh, that, that this is in a, an inappropriate way to do it. That a private member's bill is a much better way. Um, I think everyone just needs to understand that I'm disappointed that Labor is again voting on a, an amendment that gives effect to its own policies. And look, I invite uh, Senator Keneally, if you don't quite like what my amendment does, to have the Labor Party introduce a similar amendment the next time a security bill goes through the, the, the parliament. So I, I just put that on the record, and uh, uh, we'll see next time around how serious the Labor Party really is. We do have these sorts of amendments uh, or these sorts of bills going through on a semi-regular basis, which is part of the problem 
uh, more and more powers get, uh, get made without the right checks and balances. So there's an opportunity there. I put the challenge to Senator Keneally, and we'll talk about this the next time uh, a, an intelligence bill goes through the, the, the chamber. You are simply so weak on giving effect to change uh, uh, as, as uh, uh, bills go through this place. Uh, you, you simply stand up and talk, but you never actually do anything. And that's a significant problem. And uh, you know, Labor ought to uh, reflect on, on this. They're not serving the public well. They're, uh, they're in effect, uh, dudding their own policy. There, there's a way in which these things can be done. And uh, sadly, uh, you're not up to the task. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Patrick. Senator Lambie, you're seeking the call. Uh, thank you, Acting Madam Deputy President. Um, I'll be supporting uh, Senator Patrick's uh, amendment as well, uh, so if I could have that noted. Um, but the other thing is, I just have a question for uh, the minister, if I may. You may, Senator Lambie. Thank you. Um, so, Minister, I'm just wondering if this legislation, uh, for example, um, I'm not sure people out there know this, but there's people that work in your parliamentary office that can walk out with whatever they want when they leave as staff, and that would include files and personal files. Uh, would this uh, be able to um, fix that issue uh, whatsoever without any charges or anything being laid? Like, you know, and then using that material against you on social media platforms? Will, will, this, will this fix any of that, Minister? Senator Lambry, I couldn't quite properly hear what you were saying. So what I'll do is I'll take you through what the purpose of the bill is. And in taking you through what the purpose of the bill is, it may well then answer the question that you have posed. This is all about, as I said, part of the government's response to the challenges posed by anonymising technologies and cyber-enabled crime, such as offending perpetrated on the dark web. What the bill itself does, and I'll just briefly summarise it for you uh, in three parts, is enhance the ability of the AFP and the ACIC to identify and disrupt. It's all about serious crime online. In that regard, data disruption warrants authorise the deletion or modification of data. The examples that I'd previously given uh, were such as child exploitation material to frustrate the commission of serious offences online. Uh, network activity warrants enable the AFP and the ACIC to collect intelligence on criminal networks operating online. And account takeover warrants allow law enforcement to take control of online accounts in order to gather evidence about a person's online criminality and the activity of their associates. So very much, Senator Lambie, this is in relation to this particular bill uh, is in relation to the challenges posed by anonymising technologies and cyber-enabled crime. And the most obvious example that people understand is offending perpetrated on the dark web. Yeah. So that's what. What are serious offences? What, what, what exactly are you talking about with the serious offences? Is it, was there a list? What serious offences? What, what constitutes serious offences? Minister. Senator Lampy, I am just getting for you the list of serious offences, and I'm sure the advisers are looking for me to ensure that I do have them. Uh, but in particular, if I could look at for you exactly what we're looking at targeting. And as you'd know there, the dark web itself uh, refers to areas of the internet which are intentionally hidden and cannot be accessed without using specialised browsers. Um, I think you'd also know, because of the nature of the dark web, 
This area of the internet is not indexed by ordinary search engines. When you're looking at what anonymising technology itself is, um, this refers to technologies which can be used to disguise a person's activity, location and true identity. When you actually also look at what the types of serious crimes are, they include child abuse and exploitation, they include terrorism, they include the sale of illicit drugs and weapons. Uh, so we're referring to that there. In terms of the warrants, uh, warrants can only be sought in relation to what is called a relevant offence. This is a federal offence or a state offence that has a federal aspect, punishable by a maximum term of imprisonment of three years or more. When you look at that particular um, criteria, it is consistent with existing thresholds for warranted powers uh, as set out in the Surveillance Devices Act 2004. And I have some further information to you. Uh, amendments have been made to the issuing criteria for warrants to ensure that when considering whether to issue a warrant, issuing authorities give extra weight to the most serious types of cyber-enabled crime. And this, which is what you were referring to, this reflects the purposes of the bill and uh, the PJCIS's intent to focus the use of these powers, and I go back to the original um, answer that I was giving to you, to focus the use of these powers on the most serious of crimes perpetrated on the dark web and through the use of anonymising technologies and, again, as I would referred to previously, including child exploitation, terrorism, cybercrime, money laundering and drugs and firearm trafficking. And that uh, that Lambert. serious offences, oh, sorry, uh, those um, serious offences that list who decides what what's going to be serious offences that taken off someone else's uh, uh, blueprint somewhere, or was that just decided within the committee itself? Because obviously, you know, if you're going to go through court, it's got to come under one of those serious offences. Whatever you've dictated, the serious offences will be. Where where does that? Who lists those serious offences? Senator Cash. Ambie, I'm instructed that it is in the bill itself what is the issuing authority. Oh, no, I know, I understand the authority, but where, where did, what, 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 how did you come up with, how did they come up with a list that they were the only serious offences? So is that just because that's in the bill, is it? Because there are other serious offences out there, but obviously these are, these are the ones you're concentrating on in this bill, yeah? Minister, if you look at the previous answer I gave to you, it was the bill covers all offences, and I'll just read it out uh, to you as well. The bill covers all offences, and I'll go back to you. Warrants can only be sought in relation to a relevant offence, which is a federal offence or a state offence that has a federal aspect punishable by a maximum term of imprisonment of three years or more. Thank Senator you. Lambie, no further Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Deputy Chair. Thank you. Senator Hanson-Young. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I understand that Senator Thorpe has some questions, if you, she could have the call. Uh, on the Patrick Amendment, Senator Hanson-Young? Generally in the, in the committee section. Okay. Thank you. Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Acting Deputy Chair. Uh, my questions, Minister, is around this bill rejects a core recommendation of the Richardson's review that law enforcement agencies should not be given specific cyber disruption powers as would apply under the proposed data disruption warrant regime. Why are you rejecting this specific conclusion of the Richardson's review. Minister. Uh, thank you. And consistent with recommendation 161 of the Richardson review, this bill does not extend the ASD cybercrime function uh, to apply onshore. 
Any technical assistance provided by the ASD in support of the new powers would be provided consistent with the ASD's existing statutory powers to assist Commonwealth agencies. The bill is consistent with recommendation 162 of the Richardson Review to the extent that the review recommend, recommended that the AFP should be responsible for fighting cybercrime and undertaking disruption activities onshore. However, the bill recognises uh, that the ACIC, drawing on its specialist criminal intelligence capabilities, also plays a vital role in discovering serious and organised criminal activity. Senator Thorpe. Thank you, uh, Acting Deputy Chair and Minister. Uh, the Richardson Review also observed that there is much, is much the AFP can do under its existing powers and was unconvinced that a more specific disruption mandate or additional powers are needed. Why are you so committed to giving these powers to the AFP that they do not need? Minister. Uh, thank you. Uh, the government agrees that the Australian Federal Police and the ACIC should fully utilise existing powers to combat cyber-enabled crime. However, those powers are increasingly ineffective against large-scale incidents of cyber-enabled crime. The government considers that legislative reform is necessary to enhance the ability of the AFP and the ACIC to discover and disrupt serious criminality online, in the first instance through the powers in the bill, including data disruption warrants. Uh, data disruption warrants were developed after careful consideration of the potential practical and principled issues in relation to disruption as identified by the Richardson Review. Senator Thorpe. Thank you. Minister, the Law Council also notes that the supporting justification for the proposal to confer specific intelligence collection powers on the AFP and ACIC under network activity warrants does not clearly identify a gap in existing powers. Can you tell me what gaps exist in the powers the AFP has that justify the powers in this bill, please? Minister. Uh, well, thank you. And I would actually refer you to my summing up speech in relation to this debate, which clearly articulated why the government believes this bill is necessary and why we have uh, the support of the Australian Labor Party. Senator Thorpe. Thank you. Minister, why is it that superior court judges of courts of record appointed in their personal capacity, unlike the AAT members, why aren't superior court judges not the sole issuing authority for these warrants? Minister. Uh, thank you. And I can advise that network activity warrants and data disruption warrants can be issued by an eligible judge or a nominated AAT member. This is consistent with who can issue the existing warrants in the Surveillance Devices Act 2004, such as computer access warrants. It is anticipated that these warrants will be used to complement other powers available to agencies. Account takeover warrants can be issued by a magistrate, as this is consistent with other powers, such as search powers in the Crimes Act. Senator Thank, Thorpe. Thank you. Uh, so, Minister, ha, what safeguards are in place to protect innocent people out there? Uh, so, for example, someone who's organising a rally, uh, Black Lives Matter. How are those people going to be protected? in this bill. Can you please articulate how that uh, will be safeguarded? I understand the bill is about uh, you know, very serious offences, uh, which uh, the Australian Greens will support in terms of um, keeping children safe and keeping our country safe, but there are innocent people that could be targeted through this bill. Can you articulate how uh, those safeguards are going to be in place so that that doesn't happen? 
Minister. Uh, thank you. And I can advise that a data disruption warrant cannot authorise causing any material loss or damage to data unless the issuing authority considers it reasonably necessary and proportionate to the offences targeted. For example, reasonably necessary and proportionate loss of damage may involve a loss incurred as a result of taking action against a large group of individuals committing a particularly serious offence. Whether the disruption of data is reasonably necessary and proportionate will be determined by the issuing authority on a case-by-case -case basis. There may be circumstances in which it would be reasonably necessary and proportionate to cause loss or damage to the data of third parties. For example, it may be reasonably necessary and proportionate for an agency to shut down an online site hosting the live streaming of child exploitation material. I'll just say that again. For example, it may be reasonably necessary and proportionate for an agency to shut down an online site hosting the live streaming of child exploitation material, despite the owner or administrator of that site not necessarily being suspected of this type of criminality. However, it may not be reasonably necessary and proportionate if an agency were to delete all of the data on a third-party computer that we use, use to access a dark web forum advertising uh, illicit drugs. I can also advise that a person's account may only be taken over when taking control of that account is likely to substantially assist in enabling the collection of evidence relating to serious criminal offences. An account takeover warrant cannot authorise materially interfering with a person's lawful use of a computer unless absolutely necessary to facilitate the collection of evidence. An account takeover warrant cannot, under any circumstances, authorise causing material loss or damage to any person lawfully using a computer. An account takeover warrant cannot be executed in a manner that causes a person to suffer the permanent loss of money, digital currency or property, other than data. When considering whether to issue an account takeover warrant, the magistrate must take into account the extent to which the privacy of any person is likely to be affected. And also, I can advise that the Commonwealth Ombudsman will provide robust oversight of the use of the account takeover power by the AFP and the ACIC. Senator Thorpe. Thank you. And uh, my final question, Minister, uh, is in terms of the safeguard. Uh, the AFP can come in, they can take over somebody's account, they can, as I understand it, they can go into that account without even that person knowing. Uh, if that individual who's had their account taken over needs to use any of the information from their account in a court of law, after the AFP have been in there, how, what legal uh, ramifications does that have for that individual whose social media account has been infiltrated by an AFP officer or an AAT officer? Uh, what, is, what safeguard do they have to be able to use that information in a court of law? because it's already been uh, uh, hacked or spied on or information gathering by an AFP uh, officer. So basically the evidence has been tampered with by one of those officers. Minister. Uh, well, Senator Thorpe, I don't believe that you've properly articulated uh, what is occurring, but I understand the basic premise of the question that you were raising. The AFP and the ACIC will have systems in place to preserve the evidence whilst taking action to frustrate the criminal activity mod by modifying the data. Such practices and systems include copying data for evidence or taking screenshots of content whilst performing disruptive data modification. Court processes uh, will continue, in, continue to involve testing of evidence and its admissibility. Evidence obtained while disrupting criminal activity will be subject to the same rules and requirements as evidence obtained through more traditional means. Thank you, Minister. Thank you. No further questions. Thank you, Senator Thorpe. If there are, uh, Senator Patrick, you have the call. Thank, thank you, Chair. You you, you uh, get the award for the most observant chair. Uh, the, um, if I ask the Minister, um, just in relation to AAT members uh, granting warrants, can you just uh, clarify which warrants can be 
uh, granted or approved rather by the AAT or by AAT members? Minister. Uh, what I will advise Senator Patrick is network activity warrants and data disrupt disruption warrants can be issued by an eligible judge or a nominated AAT member, as I've previously advised in answers to other questions. This is consistent with who can issue the existing warrants in the Surveillance Devices Act 2004, such as computer access warrants. Uh, it is anticipated that these warrants will be used to complement other, available, uh, other powers available to agencies. Account takeover warrants can be issued by a magistrate, uh, as this is consistent with other powers, such as search powers uh, in the Crimes Act. I'm just looking at whether or not I can provide you with further information. I can also advise In relation to recommendation nine of the PJCIS report, and it may be to what you were also, um, I should say, alluding to, not referring to, uh, removing the ability for AAT members to issue warrants would have a significant impact on Australia's current electronic surveillance framework and would be a departure from long-standing government policy. The inability to obtain AAT approval will likely result in operational delays in obtaining these warrants. For example, the AFP currently experiences delays obtaining warrants from state and territory magistrates, uh, and I am informed that this can actually be up to a three-day wait in some jurisdictions. Uh, given these potentially wide-ranging implications and the desire for consistency—and I do stress that, uh, Senator Patrick—consistency across other warrant powers. Um, the government will consider this issue further as part of the holistic review of Australia's electronic surveillance framework, uh, which is currently underway. And I'm just looking to see if there is any further information. I can also advise that a nominated AAT member is a person who is either the deputy president, senior member or member of the AAT and has been nominated by uh, the Attorney-General to issue warrants under the Surveillance Devices Act. Senator Patrick. Uh, thank you. Just to sort of clarify, and, and this may help you understand where I'm going, I just want to understand uh, who uh, is nominated. Is it a particular class of AAT member, like a deputy president or a presidential member? Uh, the, uh, there is a rank structure inside the AAT, and this really goes to uh, experience and competence in relation to these sorts of, of, of uh, instruments. Um, is there any guidance you can give me on, on who uh, is Minister. Uh, and thank you, Senator Patrick. You may not have uh, heard, given obviously um, we're doing this via uh, technology. Uh, I did state a nominated AAT member is a person who is either the deputy president, senior member or member of the AAT and has been nominated uh, to issue warrants under the Surveillance Devices Act. Senator Patrick. Yeah, thank you. Look, I, I just want to put on record my concern in relation to this. Um, normally, a presidential member is a judicial member as well, and I have no issue uh, with uh, a judicial member doing this. Normally, uh, a senior, a, a deputy president, uh, well, a lot of some of the deputy presidents are indeed uh, former uh, QCs, for example. When you start getting down to a senior members and members, they can be all sorts of uh, appointees, and including, and I, I know you'll understand this, I'm not trying to be political here, but appointees of both the Liberal Party and Labor Party under the provisions of the AAT Act that allow a person to be appointed uh, if they have uh, you know, a particular experience that is needed by the AAT. Now, uh, that means that uh, we have seen uh, again, to be fair, both Liberal Party and uh, Labor Party appointees, former staffers, advisers, 
uh, and so forth. And uh, my concern is that this is a power um, that would normally, you'd normally want someone who has a strong legal background uh, to uh, ensure that there is not um, any abuse. We might recall um, <clears throat> during the media raids, we had difficulties with uh, warrants being issued uh, and uh, you know, there, were, there was a subsequent High Court matter. I just want to understand whether or not, um, because it is one of the requirements in the AAT Act uh, for one class of member to have a law degree, uh, are there anyone, is there anyone likely to be uh, nominated to carry out these particular functions if they don't have suitable legal qualifications? Minister. Uh, thank you, Senator Patrick. In response to your question, I can advise AAT members must be legal practitioners with at least five years' experience to actually be, and I previously took you through that they would be nominated, uh, to be nominated by the Attorney General. So I believe that does directly answer the issue that you have just articulated. Senator Patrick. So I just want to be clear about it. I think you're being very helpful, Minister. Um, there are members who can be appointed uh, without legal qualification under one of the provisions of the AAT Act. There's another cohort that must have legal qualifications. If I heard you correctly, uh, the attorney will not be, or your, your good self will not be appointing or, or, or nominating those members that don't have the legal qualifications that are mentioned in, uh, in the second cohort's provision of Minister, the Act. And thank you. And I will just repeat, because again, I know that we're doing this via technology. Um, as instructed, AAT members must be legal practitioners with at least five years' experience to be nominated by the Attorney-General. It directly goes to the point you made. Yep. Thank you. I think that clarifies uh, um, uh, what I was after, and I appreciate your answer, Minister. Thank you. Any further questions on that? If not, then I put the, uh, the amendment moved by Senator Patrick uh, 1 and 2 on sheet 1412 together. Is that uh, amendment agreed to? Those of the opinion of aye? All those against? No. The noes have it. The noes have it. If I could just have the green support recorded for uh, Senator Patrick's amendments, and I can see him putting his hand up. I assume he's asking for his own support to be recorded as well. Senator Patrick, it is so noted. We then Thank have you. Uh, uh, the Greens amendment. Senator, Senator Hanson Young. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. If I could, uh, by leave, uh, move uh, Greens amendments on sheet 1410 uh, together. That's been agreed to. Did you want to speak, Senator Hanson Young? Uh, thank you. No, I think uh, Senator Thorpe has articulated uh, the concerns we have with this bill. These amendments address those, and I think we can just get on with voting on it. Okay, I will put the amendment uh, by the Australian Greens on sheet 1410-129 by leave that that amendment be agreed to. Those Uh, thank you very much, um, Clark. The amendments are one and three to nine be agreed to. Those of that view say aye. Those against? No. The noes have it. The noes have it. Senator Hanson Young, you want your vote recorded? I would like the Greens vote recorded. And I was also, considering we haven't had a response from government or uh, the opposition in relation to this amendment uh, on the record, I'd just like that clarified as well. Minister, did you? 
I believe in the questions that were asked of me in the committee stage, I have adequately addressed that. Thank you. Um, we have noted uh, your position for the Greens. Now we go back to the amendment number two. Uh, I'll put that. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. All those against? Aye. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Just like for the Greens' uh, position to be recorded, and for it to be noted that uh, the Labor Party and the, and the government voted uh, in opposition of the amendment. Uh, uh, thank you. Your uh, vote has been recorded. In that case, I'll put uh, the motion that the bills stand as printed. Those of that of you say aye. aye. All those against say no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. The question now is that the bill be reported. I put that. All those in favour say aye. aye. All those in disagreement say no. I declare it carried. Okay. Clerk. Right. Okay. The committee has considered surveillance legislation amendment to identify and disrupt Bill 2021 and agreed to without amendments. Minister. I move that the report of the committee be now adopted. The uh, motion is that the report be adopted. Those of that view say aye. aye. Those against say no. I declare the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Minister. I move that the bill be now read a third time. The motion is that agreed to. The bill's read a third time. Those of that view say aye. aye. Those against say nay. Uh, Sent. I declare it. The ayes have it. And Senator Hanson Young, you would like to have the Greens' vote recorded? Yes. Our opposition to the final uh, bill uh, uh, recorded as um, a strong no. Thank you. That is so noted. Clark. Bill for an act to amend the Surveillance Devices Act 2004 and for other purposes. Government Business Order for Day Number 1, Royal Commission's Amendment, Protection of Information Bill 2021, resumption of second reading debate. Senator Brown, you have the call. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Labor supports this bill and we support the government's amendments. For some months, Senator Steele John, Labor and the government have been engaged in negotiations in relation to this bill. Those negotiations have been constructive and conducted in good faith. I would particularly like to acknowledge the efforts of Senator Steelejohn and his office. This bill would amend the Royal Commission's Act 1902 and make consequential amendments to the Freedom of Information Act 1982 to ensure ongoing confidentiality protections for people given evidence to the Disability Royal Commission. Prior to this bill coming on for debate earlier this year, a number of disability organisations and advocates raised concerns that the bill did not adequately protect the privacy of witnesses, making allegations about systemic failings in the disability sector, including whistleblowers. The government has agreed to move amendments to further improve the protections offered by the bill. Labor supports them. Moreover, we understand that the Attorney-General has asked her department to commence a review of the Royal Commission's Act to examine any issues or impediments to people coming forward and sharing information with the Royal Commission. Labor also supports that review and thanks the Attorney-General for initiating it. It is absolutely critical to the success of the Disability Royal Commission that people feel confident about coming forward to give evidence. The Royal Commission must, of course, hear directly from people with disability about their experience of violence, abuse, neglect or exploitation. But it must also hear from others who may have witnessed or know about the neglect, abuse and exploitation of people with disability, including or perhaps especially when that neglect, abuse and exploitation is or has been systemic. The protections in this bill and in the amendments are designed to ensure that the people the Royal Commission needs to hear from have the confidence to come forward. I commend the bill to the Senate. Thank you, Senator. We are going remotely to Senator Stooljohn. Thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. 
Uh, after years of raising uh, the reality that, and the alarm that the privacy protections uh, in the Royal Commission were insufficient, uh, today the disability community and the Greens have succeeded in bringing forward an amendment bill that will ensure that people are able to give information to the Royal Commission and to come forward to that investigation with trust. It is with an incredible range of emotions, uh, from pride and, and happiness in the effort of the community over that time alongside the Greens to achieve this, um, and uh, with a solemnity born of the knowledge of the seriousness of the evidence that will now be taken by the Commission, that I speak to this absolutely important bill uh, today. The changes before the Senate uh, will ensure that evidence that is confidential, uh, which is given to the Commission, uh, will remain confidential after the Commission ends at the moment uh, on, along a timeline of 2023. Additionally, it has stronger whistleblower protections uh, for those who bravely come forward uh, and give evidence in relation to and blowing whistle upon the failings of governmental departments, of corporations, or indeed of institutions. With the passage of this legislation, uh, we encourage everyone uh, to come forward and share their experience of violence, abuse, neglect, or exploitation with the Commission. Sharing an experience with the, with the Commission will now ensure uh, that, the commission, that the experience and the evidence is included, and that they are able to hear the information needed from all of us to ga gain a total picture of what violence, abuse, neglect and exploitation is occurring, the settings in which it, uh, in which it is occurring, uh, the nature of the perpetrated abuses all across the country. It is vital to ensuring that this investigation is able to do its work. In the context of the passage of this bill, I am also reminded of the many other investigations uh, that have preceded it um, in relation to vital issues uh, from Aboriginal deaths in custody uh, to the Bushfires Royal Commission uh, to the Aged Care Royal Commission. And it has been said to me, and it occurs to me very strongly in this moment, uh, that often these investigations result in recommendations uh, which are then uh, very slowly enacted, if at all. It will be so vital uh, when the recommendations are made uh, from this investigation uh, for those recommendations to be able uh, to be championed in the Parliament and for them to be swiftly and comprehensively Im implemented uh, in the next term of Parliament, if that is when they are delivered. And to that end, I am very hopeful uh, and I'm very excited by the prospect of an increase in the Greens representation post the next election, uh, which would deliver us to a balance of power situation whereby we would be able to continue the work with the community to see uh, those recommendations swiftly translated uh, into comprehensive legislative reforms to the changes that we need to end violence, abuse, neglect and exploitation wherever it exists and to hold perpetrators, whether they be individual or organisations, to account and to achieve the compensation that is needed uh, and the recognition that is needed on behalf uh, of uh, survivors. To do all of these things and to ensure that programmes like the NDIS function in the way that people need them to, that people are able to access these programs and supports will be a key for the Greens going forward as we understand it is the most vital need of the disability community. And to do all of these things uh, in the context uh, of a, an investigation which is now able to hear people's evidence and to guarantee them uh, protection and security, and privacy in that process is now the opportunity that is before the community. Thank you, Senator. Minister. Uh, and, and thank you. And in summing up, I really do thank uh, all senators for their contributions to this debate on the Royal Commission's Amendment Protection of Information Bill 2021. Uh, and in particular, I would like to acknowledge 
uh, the work that I've been able to do with Senator Steele John. Uh, the government will and truly takes violence, abuse, neglect and exploitation of people uh, with disability very seriously. And I think what this bill shows uh, is that working again with Senator Steele John, who has brought me first hand experience, first hand experience on behalf of other people, um, that the government has listened. Uh, in particular to the Royal Commission into Violence, Abuse, Neglect and Exploitation of People with Disability. We've also listened, and Senator Stilgen, as I've said, has brought me a number of examples uh, of people with disability, their families and the carers and the broader Australian public about the importance. And this is the key to the bill. And this is what we all agree with. And in fact, but for some amendments that the government has agreed uh, that we will move to improve the bill. Uh, this bill will have gone through as a non contrary bill because we are united in this purpose. The importance of ensuring people have the confidence to come forward and tell their story. And as a result, the bill provides confidentiality protections for certain sensitive information that is given to the Disability Royal Commission by strengthening and expanding the existing protection in the Royal Commission's Act to remove any doubt about the safeguarding of confidential information beyond the life of the inquiry. It also expands existing protections in the Royal Commission's Act to provide clarity for people that a broad range of sensitive information given to the Disability Royal Commission will be fully protected. The bill amends the Act to ensure the confidentiality of certain information given by, importantly, as I've discussed with Senator Steele John, or on behalf of individuals to the Disability Royal Commission is protected. The use and disclosure of information given by individuals to the Commission about their or others' experiences of violence, abuse, neglect and exploitation will be limited, where that information was given for the purposes other than a private session and the information was treated as confidential by the Commission at all times. The amendments will provide that this category of confidential information is not admissible in evidence against a person in any civil or criminal proceedings in any court of the Commonwealth, State or Territory. Further, a provision of any law of the Commonwealth, a State or Territory would have no effect to the extent that it would otherwise require or authorise a person to make a record of, use or disclose the information. In addition, it will be an offence to disclose or use this confidential information without authority. The bill provides that these protections will apply in circumstances where information is given on behalf of another person, for example, a carer or parent giving information on behalf of a person with disability and also extends to cover accounts of systemic forms of violence, abuse, neglect and exploitation of people with disability, and not just individual accounts, as I discussed with Senator Steeldrum. Records of the confidential information will be held securely by the custodian, the secretary of the Attorney General's department when the inquiry ends. Just like private session information, a court will be unable to compel the department to disclose this information. It will not be admissible in court proceedings, and third parties will be unable to seek this information under freedom of information um, regimes. Uh, again, can I just say um, the government has given careful consideration to the development of this bill. Uh, we have also, and I do acknowledge, um, consulted with the Disability Royal Commission and, as I've said, I've worked constructively uh, with the Australian Greens and Senator Steele John um, to ensure that it provides comprehensive protections to sensitive information. Uh, I will be moving some amendments, as I've um, alluded to in the, in the committee stage, uh, to improve the bill. Uh, but again, on behalf of the government, I do thank uh, the Senate for the comprehensive support of this important piece of legislation. And I uh, commend the bill to the Senate. The question is that the bill be now read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the Royal Commissions Act 1902 and for related purposes. Is it the wish of the committee that the bill be taken as a whole?
There being no objection, it is so ordered. Minister. Uh, thank you. And I believe I need to seek leave to move government amendments SV119. No, or, or, or government amendments on a sheet SV119. And I would move them together. The, uh, the, is leave granted? The leave is granted. Minister. You are very speakly just talk to the amendments. Um, and I know that Senator Steelejohn will then also uh, briefly speak to them. But as I've said, the amendments in detail, uh, what they'll do is we're committed to ensuring that the Disability Royal Commission instituted by the government is able to thoroughly investigate violence against and abuse, neglect and exploitation of people with disabilities and that there are appropriate protections of confidential and sensitive information. What we are doing with these amendments um, that the government is introducing it, is that they directly respond to feedback received whilst the bill has actually been before the parliament. Uh, the amendments to the bill will extend existing protections of the confidentiality of certain information provided to the Disability Royal Commission. The amendments will ensure that all persons wishing to engage with the Disability Royal Commission can be confident that they can tell their stories or provide information in a way that protects the confidentiality of their sensitive information and protects them against potential adverse consequences. And again, I do thank the Senate um, for what I have advised is the support of these amendments. Thank you. Senator Steele, John. Thank you, Acting uh, Deputy Pres. Um, and I just wanted to, to clarify something I, I said in my concluding remarks uh, in the in the section before. Um, what I meant to say was uh, the opportunity to pass these amendments is now before the Senate. Uh, if it was before the community, we probably would have done this in 2019. So now, indeed, before before the Senate, um, in relation to these uh, particular um, in relation to these particular amendments. Um, I just wanted to uh, to uh, contextualise it briefly and ask the minister a, a clarifying question. Uh, so, of course, uh, one of the the major thrusts of these amendments is to ensure uh, that uh, systemic information, information given in relation to uh, systemic violence, abuse, neglect, or exploitation, is is fully and comprehensively covered. Um, by these uh, aspects of the broader bill. Um, this is a great concern of the disability community uh, to, to ensure this, uh, because we understand um, through, through lived experience um, that it is often at systems, institutions, uh, policy processes that are either uh, actively involved in or the context uh, to which we experience violence, abuse, neglect and exploitation. Um, in asking people to come forward um, and giving people the protections required uh, to come forward to disclose these types of uh, abuse and exploitation, if you are an individual within a government department, a institution, or a private entity, um, is quite an intimidating prospect to, to do that brave uh, Peace and, and blow the whistle. Um, so I'm first of all wanting to, to ask the minister uh, whether they are able to uh, offer an, an assurance to the parliament and to the community as to the uh, as to the legal consequences that faces anybody who attempts to dissuade um, or in any way negatively uh, cause a, an outcome to somebody that blows the whistle. Um, and secondly, whether they may be able to offer. Um, an encouragement um, to anybody within, particularly a government a department, a state or federal, uh, that it is the desire of the government to see individuals with information, disclose that information to the Commission so that we can have that information included uh, within recommendations. Minister? Uh, thank oh, you. Sorry. Yeah, Minister. I was just going to respond to Senator yeah. Steeljohn's uh, questions. Um, in relation to the second part uh, of your question, and again, Senator Steelejohn, absolutely, the government is committed to ensuring that the Disability Royal Commission is instituted, or that has been instituted by the government, is able to thoroughly investigate violence against and abuse, neglect and exploitation of uh, people with disabilities. 
and that there are appropriate protections of confidential and sensitive information. And, uh, you are right. I would encourage, and I hope this bill provides uh, that encouragement to people uh, to now come forward uh, and provide their accounts to the Royal Commission. Um, as you and I have discussed and uh, as I have already referred to, the amendments the government uh, is introducing they do directly respond to uh, the feedback received whilst this bill has been before the parliament. Um, and as you and I have discussed, the amendments will apply limitations on the use and disclosure of information given by individuals to the Royal Commission about their experiences of violence, abuse, neglect and exploitation, and to go directly to the question uh, that you have posed. The amendments would ensure that systemic accounts are covered by the legislation and in further answering your question, and in particular the latter part of your question, and that people can engage with the Royal Commission without fear of further disclosures. It also, it, I have to say, and you and I have discussed this, Senator Steele, John, it was always intended by the government to protect accounts of a systemic nature. But what we are doing um, is, by moving this amendment, to absolutely now make it clear and explicit, and to again to go to the second part of your question, so people understand the amendments make it clear and explicit on the face of the legislation that it was always intended to protect accounts of a systemic nature. So yes, I encourage people. The bill will be passed by the Senate to come forward with the assurances that they now get within this particular uh, piece of legislation. I will just also add, though, for thoroughness, the amendments ensure that sensitive information provided through the Royal Commission outside private sessions will be accorded the same confidentiality as material obtained for the purposes of a private session. The provisions are not confined to an individual account and could be applied more broadly to systemic accounts relating to policies, procedures or practices or acts or omissions which have contributed to experiences of violence, abuse, neglect or exploitation. The protections would apply to certain information given to the Royal Commission when it commenced its operations on 4 April 2019. And the amendments will protect individuals and organisations who have observed failures in the implementation of policies putting people with disability at risk. And I believe, Senator Steele-John, that does, I hope, comprehensively uh, now put on the record the answers to your question. Senator Brown. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Labor supports these amendments. The bill extends the confidentiality protections under the Royal Commission's Act to certain information given the Royal Commission into violence, abuse, neglect and exploitation of people with disability, specifically to the information given by individuals to the Commission about their experiences of violence, abuse, neglect and exploita exploitation. These amendments, as the Minister has made clear, would would um, protect those um, that those protections apply equally to accounts of a systemic nature. In other words, the confidentiality protections would not only apply to individual accounts but also to the accounts of systemic violence, abuse, neglect, and exploitation. This is an important clarification, and Labor thanks the government for moving these amendments. Thank you, Senator Stool. John, did you want the call again? Senator yes, thank Stool. you. Um, uh, just a subsequent question uh, for the Attorney General, uh, and thank you for those uh, those comments. They are clarifying. Um, could I ask you to just briefly outline again for the community's confidence uh, what you what you understand to be the um, the legal penalties uh, that would face anybody uh, that he, that uh, attempted to. Uh, cause anybody some negative consequence uh, for blowing the whistle, for giving information to the Commission. Um, you and I, I think, both understand that those, those legal consequences can be quite severe, um, but I think for the, the community following along um, with this debate, it would be great if you could just step them out uh, briefly.
Minister, you have the call. Uh, yes, and I will also uh, very quickly table a supplementary explanatory memorandum related to the government amendments to be moved by this, uh, moved by this bill. Um, and Senator Steele, John, I do have now in front of me the Royal Commission Act 1902, uh, so a copy of the legislation. Uh, part three of this act uh, actually deals with what are referred to here as the offences. Uh, there are a number of offences commencing with 6H, uh, but in particular, if I go through them, I will give you, for example, 6M injury to witness, any person who uses, causes or inflicts any violence, punishment, damagement, loss or disadvantage to any person for or on account of A, the person having appeared as a witness before any royal commission, or B, any evidence given by him or her before any royal commission, or C, the person having produced a document or thing or given information or a statement pursuant to a summons, uh, requirement or notice under section 2, commits an indictable offence, uh, imprisonment for one year. It's very serious, as you and I both know. I will give you another example so it's properly articulated on the record. Uh, again, part 3, offences. 6N, dismissal of employers of witness. Any employer who dismisses any employee from his or her employment or prejudices any employee in his or her employment for or on account of the employee having A, appeared as a witness before a royal commission or B, given evidence before a royal commission or C, produced a document or thing or given information or a statement pursuant to a summons uh, requirement or notice under section 2, commits an indictable offence. Uh, and again, the penalty can include imprisonment for a year. I'm also happy, if you'd like me to, to read out all of the relevant sections uh, under part three offences, 6H, false or misleading evidence, uh, 6I, bribery of a witness, 6J, fraud on a witness, uh, 6K, destroying documents or other things. 6L, preventing a witness from attending. Any person who intentionally prevents any person who has been summoned to attend as a witness before the Royal Commission from attending as a witness uh, or from producing anything in evidence pursuant to the summons to attend commits an indictable offence. Again, uh, the penalty is imprisonment for a year. I believe Senator Steele John. Uh, that should give comfort to people that within the Royal Commissions Act itself there is an actual section in relation to offences. And they are serious offences because they are indictable offences and they can include uh, a penalty of a year's imprisonment. Uh, sorry, sorry, Senator Steele, John. Uh, ju yes, just once more, Chair, if that's okay. Chair, can you, Sorry, can you hear Senator me? Sorry, Still John. Can, can you? Oh my God! Please don't let it. Keep going. Um, hello. Can I ask a subsequent question? You to can the ask minister? the minister, minister a question. Yes. Excellent. Thank you. Just finally, um, you'd have thought after all these months we'd have worked out the remote thing, but there you go. Um, so just, just finally, um, I would like to thank everybody. Uh, that has been involved, involved in putting this piece of legislation together um, for, for listening uh, to the community and their concerns and for working with the Greens to make it a reality today. Um, I would also just like to uh, give them, uh, ask the final question of the Minister in relation to the uh, review uh, that the Department uh, has committed to undertaking. Um, could you just step out for the record, uh, the purview of that review and the timeline uh, for its completion? Minister? Senator Jill Steele, John, I do not have the letter available to me that I provided to you, but as per my letter to you, uh, the review is clearly set out in there and I've signed off that it is a commitment. I, I've, I've got the Senator relevant Steele section. John. Uh, Minister, I'll just 
read it to you for the record, and then you can confirm if it meets your recollection. Um, so we've got uh, the, the department, meaning your department, will immediately uh, convent, commence a review of the act to examine any issues or ex impediments to people coming forward and sharing information with the Royal Commission, in particular to consider the effectiveness of one, mechanisms in the Act inclusive of the Bill's amendments uh, for safeguarding and uh, safeguarding the identities of people making confidential, confidential disclosures to the Royal Commission and other protections for witnesses giving evidence to Royal Commission and uh, consult with the Office of the Disability Royal Commission to have it consider the matters you have raised uh, within the ambit of the uh, Royal Commission's terms of reference. Um, is that, that your correct recollection of, of the letter you've sent us? If you have correctly read out the letter that I sent you, yes, it is. Minister. Absolutely. Fantastic. And I think Senator what that Steele does John? is... Oh, thanks, Chair. What that does is give the, the community additional assurance that should uh, any uh, further changes be required to the relevant acts uh, to further protect individuals giving evidence, there will be an opportunity for those to be considered um, in full. Um, all right, with thanks again and with great uh, excitement, happiness um, in me, um, that's it. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Senator Steelejohn. The question is that the amendments be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The, the question now is that the bill as amend, amended be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The question now is, is that the bill be reported. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The committee has considered the Royal Commission's amendments protection of information bill 2021 with amend and agreed to it with amendments. Minister. I move that the report of the committee be now adopted. The question is that the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Minister. I move that the bill be now read a third time. The question is that the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the Royal Commissions Act 1902 and for related purposes. Government Business Order for Day No. 2, Treasury Laws Amendments 2021 Measures No. 2 Bill 2021, resumption of debate on the second reading and the amendment moved by Senator McAllister. Oh, Senator Patrick, are you seeking the call? Yes, thank you. So I understand I'm in continuation. Yes, uh, look, so uh, th thank you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, just to recall, uh, noting I did speak on this last night, um, I I'm really just focusing on the amendment that has been uh, moved by both Labor and myself that uh, seeks to uh, uh, direct the Tax Commissioner to disclose the amount of JobKeeper uh, that has been paid to companies that uh, have a turnover of more than $10 million, not just uh, retrospectively in terms of uh, companies that have received it, but also in relation to companies that uh, uh, will receive additional uh, payments under the coronavirus measures passed in the uh, previous sitting week. Um, I did mention, uh, and I just want to clarify this in my contribution yesterday, <clears throat> that uh, in terms of companies that have received JobKeeper um, that uh, didn't meet the uh, prere prerequisites of a 30% or a 50% fallen revenue, uh, that uh, equates, according to the PBO, to about $12.5 billion. Now, again, I'm not in any way uh, disturbed by companies that made a projection that they would lose 30% uh, and uh, didn't quite uh, lose that amount but received JobKeeper. I have no issue with that. I have a, a difficulty with the egregious behaviour of companies who 
uh, took JobKeeper and then did much better than they had done in previous quarters. And that amount uh, equates uh, to $4.6 billion. $4.6 billion of taxpayers' money, and that, that is money that can be used for other things. Uh, I, again, I don't say the companies have engaged in anything unlawful. They simply complied with the rules, but they all know um, that uh, they have taken money for which it was never intended, taken taxpayers' money for which it was never intended. Uh, so I thank uh, um, um, Mr uh, Lee in the other place for the work that he's done on this, uh, both uh, with, the, the, with the PBO, through his speeches and also publicly. It's a very, very uh, important issue. And so uh, uh, when we get to the committee stage, the, the Senate will, I think, have two opportunities to vote for uh, uh, or in favour of disclosure of this information. I think every Australian wants it to be disclosed. And we might see that uh, we have a much greater return from companies who have been in receipt of job, JobKeeper that didn't actually need it. And uh, that uh, ends my contribution. Thank you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. Thank you. Senator Chandler. Thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise today to speak on the Treasury Laws Amendment 2021 Measures No. 2 Bill 2021. And uh, listening to the debate on this, um, on, on this bill over the last few days, um, it is, of course, always a, a great opportunity with the um, TLAB amendments to uh, come into this place and talk about all of the uh, hard work and important policies that have been developed by this government to guide Australia through the economic crisis that resulted from the COVID-19 pandemic and is still uh, impacting on communities across the country, Madam Acting Deputy President. One of the words that we hear thrown around so much um, regarding this pandemic is, is the word unprecedented. And certainly we know that it's been a good century or so since Australia last had to deal with something um, of, this, of this nature, a, a pandemic illness. Um, and when we are dealing with an unprecedented situation, the economic response obviously has to uh, evolve over time. And I feel like um, I've, I've quite regularly come into this place and spoken about, spoken about the unprecedented, unprecedented nature of the pandemic and the unprecedented nature of the government's response to it. Um, because it has changed over time quite markedly from January, February last year when we were first recording cases um, on the mainland to understanding what impact uh, border closures, lockdowns were going to have uh, on our community and on our economy. Um, and of course, coming into this year, we had this brief moment of opening up again and that brief moment of hope before back down into lockdowns with um, the Delta strain, which again has been something that we have had to learn about and adapt um, our, our policies very quickly. And, and I know that, um, that the way that the government has responded, um, particularly on the economic front, has been very well received. Um, we understand, Madam Acting Deputy President, that Australians facing lockdowns are asking questions about their incomes um, and the weeks ahead and, and, and what the pathway back to normal life looks like. And I've certainly sensed uh, that within, within the Australian community, but particularly within the Tasmanian community as well, um, it's perhaps not well uh, understood uh, by, by the mainland states that have been dealing with um, lockdowns. But in, in Tasmania, where we haven't had uh, lockdowns, at least since um, really the early days of the pandemic back at the start of 2020. Uh, our businesses there are still hurting incredibly as a result of the lockdowns on the mainland, particularly our tourism businesses, Madam Acting Deputy President. And I've certainly had the opportunity to speak to a number of operators in the last little while um, to understand the struggles that they are facing without having the visitation from particularly the states of Victoria and New South Wales that, um, that we otherwise would have had. Um, those businesses are hurting. 
uh, and that is why, Madam Acting Deputy President, the Morrison government has worked with the Gutwin State Liberal government in Tasmania to deliver a $20 million business support package for local businesses in our state. This package will give much needed relief to Tasmanian businesses struggling with the ongoing impacts of border closures to our biggest visitor markets. And the support will target businesses operating in tourism, hospitality, arts and events, seafood and transport um, sectors, as well as those that have been impacted directly by reduced interstate visitation. Um, and for those businesses, financial support of between $2,000 and $10,000 will be available um, if they've suffered a 30 per cent decline in their turnover, which is um, certainly the case, Madam Acting Deputy President, and certainly what I'm hearing from some businesses, that there have been incredibly drastic downturns in the, uh, in the consumer business that they have enjoyed uh, in the last little while as a result of the lockdowns on the mainland. Um, we as a government know that there is more to be done to support our businesses during the COVID-19 um, pandemic. Like I said, our approach has had to continually change and pivot and evolve, just as the virus has continued to change and, and pivot and evolve. And we will continue to monitor the situation. We will continue to provide support to the businesses in particular that need it, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. But I think it is important to note and echo the words of the Treasurer, Josh Frydenberg, and indeed the Prime Minister, uh, Mr Morrison, that we can't stay in lockdown forever. Uh, our businesses can't survive if we stay in lockdown forever. And there will come a point where we will come out of lockdown. We will see the end to these border restrictions. It is absolutely contingent on our vaccination rollout. And that is, again, something I've, I've come into this chamber many times before and spoken about, um, Madam Acting Deputy President. I urge all Australians to go out and get vaccinated once they become eligible, because it is that which will stop the lockdowns. It will stop the border restrictions. The plan has been agreed to and set by the National Cabinet. And I, along with so many Australians, are certainly looking forward to enjoying a little bit more freedom, hopefully, by the end of 2021. Uh, thank you. S uh, Senator Vann. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on the Treasury Laws Amendment 2021 Measures No. 2 Bill of 2021. This bill makes a number of important changes to laws to implement reforms to the administration and oversight of organisations that uh, have the deductible gift recipient or DGR status. And they also deliver on the Morrison government's commitment to amend Australia's offshore banking unit uh, regime to address concerns raised by the OECD's Forum on Harmful Tax Practices. So the, the bill is made up of two schedules. The first of those schedules, Schedule 1, amends this measure, um, amends the Income Ta <coughs> Tax Assessment Act of 1997 to require non government entities to seek endorsement as deductible gift recipients. To be, to be a charity registered with Australian Charities and Not-for-Profits Commission, the ACNC, or operated by a registered charity. Ancillary funds and spe specifically listed entities will be exempt from this requirement. The requirement to be a charity already applies to the majority of the general DGR categories. And this measure will amend the special conditions applying to the remaining general DGR categories. The, the majority of the um, general DGR categories currently have a special condition requiring that the fund, authority or institution be a registered charity, as I said, an Australian government agency or operated by a registered charity or an Australian government agency. For the remaining 11 general DGR categories, these requirements do not need to be satisfied for the fund, authority or institution to be entitled to DGR endorsement. These categories can include organisations on the Register of Environmental Organisations and the Register of Cultural Organisations. As charity registration is not a precondition for DGR endorsement for these categories, there can be inconsistent governance and reporting requirements for these DGRs. 
making charity registration a precondition for DGR endorsement across the general DGR categories will improve the consistency of regulation, governance and oversight of DGRs while also reducing unnecessary compliance. Less than 2,000 entities are expected to be affected by the changes. These amendments do not affect ancillary funds or funds specifically listed by name as DGRs. When the amendments take effect, DGR applicants generally must register as a charity with the ACNC before applying for DGR endorsement. In practice, there will be a streamlined process to allow DGR applicants to lodge a single application with the ACNC seeking charity registration and indicating their intention to be endorsed as a DGR. Once the ACNC is satisfied that the applicant is entitled to be registered as a charity, the ACNC will pass on the necessary information to the Australian Tax Office to assess the applicant's entitlement to DGR endorsement. To be eligible to be registered as a charity with the ACNC, the entity must I'll give you a list. Uh, first, have an Australian business number, an ABN, and must be able to demonstrate its charitable purpose and not-for-profit uh, character through governing documents or other means. It must provide the details of people respons responsible for governing the entity. It must have only charitable purposes or purposes ancillary to charitable purposes. It must provide other relevant information periodically, such as financial information. It must be able to demonstrate compliance with the government's standards and external conduct standards, if applicable, and it must not be covered by a decision in writing made by an Australian government agency under an Australian law that provides for them to be characterised on the basis of them engaging in or supporting terrorist or other criminal activities, importantly, of course. The uh, schedule also amends the definition of environmental organisation and cultural organisation these amendments provide that a fund, authority or institution must be registered or to be listed on the Register of Environmental Organisations or the Register of Cultural Organisations. Now, Schedule 2, as I said earlier, looks at the offshore banking units regime and it addresses the concerns OECD and European Union countries' concerns about offshore banking or the OBU regime. Action to amend the OBU re regime to remove the effective concessional rate tax rate is necessary to avoid future sanctions that would have adverse outcomes for Australian financial markets. The existing OBUs can continue to access the concessional tax rate for the next two income years to ensure a smooth transition process. The OBU regime is closed to new entrants. I commend the bill to the Senate. Thank you, Senator Van. Senator Hanson Young. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to uh, contribute to the debate on this bill, and I do so on the provision that I have circulated an amendment uh, to this bill. Uh, this amendment, uh, at a time when we are talking about uh, what uh, this place and what the government needs to be doing to help in relation to uh, COVID to ensure that uh, businesses and individuals, workers who are struggling under the restrictions that have obviously been put in place because of health reasons, uh, but are nonetheless having an impact on particular sectors. And one of those sectors, uh, of course, as we've known for a long time, in fact, the very beginning of when uh, COVID a hit here in Australia is indeed our live performance, our music and our art sector, our entertainment sector. They were the first, Madam Acting Deputy President, to be hit uh, by the restrictions of COVID, uh, shut down uh, overnight. Uh, one day uh, they had uh, scheduled shows, uh, festivals, events. Uh, and the next day they were told that uh, limiting uh, the limits on numbers uh, and venues meant that they would have to shut down. And that was over 12 months ago. In fact, it was 18 uh, months ago. And yet uh, we've still uh, seen very little coming forward from this government to help this sector. Now, one of the main uh, issues as we go through uh, these various different phases 
uh, and, uh, and, and stages of dealing with COVID and managing the various different restrictions, the border restrictions, the different uh, uh, types of lockdowns, is of course uh, the boom-bust nature uh, of events that are being organised. And it is still uh, the fact today that uh, for event organisers, whether it's in the music industry or in other forms of entertainment, whether it's festivals, uh, uh, big, small or in between, whether they're suburban, uh, metropolitan or the many, many festivals that bring uh, light and culture and a buzz to our regional uh, areas, um, they've found it very difficult uh, to exist within, without uh, much certainty. One of the biggest problems, of course, is planning. And if you can't access any type of insurance, it's very, very difficult to plan anything uh, into the future. And what we're now hearing from uh, the uh, music and the entertainment industry in particular is even trying to plan for things in uh, the uh, stage B. <laughs> or uh, when Australians uh, reach those um, crucial uh, targets in terms of vaccinations, when things uh, hopefully, fingers crossed, are safely able to be opened up again, they're finding it very, very difficult to be able uh, to, uh, to plan without access to proper insurance, because time and time and time again, events are being shut down overnight, and the money, the cost of that, is being left to uh, mostly small businesses, uh, businesses that have been wrecked and smashed over the last 18 months, and it's very, very difficult uh, for them to have any capital to rely upon. Um, so what we are facing is a sector that is already smashed, that is struggling, and still can't plan. We've got big insurance companies making it near impossible for small businesses and events, and uh, whether they're musicians or entertainment uh, promoters, to be able to access um, massive, uh, huge price gouging premiums, which simply cannot be afforded, or indeed, uh, or indeed, uh, they uh, just th that type of insurance simply isn't available. Now, I know we've debated these issues many times in this parliament, uh, but again, 18 months on, the very dire need for the government to address this issue has not been done. And that is why this amendment uh, that I have foreshadowing uh, that I will move in the committee stage addresses this. It asks the minister, it directs the minister to put in place an insurance guarantee. This isn't going to cost the, uh, the uh, taxpayer any money. In fact, it probably won't even cost the government money. It might make the government. It might actually make the government uh, some money because it simply acts as a underwriter of an insurance scheme. Because we can't trust the big insurance companies. They are screwing these small businesses to the wall, and they simply don't have any any access. It's not the small uh, business who is a music promoter's fault that they organise an event and it gets shut down overnight, all costs laid bare at their feet because a state government decides to close their borders shut, or indeed an outbreak of COVID happens and the health restrictions kick in. It shouldn't be uh, costs that are borne by the, those individual small businesses. Uh, it should be something if, that if the government's not going to pay for directly as compensation, then at least put in place an insurance scheme. That's all the sector is asking for. It doesn't cost the taxpayer anything, doesn't cost the government anything. It is just asking the government to, in it, to address what is clearly a market failure. I look forward to debating these issues when we get into the committee stage, and I commend the bill uh, uh, with these amendments uh, to the House. Senator McKim. Senator McKim, Senator, Han Senator McKim, are you there? Yeah, uh, yes. Can you hear me, Chair? Yes, I can. Please continue. Um, uh, thank you. Um, I also wish to speak uh, on this bill, the Treasury Laws Amendment 2021 Measures Number Two Bill, and indicate, of course, that the Greens do support this bill, and of course, we support measures to improve the integrity around eligibility for status as a deductible gift recipient. 
and uh, we uh, we also support the measures to remove the concessional treatment of offshore banking units, which is uh, one um, very small step towards making our tax system something other than uh, than a playground for multinational tax avoiders. Um, I uh, indicate to the Senate that uh, I will uh, make a contribution in regards to uh, the amendment foreshadowed by Senator McAllister in Committee of the Whole uh, on sheet uh, 1387. I can indicate now that we will be um, supporting that amendment, but we will have some uh, comments that I will make in regards to both uh, that amendment and to Senator Patrick's amendment. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Senator Smith. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, there is lots to talk about in this particular Treasury bill, and uh, people won't be surprised who might be sort of listening to the Senate's proceedings to be a little bit confused because when you hear some of the contributions from Labor senators, when you hear some of the contributions from uh, crossbench senators, you would think you would think two things. The first thing you might think is that the JobKeeper program has been unsuccessful. Nothing could be further from the truth, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Secondly, you might think that the government's doing nothing in regards to tackling multinational tax avoidance, and of course, again, nothing could be further from the truth. As we move through the pandemic, pandemic and as we move further and further away from the beginning of the pandemic, it won't be a surprise for people to understand, to come to an appreciation that certain myths and untruths or mistruths will start to be uh, generated about the success of the government's initial economic responses to the pandemic. And I think any fair-minded person would understand that the government's early economic response was timely, it was effective, and of course it was very, very necessary. And I think the JobKeeper program stands out as a beacon to that timeliness, that success, that precision in regards to the government's economic initiative. And I think it's worth just putting on the record the success of the JobKeeper program and to dispel some of the commentary that we've heard in and around this particular debate. So let me begin by just reinforcing the fact that any fair-minded person, any fair-minded senator would understand and appreciate that the JobKeeper program has been a vital and some might even argue the most vital economic lifeline for many millions of Australians as they entered the pandemic. 3.8 million Australians in around 1 million businesses were supported by the JobKeeper initiative. Small and medium-sized businesses represented 98 per cent of all JobKeeper recipients. And that's an important statistic for a party like ours, like the government, that prides itself on being quick to support small and medium-sized businesses in our country, particularly when so many of them are family-run and family-owned. But I think it's also important to draw to people's attention that 90 per cent of JobKeeper recipients were micro-businesses with turnovers of under $2 million. 8 per cent went, went to small to medium-sized enterprises with a turnover between two and $250 million. And only 0.2 per cent went to large businesses, that is, with turnovers of greater than $250 million. And according to the Reserve Bank of Australia, JobKeeper has saved at least 700,000 jobs in the period April to July 2020. Of course, we reflect on lives lost tragically as a result of the pandemic as we watch it unfold, not just in this country but internationally. But I think it's important to recognise that the JobKeeper program saved 700,000 jobs and put the minds of many Australians and their families at ease. It's also worth re-emphasising that Treasury's three-month review, which found that the program was well targeted, was well targeted. And I might just read, for the sake of the Senate and 
to put into context, to proper context, some of the contributions that we've heard in this debate thus far. The JobKeeper payment three-month review said, and you can see it for yourself at page seven, the payment went to businesses that experienced an average decline in turnover in April of 37 per cent against the same month a year previous, compared with a 4 per cent decline for other businesses. And it went to businesses at which the job separation rate had doubled following the introduction of operating restrictions just before JobKeeper was introduced, compared with no change in other businesses. Clearly a successful program. But it's worth emphasising again what the Governor of the Reserve Bank of Australia said. He said, I think the JobKeeper program is really about keeping people in jobs, isn't it? He said. It's done a remarkably good job at that, he said. So as we move through the pandemic and as the government calibrates its economic and other responses, I think it's important that we don't revise the history in a way that seeks to distort, unnecessarily distort, what has been a necessary and effective response from this government in the early stages of the pandemic. It's worth restating again that Australia was the first advanced economy to return to pre-COVID employment and activity levels. Australia recorded an unemployment rate of just 4.6 per cent in July 2020, the lowest level in over a decade. Notwithstanding this success, Labor's shadow treasurer is obsessed with wanting to find fault and error with the JobKeeper program. The Treasurer and the Prime Minister have been sprung spending JobKeeper money to dead people, the shadow treasurer said. These are humiliating revelations about JobKeeper and Josh Frydenberg and Scott Morrison, Labor's shadow treasurer said. They are humiliating revelations because Morrison and Frydenberg have spent much of the last 10 years banging on about checks for dead people during the global financial crisis, so they have a lot of explaining to do," said Labor's shadow treasurer on the 29th of January 2021. Labor's shadow treasurer has been constantly refuted, constantly refuted. On the 30th of January 2021, a day after, a day after Mr. Chalmers made those comments, on the 30th of January 2021, the ATO released an official statement, which can be found on its website, to clarify what it called recent media commentary about incorrect JobKeeper payments. So let me share with the Senate what the ATO's statement said. First, it said that the ATO is not aware of any ultimately successful claim for deceased or other fictitious employees. Second, it said, where claims including fictitious employees are identified, no JobKeeper job payments are or have been made, the ATO media statement said. So where else can we look? Where else can we look to find evidence that Mr Chalmers' comments are false? Well, we can look at the Australian National Audit Office. The Australian National Audit Office and its reports get used very, very regularly in this place by Labor senators and other senators to try and undermine confidence in much of what the government is doing. So let's listen, let's look at what the Australian National Audit Office said in regards to the JobKeeper program. The Australian National Audit Report on the ATO's management of risks related to the rapid implementation of COVID-19 measures, which was released on the 14th of December 2020, found three important things. The first thing it found, and I'm quoting now, the first thing it found was that the ATO has been effective in managing risks related to the rapid implementation of COVID-19 economic response measures. The Australian National Audit Office found that the ATO had managed fraud and other integrity risks on a progressive basis. And finally, the Auditor General did not find it necessary 
to make any further recommendations. That is good news for the management of the JobKeeper program. That is a clear rebuttal to the comments of Labor's shadow treasurer made on the 29th of January this year in seeking to undermine public confidence in what has been a very, very important and very, very necessary economic measure. One that's been applauded in many, many other places around this country and indeed internationally, and it's one that I think the good grace of Mr Chalmers and other Labor senators and crossbench senators should at least have the decency in recognising that it came at a very significant time early in the pandemic, brought considerable relief. 700,000 jobs were saved. Importantly, businesses were given a lifeline. If time allows, I might just refer to another, another point which has been made. Uh, I think Senator O'Neill might have made this contribution. Certainly crossbench senators were making this contribution in regards to multinational tax avoidance. If you listened only to the contributions of crossbench senators and Labor senators, you would think that the government was doing nothing, was doing nothing in tackling multinational tax avoidance. Nothing could be further from the truth. Australia is a global leader in the international fight against corporate and multinational tax avoidance. Since the 1st of July 2016 to the 30th of April this year, the ATO has raised around $21.5 billion in tax liabilities against large public groups, multinational corporations, wealthy individuals and associated groups. Of this, around $13.5 billion in liabilities was raised from multinationals and large companies. The suggestion that often gets made in this place, place and outside it that the government is doing nothing to tack tackle multinational tax avoidance, that no multinationals pay tax in this country, is clearly un true. This has thus far generated cash collections of around $12.5 billion. I could go on, I could go on, but I think it's important as we bring to a conclusion this debate that senators in this place and those that are listening to the contributions understand that the JobKeeper program has been tremendously successful, came at exactly the right time as a lifeline for our country, an economic lifeline for our country, and the suggestion that is often made in this place that the government is doing nothing to tackle multinational tax avoidance and that the government is raising no taxes from multinationals is absolutely false. Minister. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. I would first like to thank those senators that have contributed to this debate today and yesterday as well. Schedule 1 to the bill amends the Income Tax Assessment Act of 1997, referred to as the 1997 tax law, to require non-government entities seeking endorsement as a DGR to be a charity that's registered with the Australian Charities and Not-for-Profit Commission or to be operated by a registered charity. Ancillary funds and specifically listed entities will be exempt from this requirement. The requirement to be a charity already applies to the majority of the general DGR categories in subdivision 30B of that 1997 tax law. And this measure will amend the special conditions applying to the, remainder, to the remaining general DGR categories, requiring non-government entities to maintain charity registration in order to retain their eligibility for DGR endorsement. These amendments include a 12-month transition period, which will provide non-charity DGRs with the time to meet the requirements for charity registration without losing their DGR status. And eligible DGRs may also have access to an additional three-year transition period. Now, this measure will improve the consistency of regulation, of governance and of oversight of deductible gift recipients, in turn helping to support the continued confidence in the sector and, of course, public support for DGR entities. Schedule 2 of this bill contains amendments uh, to the Income Tax Assessment Act of 1936 that remove the preferential tax treatment provided for offshore banking units, or commonly known as OBUs, and provide transitional arrangements for existing 
OBUs. In October 2018, the OECD's Forum on Harmful Tax Practices found that Australia's OBU regime contains some harmful features. And as a result, the Treasurer announced on the 26th of October 2018 that the government would seek to address those concerns of the OECD. And the OBU regime has since been closed to new entrants since, that, uh, since the Treasurer's announcements. So passing this bill will allow the OECD to confirm that Australia has amended the OBU regime to ensure that it is not what is known as a harmful tax practice. And this is consistent with the Morrison government's ongoing support for, the international tax, for international tax integrity and will protect Australia from potential reputational damage and other possible consequences. Most importantly, this bill provides for two years transitional arrangements to assist uh, ex uh, existing OBUs to transition away from the regime. I note that there is a second reading amendment uh, that has been tabled by the opposition. Um, I should make it very clear that the government, of course, will be opposing the opposition's second reader amendment. Um, that amendment has two components. One is essentially irrelevant and refers to uh, issues in the charity sector that are well outside, outside the scope of this particular bill and is simply a pious amendment. The other um, element of that, the other element of that amendment, second reader amendment, is uh, simply about multinational tax measures, which I think uh, my colleague in the whip described particularly well. Um, the amendment suggests that the government has failed to curtail the use of tax havens and tax avoidance schemes by multinationals, but nothing can be further from the truth. In fact, we are a global leader in the fight against international. Uh, international fight against corporate and multi-leader tax avoidance. And since July 2016, the ATO has in fact raised around $21.5 billion in tax liabilities against large Minister, public groups and multinational Minister, corporations. Minister, now being 12.15, the, the debate is interrupted and you will be in continuation. I, I shall now proceed to Senator statements. Senator Scar. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. On Friday 20 August 2021, I had the honour of meeting with members of the Australian Afghani community in my home state of Queensland. And on that occasion, I met a wonderful girl by the name of Nuria. And this is a message from Nuria, who is 16 years old, and I quote, With all the respect I have for the generous government of Australia, I am writing this to ask for help, help for my birth country, Afghanistan. Afghanistan is where I was born and learned to be grateful for each of my breaths. I have learned to never ask for more. Today, however, my country, my motherland, is being taken by the cruel group of Taliban. This is when I speak and ask for more for more than what is given just to me. Young children disappear in Afghanistan overnight. Men lose their daughters and wives because now they are forcibly married to one of the Taliban. Afghanistan was a country where freedom was defined in people's smiles and their faces. Yet now it has become a country where little children have nothing to say to the media but to cry. My people in Afghanistan believe their tears are seen by other people. They still believe in hope. This piece of land is a mother to all the people in Afghanistan. A small country with 37 million people living in it cannot and should not be given to cruel and unworthy groups like the Taliban. When I first came to Australia in 2018 and until this day, everything that the Australian government has done inspired me. Today, I want to see the Australian government inspire, inspire me one more time. One more time. I want my words to be heard by government and the people of Australia, as my words are the only way to ask for help. I want freedom for my la land, Afghanistan. Those are the words of the 16-year-old girl, Nuria, 
in my home state of Queensland. Nuria, your plea is now on the record of our nation's parliament. In considering Nuria's plea, Madam Acting Deputy President, we should consider the special bond between Australia and Afghanistan. It is a special bond born of the sacrifice of the members of our Australian Defence Force who served in Afghanistan, including the 41 who died, the hundreds who were wounded, their families and all of those who served who now carry the sacrifices that they made during that time. It is a special bond, a special bond arising from the common values between Australia and the people of Afghanistan who fought the Taliban and worked for a better future for themselves and their people. And those values, Madam Acting Deputy President, those values are listed on the Form 842, which I've become very familiar with over the course of the last two weeks, the application for an offshore humanitarian visa. And those Australian values are the same values which are shared by those people in Afghanistan who were fighting for their freedom and for a better life for themselves and their family, including, including a respect for the freedom and dignity of the individual, freedom of religion, freedom of speech, freedom of association, commitment to the rule of law, parliamentary democracy, equality of opportunity, equality of opportunity for girls and women, a fair go for all that embraces mutual respect, tolerance, compassion for those in need and equality of opportunity for all. Those are the values Australia shares with the people in Afghanistan who have been fighting for freedom, and it's one of the reasons we have that special bond. It is a special bond, born from the vibrant Australian Afghani community, the diaspora, who have contributed so much to Australia who are now part of our Australian story and who have carried themselves with such dignity and grace in the most difficult of circumstances. A special bond, Madam Deputy President, a special bond which is a deep bond, an irrevocable bond and an unbreakable bond. And that special bond leads to a deep moral obligation, a moral obligation to provide a safe haven for those, including their families, who put their own safety at risk by serving alongside our ADF and working with representatives of our civic society to help build a democratic civic society in Afghanistan. A moral obligation to work with the Australian Afghani diaspora, as we have all been doing over the last few weeks, to provide a home for those Afghanis who have a connection with Australia through family, education and community, or through fighting for our common values. And all of us, all of us, would have experienced communication and, and discussions with people who, who share those values, whether or not they are journalists, female journalists, women journalists, who were part of creating opportunity for, for themselves but also for women and young girls in Afghanistan, whether or not they were political leaders, some of whom who had received asylum in Australia in the early 2000s had gone back to Afghanistan and become part of civic society in Afghanistan in the modern day and are now seeking refuge again, or those Afghanis who were educated in Australia, received higher education and opportunities through Australia, returned to their home country and are now suffering per persecution. We have a moral obligation to work with the Australian Afghani diaspora, as we've been doing, as we've been doing and as we're currently doing at Kabul International Airport, to provide safety for those people. And, Madam, Acting Deputy President, we have a moral obligation to do whatever else we can to help the people of Afghanistan through urgent humanitarian assistance, whether or not it's arising from assistance needed as a result of drought, the upcoming winter or the need for emergency housing for those who have been displaced by the violence which has occurred in Afghanistan. Madam Acting Deputy President, I salute our ADF personnel the personnel of the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, the personnel of the Department of Home Affairs, all those people, part of our Australian community, who in, in many cases are putting their own lives at risk in Afghanistan as we are here today at Kabul International Airport to help people in need. I salute every single one of them and their families, and I salute all of those who have served, who have served either through the ADF or through other community organisations, 
or other government organisations in Afghanistan. I salute every, every single one of them, because in discharging their duties, they're not just doing that. They're not just doing what they need to do to discharge their duties. They're also discharging our moral obligation, our moral obligation, a moral obligation which arises from Australia's special bond with Afghanistan and its people. Senator Green. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I'm very pleased today to be joining the Senate uh, from Far North Queensland, um, and I'm keen to talk to you today about National Skills Week. Um, we know that it is National Skills Week this week, uh, and the government has cut funding to TAFE and training over the last eight years, which has led to a desperate situation where we have a skills crisis in North Queensland, which is putting our recovery at risk. Before that, though, I did want to talk briefly about Senator Cash's uh, self-congratulatory um, comments yesterday in question time. Um, yesterday, Senator Cash uh, took a dixer on notice about National Skills Week. And she responded with, well, what was supposedly the wonderful things that the Morrison government has been doing for our vocational education system. It's very interesting to see the author of the PATH um, program talk so glowingly about what they've done. But the truth is what she failed to mention is the systematic and ongoing massive cuts to training during the last eight years of the government. And it must have been slightly confusing for uh, Senator Cash to be talking about the decent skills training in this country, because the first two minutes of her answer yesterday were directly ripped off from the front page of the National Skills Week website. I'm not joking. You can go and check Hansard and then compare that to the nationalskillsweeks.com website, and you'll find the first half of Senator Cash's response right there on the front page. And the reason I raise this, Madam Acting Deputy President, is it shows how serious the Morrison government is when it comes to investing in skills and understanding the skills crisis. The fact is they're not serious at all. They don't think about it. They copy and paste. They think TAFE is for basket weaving. They would rather exploit overseas workers than invest in local jobs. Gutting government services that actually invest in working Australians than having to write speeches about them as if you support them must be a fairly familiar feeling. But investing in skills and training has to be so important to the foundation of our strong and vibrant economy. That is why the Morrison government, that then why has the Morrison government spent the last eight years destroying what once was one of the greatest training and skills programs in the world, our TAFE education system. Let's not forget that the book before the pandemic, right across Australia, the federal LMP cut $3 billion from traineeships, apprentices and TAFE. Madam Acting Deputy President, in regional Queensland, we are suffering from a massive skills shortage, thanks to eight long years of funding cuts by the LMP. Everywhere I go, every business I speak to has the same complaint. They want and need good skilled workers, but the government isn't delivering skilled workers fast enough or in the right professions. I travelled throughout regional Queensland. I have spent some time in other electorates in other states as part of uh, Labor's uh, post-pandemic recovery jobs task force. And the same story gets heard over and over again. And the government will deny that this is the case, and they'll talk about uh, some of the programs that they have funded. Um, but what we know is when we look at the results of those programs, they don't deliver. And the Morrison government's own data shows this terrible decline in skills. The data from the Department of Education, Skills and Employment has revealed that under the LNP's watch in nearly eight years, they have been in government from 2013 to September 2020, they have overseen the number of training apprenticeships in North Queensland fallen by 33%. We have lost a third of apprentices and trainees in North Queensland under the LNP. In far North Queensland, that means that we've got 1,000 fewer training opportunities for locals. In Townsville, it equates to 1,259 trainees and apprentices. In Mackay and the Whitsundays region, it means we've lost 1,470 local opportunities. 
And in Capricornia, covered by the central Queensland areas of Rockhampton and out to Maryborough, we know that we have lost a whopping 1,523 apprentices and trainees under the Liberal National Party. I need to remind you that in May 2020, when we were facing this pandemic, but looking at what we would need to recover, Prime Minister Scott Morrison said that he saw skills as the key to Australia's economic recovery, which is an extraordinary statement to make from a Prime Minister that has been the Treasurer and the Prime Minister of a party that has cut skills, watching a 33% decline in North Queensland. This is a region that has supported, supported Scott Morrison at the last election, but when they need him, he goes missing. No wonder local businesses are facing a skills crisis now. And it needs to be said that there is no one who considers that we wouldn't need some sort of skills migration program in the future. And of course, those opportunities should be there. But what we need to understand is why the federal government, the Morrison government, under their, Scott Morrison's leadership, would choose to, to introduce programs like the Designated Area Migration Agreement to a place like Cairns, which has a skill shortage, but doesn't invest further in TAFE and apprenticeship training schemes. We've got local people here that want to work and get the right skills, and they want to get those skills in the industries of the future. But unfortunately, under this Prime Minister, we've got businesses that are desperate for skills and workers who are desperate for jobs. We know that businesses across North Queensland are desperate for skills right now. And it's time that the Morrison government start investing properly in vocational training and, or hand it over to someone who will. We also know that this pandemic has increased the skills crisis, but it's not a new phenomenon. This was happening before COVID. COVID has made it worse. So what we need to understand is what the plan will be. We know that the government hasn't got a plan to recover in our regions. Well, not a plan that includes skilled workers from our local areas. It concerns me now that we are also looking at losing skilled workers in places like Cairns because the federal government is failing to deliver any type of income support or wage support to areas that are locked out but not locked down. The big issue that we saw last year was the risk of losing skilled people in industries like tourism and hospitality in an area that can barely afford to lose any skilled workers at all. We need a wage subsidy scheme in Far North Queensland right now so that we can make sure that we keep the skilled workers that we have. The government stands up in question time like Senator Cash yesterday and talked about National Skills Week, but we are losing skilled workers right now in Far North Queensland. If the government wants to help skilled workers, if the government wants to make sure that we've got the skills that we need when we want to recover, then the very first thing they should be doing this week during National Skills Weeks is delivering a wage subsidy scheme for places like Far North Queensland that are locked out but lock, not locked down. And when it comes to, to delivering the recovery that we know that we need in the regions, well, we need a very big plan and it has to be skills at the centre of that plan. Federal Labor has a plan to deliver this. We've talked about uh, delivering, um, bringing manufacturing back home to regional Queensland. We have talked about the fact that we will, uh, through the National Reconstruction Scheme, make sure that we deliver $15 billion of funding to manufacturing. But a really big part of that is skilling uh, our young kids so that they have a career and a future in manufacturing for the rest of their lives and that they can live and work in regional Queensland and not need to leave. We know that we've got um, a plan to deliver manufacturing skills uh, for regional Queensland that will transform and recover our regions so that we're not dependent on one certain industry. More industries in more jobs. That's what the Labor Party is going to do after the next election. I want to make sure that every kid who wants to get a job, every kid that wants to go to TAFE in Far North Queensland, in Townsville and in Central Queensland has the opportunity. And I am worried that if the Morrison government gets its way at the next election, we will lose another generation of young, skilled people who want to work in industries like manufacturing, but will never get the opportunity. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. 
Senator Hanson Young. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. And I rise today to make some comments that are very uh, important for the people of South Australia, and that is, of course, in relation to the issue of climate change and the devastating impact that our changing climate is having on our community, on our environment, and on our agriculture and water supply. When you look around the world and uh, take into consideration the huge impact that climate change is having on extreme weather right now across the world, it is just enormous. We have seen flash flooding in places like Germany and Belgium. Only in the last month, where over 220 deaths, 700 injuries and widespread damage to infrastructure. We have seen uh, flooding in uh, China. Uh, in, resulting in more rain in two days than in an entire year in some regions. We have seen uh, flooding in India that has created huge a number of deaths and massive uh, damage to infrastructure. We have seen landslides. And then, of course, you only need to go over to uh, the United States and to see the huge climate fires that have devastated those communities in recent weeks and months. The heat waves the wildfires, the death and the destruction, the fear of this extreme weather. And of course, uh, we know the world's best scientists have delivered a damning uh, warning to uh, leaders, governments and nations right across the globe that unless we do more to drastically cut carbon pollution in the next decade, we are only going to see more of this devastating Weather, these devastating weather events and extreme, uh, th these extreme uh, activities. In South Australia, of course, we live at the bottom end of the Murray-Darling Basin, at the end of the River Murray. And if we don't get climate change in check, if we don't start to reduce carbon pollution, if drought uh, takes hold, uh, we simply won't have access to the clean water supply that we are used to. In fact, it won't just be devastating for South Australia. It is going to be devastating for everyone who lives uh, throughout the Murray-Darling Basin, but everybody else who relies on the Murray-Darling Basin as our nation's food bowl. It is going to have a huge impact on our agricultural industries. And of course, what have we got uh, in relation to uh, solutions from this government, faced with these facts, with these warnings, with the science. Well, we've got a Prime Minister who is steadfast in his refusal to step up Australia's commitments to reduce carbon pollution, to address the dangerous warning signs that science, scientists have given us in relation to uh, stopping the expansion of fossil fuels and moving to clean, green, renewable energies and, en and energy production. Of course, Australia isn't just under pressure from the weather itself and from the people here in the Australian community. On the global stage, we're seeing now other leaders stand up and call out Prime Minister Morrison's lazy response to climate change. We're seeing big pressure come from some of our closest allies, the United States, and, of course, the United Kingdom. The US President's envoy on climate change has called out Australia for not having a sufficient target and doing enough to address carbon pollution, calling on Australia to do better and to come to the global conference at the end of the year in Glasgow with a decent commitment to reducing carbon pollution and to addressing climate change. Mr Morrison himself was on the phone to Boris Johnson, the Prime Minister of the UK, over the weekend. And what did Mr Johnson say to the Prime Minister? He said, you better be prepared to come with a better plan to Glasgow at the end of the year, wanting to make sure that Australia put on the table a decent commitment to reducing pollution and, having, and reaching net zero carbon <laughs> at least at some point. This Prime Minister has been absolutely stubborn, refusing to put in place a commitment to net zero, while some of our best, our closest trading partners, Japan, South Korea, even China, have put in place targets for net zero well before Australia has even bothered 
to put anything uh, on the table. Australia is going to go to this conference and they're going to be under huge pressure. If we don't step up our commitment, if we don't step up our ambition, if we don't put in place a proper plan to reduce pollution, we won't just be the laughing stock of the world. We're condemning our own communities and our own industries uh, to the dust bowl. We've got Australian producers who are facing now the impacts of tariffs because other countries are putting in place carbon adjustment mechanisms, which would mean that if Australia isn't going to price carbon, they'll do it for us. What is the Prime Minister's response to Australian producers who are going to be faced with these tariffs simply because they didn't do enough? And what is the excuse from the Prime Minister in relation to these issues? Why is he being so stubborn? Is it because he doesn't accept the science? Is it because he can't take on the lunatics on his back bench, the tinfoil hat brigade, or is it simply because he doesn't actually care? Because he thinks it's somewhere way beyond out in the never-never. Well, we're running out of time, Madam Acting Deputy President. It's crystal clear that this decade to come is the decade we have to use to take action. If we don't reduce carbon pollution, if we don't transition away and out of coal, oil and gas, those dirty fossil fuel energy productions, we are going to not be able to arrest climate change. And the worst fears of extreme weather and temperature rise will be impossible to reverse. So I asked the Prime Minister, we're here for another couple of days and uh, next week this parliament's going to be sitting. It's time for him to be upfront and honest with the Australian people as to what he will do when he goes to Glasgow at the end of the year. Will he continue to make Australia a pariah on the global stage and condemning our producers, our communities and our environment here in Australia? to the Dust Bowl, or will he stand up for proper climate action, not just in his own party room but around the rest of the world? There's an election not too far away. It will be sometime in the next six months. And the Australian people are seeing through this anti-science, anti-climate, anti-planet Prime Minister and his government. And for those in South Australia who care deeply about us protecting the environment, protecting our clean, green industries and wanting to provide a future for our kids, which, is, which guarantees clean water, a living Murray and clean air, well, you can't vote for the Morrison government. And the only people you can honestly trust at this next election to take on the big polluters, the companies who make a lot of profit out of polluting, to take on the anti-science, anti-planet agenda of the Morrison government is, of course, the Greens. Because we will never bow to the pressure of the coal lobby or the gas lobby or the oil lobby. We will always stand by what the science says and for what the planet needs. And so as people get ready for the election and think about what they want for the future of their communities and the future of their kids, make sure you send a strong green voice to Canberra to stand up for you and the future of your children, for the protection of your environment, of our environment, to protect our planet, because you can't trust the Morrison government or the cronies who continue to take donations from the coal, oil and gas lobby. They've got no interest in protecting the environment or protecting your kids' future or making sure we have clean air and clean water in years to come. Senator Van. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Last week, my home state of Victoria hit a tragic milestone. For over 200 days, the doors of businesses have been shut. Victorians have been confined to their home. 
On top of this, the restrictions that dwell long after the lockdowns finish have had devastating impacts on many, many industries and businesses. And this devastating impact on the social, emotional and financial state of Victorians and these effects we cannot ignore. Businesses are struggling. People are struggling. Doctors are having to put young girls on antidepressants in record numbers. What Victorian businesses are going through is a never-ending night with little hope to reach the day. Businesses in Victoria need to see a light. They need proper support from their state government. What is currently being offered by the state government in Victoria is simply not enough. At the moment, the current lockdown is planned to extend out to the 2nd of September, making a total of 214 days that Victoria will have been in lockdown. And we have no doubt that it will be extended from there. What has occurred in New South Wales has shown us that the <coughs> Delta variant is much harder to control and that these lockdowns may extend for much longer than we would hope. Make no mistake, businesses are closing. Every day I hear of family businesses that are in trouble. The hopes and dreams of thousands of hard-working Victorians are being crushed before our eyes. Years of hard work, sacrifice and dedication to build a viable and sustainable business are slipping through the tips of their fingers through no fault of their own. We must stand with them. Yesterday I spoke with Rick Jamieson, who runs Australia's biggest event company, Harry the Hirer. That company is an icon in Victoria. And the events industry in Victoria, in Australia probably, wouldn't exist, couldn't exist without that company. Lockdowns have taken away the jobs of a thousand people that Rick has on his books or that work for Rick. He's been using his own savings to keep the company going. Without the grand final, the Caulfield Cup or the Spring Racing Carnival, Rick says he may have to close his doors forever. He's doing everything in his power not to. The IP and the knowledge that he has within that corporation is what fundamentally underpins the events industry in Victoria. Just so we're clear, if Harry the Hire closed its doors, so would the whole of the Victorian events industry. Now, I would ask uh, the events minister, Martin Pakula, does he know or care about what that means for our great state? That is, just, that is not just no events this year. This means no more events for years to come. And events, I think every Victorian will agree, are the colourful fabric of Victorian life. And this would be truly devastating. Times like this calls for level of, of all levels of government to step up and support the people when they need it. We, the Morrison government, have supported Victoria more than any other state on a per capita basis. Since the pandemic began, the Morrison government has supported Victorian individuals and households with over $45 billion of direct support. However, the Commonwealth government cannot do this on our own. And I call on the Victorian Labor government that now is the time that they need to step up. Now is the time that they need to support businesses when they need you most. Unfortunately, this is not something we are seeing, and we are not seeing the Victorian government step up. This is not good enough. When New South Wales went into lockdown, the state government quickly came to the Morrison government to implement the Job Saver program, which is funded in a 50-50 split by the Commonwealth and state government. Importantly, this program provides an adequate level of support for more than 400,000 businesses and over 3.3 million workers. In comparison, the Victorian government scheme is complicated and businesses are only eligible to apply for a non-ongoing one-off grant which provides an inadequate level of support. And yes, it has been given more than once, but businesses don't know when it's going to come, if they're going to get it or not. Surely the amount of time that the Victorian government has placed its population in lockdown, they would have figured out the level of support that businesses need. Surely with all their experience as the lockdown leaders of Australia, they would have had some understanding of the pain that many businesses are feeling. When businesses are hurting most, the last thing they need is uncertainty on whether or not they will continue to receive the support they require, just simply to survive. Recently, I spoke to a local business owner from Frankston and who has forced, been forced to sell one of their factories, scrap half of their machinery and equipment, 
He's even had to refinance his family home to pay for business costs and staff wages. Despite all of this, they were recently rejected from receiving the Victorian government's business cost assistance program. This is just another example of good, hard-working Victorian business being let down by the Andrews government. This lack of support is truly heartbreaking. And with Premier Andrews' inability to clearly commit to ending lockdowns once high vaccination rates have been achieved, I truly don't know how businesses are supposed to look out and see a future in the state of Victoria. Premier Andrews has never worked anywhere but Spring Street or for the Labor Party. He wouldn't know a business if he tripped over one. How could he? He's never experienced it. Even those opposite, opposite me here today who cruised in here on the back of working for unions have at least had to sit opposite a business, have at least had to see in a business up close, even if they never ran one or even worked in one. Listening to the stories are just heartbreaking, and I would encourage Premier Andrews to speak to some of these people so he can understand the pain that they're going through and maybe, just maybe, that might convince him to come to the table. As the, as the support provided to New South Wales businesses show, the Morrison government is ready and willing to work with state governments to provide business with the support they need. We want to see businesses come out of this with more than their head barely above water. The Victorian government must step up before it's too late. And we are waiting and the people are waiting. Time, however, is not on our side. The future of our society cannot be predicted on uncertain future with success or failure held in the hands of a few state premiers whose vision does not extend beyond a closed society. Yes, we must vaccinate. I encourage everyone to go and get their jab. And we must open up. We can no longer live in fear of the virus, which has already done so much harm. Once we have achieved the level of vaccination, already agreed upon by states and territories, we must, be able to, must begin to open up so that businesses can begin to operate and individuals can once again enjoy the freedoms they so long for. So please, Premier Andrews, don't give up on our events industry. Let the fully vaccinated go to live events, like the granny we did in 1919 when the Spanish flu pandemic was running through Australia. My great side, Collingwood Football Club, won the Premiership in 1919. Why, when we didn't have vaccinations for the Spanish flu, why aren't we letting Victorians go to the grand final this year? Why are you again giving it away to another state? Then the Melbourne Cup. The Melbourne Cup was run in 1919. And I can't remember the, uh, the horse that won that year, but we have done this before. We let people go to the Melbourne Cup in 1919 middle of the Spanish flu pandemic. We need to open up our events. We need to open up Victoria. We need to let people live their lives and we need to support more business. Mr Andrews, the rest is up to you. Thank you. Senator Ayres, remotely. Thank you, um, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, well, what we've just seen from Senator Van is an example of the hyper-partisanship and the ideological undermining of state governments from coalition senators that has done so much to undermine the role uh, of the states in dealing with this emergency. I mean, the truth is that there were events in 1919 while well, the Spanish flu raged around the country because there was no vaccine. Now, we've had the prospect of a vaccination program uh, that would mean that the economy could open up, that Australians could return to normal, and the only thing standing in the way of that has been the failure of this Prime Minister to deliver vaccine supply to Australia. The coronavirus outbreak in New South Wales, and in particular in regional New South Wales, is a national emergency. It's an emergency composed of many smaller uh, emergencies, and one of those is occurring in the beautiful township of Wilcannia. It's a place where the Barkindji people lived long before Europeans arrived. Once our third largest inland port, it's now a place where the gap between the outcomes of uh, us in the city and Indigenous Australians has never been more stark. The life expectancy in Wilcannia before the pandemic arrived was just 40. 
just 40. When I last travelled there, the Darling River was dry, uh, the Barker in the local language. The people who'd lived by the river for thousands of years were having to bring bottled water in from Broken Hill. There are now 43 COVID cases in Wilcannia, spreading through overcrowded houses among an unvaccinated and vulnerable population. Slow testing times, limitations on health services mean that it is a much more likely to be a larger spread of the virus than current statistics show. There are now over 350 active cases in Western New South Wales, overwhelmingly among our first Australians. The majority of those are in Dubbo, but there are positive cases in Burke, Walgett, Narromine, Parks, Broken Hill, Brewarna, Gilgandra and Wellington. Many of these cases are occurring in communities where the only health services that are available are from the Royal Flying Doctor Service, hours and hours by ambulance to the nearest ICU facilities. Walgett, has, Walgett Hospital has four beds, none of them ICU. As of Monday, 109 active cases amongst First Nations people in Sydney, cases in the Indigenous community on the mid-north coast in Kempsey and Nambucca. We have always known that Indigenous Australians are more vulnerable to this virus. The government's emergency response plan for the coronavirus says Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are at a higher risk for morbidity and mortality during a pandemic and for more rapid spread of disease particularly within discrete communities. But we have failed to address the social determinants of health for these communities. Overcrowding, poor housing, lack of adequate access to clean water. These failings matter and no more so when facing a deadly pandemic. It's why protecting Indigenous Australians from coronavirus was a priority from the start of the pandemic. And yet in every state except Victoria, there are, there are lower rates of vaccination uh, for Indigenous Australians. 12.1% of First Nations people in New South Wales fully vaccinated. In Western New South Wales, the difference is even more stark. In the far west Tirana district, 13.4% of Australians vaccinated. But among Indigenous people, just over 8%. And in some communities, 2% six months into the vaccine rollout, and the Morrison-Joyce government has forgotten to vaccinate its most vulnerable communities. They are playing catch up now. And I wanna acknowledge the efforts of those local leaders and Aboriginal community controlled health organisations and the local health service in Western New South Wales that are doing their best to deliver a surge in vaccinations. But it's not what the government promised Indigenous Australians. On February 14, a joint media release from then Ministers McCormack and Colton said, every person living in regional, rural and remote Australia can rest assured they will have access to safe, effective COVID-19 vaccinations at the same time as their city cousins. What smug complacency. Mr Colton's electorate covers the Arana Far West Health District and has one of the lowest vaccination rates in the country and 300, 300 positive cases. On March 8, a joint media release from Ministers Hunt and Wyatt said, a comprehensive vaccination implementation plan has been developed in consultation with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health sector. And yet months later, here we are. Where did we go wrong? Who should be held accountable for this abject failure? Who is responsible? Well, it says very clearly on page five of the COVID-19 vaccination implementation plan for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, it says the federal government will select and procure COVID-19 vaccines. Failure. Safely transport vaccine doses to storage and administration sites within each state and territory. Failed. Develop and deliver a national Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander COVID-19 immunisation communications campaign, including localised, targeted communications material. Failed. Establish and maintain a national booking system. No evidence of that whatsoever. The Morrison-Joyce government failed, either partly or completely, 
on each of those criteria. They were the federal government's responsibilities to Aboriginal people, clearly outlined in their own implementation. They promised, they failed, and now First Nations people are filling the Dubbo Hospital. At the same time the outbreak occurred, the Morrison-Joyce government was congratulating itself for protecting First Nations people from COVID-19. At the Closing the Gap press conference on August 5, the Prime Minister said, one of our greatest concerns, if not our greatest concern at this outset of the pandemic, was the potential harm it would do to Indigenous communities. And to date, we have been successful in preventing that harm in Indigenous communities. Just words from this Prime Minister. Words that have no relationship to facts. Words that have no relationship to what the government has or hasn't done. And it's regional Australians who are paying the price. And it's Aboriginal Australians who are paying the price. Because the Morrison-Joyce government forgets about towns like Walgett. They forget about West Dubbo. They forgot about Wilcannia in the cruel way that places like Wilcannia are always forgotten by people in the Morrison-Joyce government. A friend of mine in Dubbo has a daughter who's tested COVID positive. She's a single mum with toddlers. One of the little ones is COVID positive. And he said to me this morning, this is such a strange time, he said as his voice was breaking. He can't provide support to that mother and her kids. He's terrified about what's going to happen to them. Uh, and that this failure of the government to provide vaccines in Western New South Wales has real human consequences for people uh, in the bush in New South Wales. It is likely that in Western New South Wales there will be terrible days and weeks ahead of us. Um, there are things that should be resolved now. Some of these towns have no access now to fresh food, uh, to shopping, because they can't access the shops. They are in big households where there are, uh, if somebody is infected, the whole household is quarantined, no access to fresh food and supplies. Mums who can't access nappies, baby wipes, bottles, formula, where is the federal government on these issues? Many of these communities are so far away from, a, from uh, the hospital services that are required that they are relying on, upon the hardworking Royal Flying Doctor Service in the event of an emergency. And I just say to the Morrison-Joyce government, if, if according to the Doherty plan and the National Cabinet modelling that's been provided, if we are going to open up, let's make sure that if the 70 to 80 per cent level is achieved in the cities, let's make sure that we've got adequate protections for our bush communities as well, particularly our First Nations communities. Thanks, Madam Acting Deputy President. Thank you. Senator Roberts, remotely. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Thank you. Earlier this month in my flag speech, I spoke of Parliament's duty to serve the people. Today, I'm asking who does this parliament really serve? I'll review the Morrison government's actions and this parliament's actions that carry the stench of cronyism and corruption. Starting with changes to water policy that Malcolm Turnbull and John Howard introduced in 2007. Those changes turned ownership and trading of water rights into a $20 billion industry. Large corporate interests, trade union bosses controlling industry super funds and national party power brokers have rushed to take advantage of this new wealth. And by take advantage, I really mean make out like bandits at the expense of family farms who can no longer afford water for their crops. I'm raising this issue first up because it illustrates how things are done in federal parliament. The Water Act already requires a transparent water trading register. The government tried to introduce one in 2012, stuffed it up and then gave up. I thought asking the government to take another run at it to reveal who was lining their pockets with the proceeds of water speculation would be straightforward. How naive was that? My amendment was opposed. The same party, the Liberal Nationals, that passed the legislation in the first place requiring a water trading register opposed my amendment that sought to ensure compliance with the Parliament's legislation. The Senate, 
with Labor's support, passed my amendment and it proceeded to the lower house where Labor rejected it. What happened in the 100 metres between the Senate and the House of Reps? The fix happened. The fix to protect corporate water traders. Labor agreed to cover for its LNP mates and the LNP returned the favour. That's how this parliament works. Cronyism is an art form. The same pattern of immoral behaviour occurred with the legislation One Nation introduced to stop banks bailing in depositors' funds to serve, save banks in a crisis. Stealing customers' hard-earned deposits. In 2018, Parliament passed legislation to allow a bail-in as part of emergency financial measures. The Labor, Liberal and National parties teamed up to oppose my bill and justified that action with a complete lie that the emergency provisions did not give APRA the power to order a bail-in. My legislation to protect the $1 trillion in bank deposits of everyday Australians was defeated despite the Treasury admitting in a briefing to my face that those emergency provisions do allow a bail-in. The Liberal Nationals Labor duopoly lied so their donors in the major banks can keep the right to steal your money to save themselves. The same cronyism was in place over the Christine Holgate watch scandal at Australia Post. As we now know, those watches were given to management as a reward for completing a very profitable deal for Australia Post. Australian executive, Australia Post executives accepted the watches and agreed to forego much larger bonuses. Why would the Prime Minister and the Parliament misrepresent a measure that saved Australia Post money? Because Christine Holgate had negotiated a fee with the banks of $20 million a year for the provision of banking services through licensed post offices, and the banks wanted a bigger share of those profits. Christine Holgate made the mistake of costing the big four banks money, and an example had to be made of her. And what a show Scott Morrison put on. After Ms Holgate was sacked, and Australia Post was removed back into the hands of friendlies, the deal was renegotiated. The banks are now only paying half that, $10 million a year, and 4,000 licensed post office franchise, franchisees got screwed. How much did it cost the banks to get the outcome they wanted from this parliament? In the last election cycle, Australian banks donated $500,000 to the Liberal and National parties, and $400,000 to the Labor Party. There's more. The Australian people can see that cronyism extends to pharmaceuticals. Most people don't know who funds the body that approves pharmaceuticals in Australia. The Therapeutic Goods Administration, known as the TGA. The big pharmaceutical companies applying for approvals themselves fund the TGA. The expert committees that advise the TGA on what to approve are composed largely of university academics these departments receive funding from pharmaceutical companies. That doesn't pass the pub test. Nor does this. In the last election cycle, the pharmaceutical industry donated $276,000 to Labor and $400,000 to the Liberal Nationals. Earlier this year, One Nation combined with the Greens to extend the license of community TV stations, C31 in Melbourne and Channel 44 in Adelaide. After Malcolm Turnbull in 2012 confiscated those free to air transmission rights to force viewers back to commercial TV owned by his mates. C31 and, C and Channel 44 survived on the back of large public campaigns. Why was it so hard to get an extension for community TV to use a spectrum that's not needed until 2024? Could it be because the commercial stations through Free TV Australia donated $17,000 to Labor and $13,000 to the Liberals? And that, of course, is the problem. Yesterday in the Senate, the Liberal Nationals and Labor duopoly teamed up to stop measures that One Nation and Senator Rex Patrick jointly proposed to make Woodside Petroleum pay for the $2 billion cost of cleaning up their environmental damage in the Timor Sea. Woodside easily evaded their responsibility to the people of Australia. It simply sold the little bit of extraction left in the gas field, including their cleanup liability, to a small company for a few million dollars. That company was then wound up and the taxpayers are now on the hook for the cleanup. One Nation's amendment would have restored the liability on Woodside. The crossbench supported that. Labor and the Liberal Nationals opposed it. Then I discovered that Woodside donated $135,000 to Labor and $148,000 to the Liberal Nationals. What a surprise. And then there's Beetaloo Basin. It's in the news this week because the government passed legislation to allow cash payments to its mining mates to frack the Beetaloo Basin. Guess who funds the cost of the exploration? Some $7 million per well. Taxpayers.
via a grant. Yet the gas extraction company owns the well and keeps profits from extraction. This little earner is called socialising the risk and the costs while privatising the profits. The first recipient of this cronyism was Empire Energy, a Liberal Party donor. But you didn't hear this from the opposition because Empire Energy donated $35,000 to the Labor Party. In echoing Senator Hansen's repeated calls, Senator Patrick has rightly pointed out that the oil and gas industry exported $62 billion in 2018-19 and paid the taxpayers just $1 billion in royalties. The taxpayers are getting royally screwed by this crony capitalist approach to government. One Nation supports free enterprise. We do not support cronyism. Earlier this year, One Nation introduced a motion to refer misuse of federal government disaster relief funds to a Senate inquiry. Millions, possibly billions of dollars are being misappropriated with no suitable work being conducted. The Liberal Nationals and Labor duopoly rode to the rescue of their mates and voted down our motion. No inquiry. The car park scandal has seen the Liberal, they've seen the Morrison government give $420 million of taxpayer money for commuter car parks in areas that don't need commuter car parks including three in the Treasurer's electorate and one for a train station that's closing. Now I assume even this government is not stupid enough to build a car park at a train station and that's not there anymore. So I wait with anticipation to see which of the government's mates just got free car parks. The sports rort scandal, the inland rail infrastructure grants, the Kimber radioactive waste dump, the Murray-Darling Basin's upwater program and Watergate are all corruption scandals that a federal corruption commission should have been dealt with if we had one. Parliament rubber stamps decisions and policies costing the people trillions of dollars so mates can feed off taxpayers, bludge off taxpayers, transfer wealth from taxpayers. The people are rightly angry. Decisions taken in the parliament must not only be honest, they must be seen to be honest and justified with hard, solid data. Australian voters will shortly be asked to pass judgment on this sorry parliament. Make no mistake, voting for the Liberal Party with their sellout sidekicks and nationals or voting for Labor and the ticket to power the Greens will represent business as usual for the Liberal Labor duopoly that has ruled this parliament for decades. It's now time at the next election to break this cycle of abuse. Stop repeatedly alternating Liberal nationals with Labor and expecting anything to change. It's now time to change the parliament. There are many third, party, third parties putting their hands up in this election and none have a track record of achievement greater than one nation. I'm very proud of the contributions Senator Hanson, Mark Latham, Steve Andrew, Rod Roberts and I have made and are making to restore governance to Australia. To Australia. Despite the Liberal, Labor and National Party's dishonest, many dishonest attempts to destroy her, for 25 years, Senator Pauline Hanson and One Nation have remained true to the Australian people and we will continue to be so. In conclusion, I make an observation regarding the Perspex security screen that now protects the Leader of the Opposition in the Senate from the Leader of the Opposition in the Senate and vice versa. This screen sends a powerful message to the Australian people. The Senate chamber now resembles a visitation centre at one of Her Majesty's prisons. How very appropriate. This is not a parliament, it's a crime scene. Thank you, Senator Roberts. Senator Bragg. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. Look, I rise in the Senate this afternoon to make some remarks about small business. And when Robert Menzies established the Liberal Party some 76 years ago, uh, Menzies um, thought very carefully about the sort of people that the Liberal Party would be wanting to represent uh, in the future. And he talked at length about this concept of forgotten people. And the forgotten people were the small business people, skilled artisans and the like. And I think that one of the real risks that we run uh, as we endure this economic and health shock, is that the people uh, that are going to be most affected are those people, those forgotten people, people who work in small business, uh, people who don't work for government, people who don't work for big business. Uh, one of the important, uh, perhaps the most important thing you can do as a representative in a democracy is to be engaged with the people. And I've done my best over these past few months, as my state has been locked down, to listen carefully to people who are working in whole manners or whole different uh, small business sectors. I've listened carefully and I want to do my best over these next few months to represent your interests uh, as best as I can. But one of the, the common features of many of the affected small businesses uh, is that they are sitting on top of um, ancient regulatory frameworks 
in the industrial relations space, in the skills and training space. Um, often they are held back by, again, quite ancient uh, and arcane uh, migration laws and arrangements. And all the complexity, the legal complexity, which Canberra and the states have put in place over the decades um, really has made the impact of the lockdowns much worse. And I want to step through a few of these, these sectors. Uh, the, the first one is the fitness sector. Uh, people would think of that as their local gym, perhaps. They might think of it as a personal trainer. Uh, they may think of it as some uh, outdoor activity. Now, before the pandemic, around 140,000 people were employed in this sector, according to the industry, and that has shared some 80,000 jobs. Personal training is available in some states. In, it is available in New South Wales if it's on a one-on-one -on -one basis, but that is not and cannot be seen as a way of replacing the day-to-day -day business the normal gym would be able to receive through memberships and through casual visits. I've spoken to gym owners. I understand that it takes years and years to build up a good book of business through marketing uh, and through uh, word of mouth and engagement with, with the community, wherever the gym is. And I'm very aware uh, that gyms uh, were the first to close, they'll be the last to reopen. Uh, and um, one of the lessons we should be taking from this pandemic is that health is good. Um, health and fitness is a good thing. And we should be looking to incentivise people to get engaged uh, with their health as best they can. One very regrettable campaign that has been run by the Lord Mayor of Sydney at the moment is to close down the Moorpark Golf Course, or to cut it in half and destroy it. It's been there for more than 100 years, and it's a very important institution that is available to um, all forms of people across the social spectrum. Uh, Moorpark Moore Public Course, which is a public golf course, is available to anyone. And I encourage people to go there. You will see that there is a broad range of people uh, visiting it, uh, learning how to play golf, and being active. And it is a public golf course. And um, frankly, we can't all be silver tails. And the, the, the collapse of these public golf courses means that golf becomes something that is out of reach uh, for the average worker who can't afford to purchase a $50,000 membership to go and play at Royal Sydney. So um, I use this opportunity to remind people in New South Wales that the Lord Mayor of Sydney's plans to collapse public golf is not in the interest of the community. It's certainly not in the interest of people's health. And so what we need to do after the lockdowns are ended is to look to ways to incentivise people to go to the gym, uh, to get fit. Um, it's a good idea and we should be doing more of it and have a very open mind to supporting the fitness industry. Hairdressers and barbers are equally affected, uh, can't open, uh, can't, earn a, can't earn any revenue uh, because they are in personal care sectors. Uh, much like beauticians, uh, they are in the same boat. Uh, of course, the lockdowns come on top of, as I mentioned at the start of this contribution, very complicated labour law arrangements, very complicated migration arrangements. In terms of barbers and hairdressers, these are some of the hardest skills uh, to fill, particularly in metropolitan areas, where uh, trying to get a barber is virtually impossible. And so many of these small businesses will go through and they will uh, spend five or $10,000 to bring someone out, often from Europe, so they can be a, they can be a barber. Um, and um, some of the uh, current arrangements that these barbers are facing and these hairdressers are facing uh, are very, very troubling. I mean, they're looking at losing these, these skills uh, because they're, they're on the deletion list. Um, and I think we should be looking to ensure that people who are running these, these shops, uh, who put their, their savings on the line, they should be able to attract and keep the skills they need to run their businesses, especially after the pandemic. I mean, the last thing we want to see is for um, having provided lifelines to some of these businesses to keep them going on the smell of an oily rag, they emerge from the end of the lockdowns and then all their staff di disappear. Uh, so we've got to be very, very open, I think, to making further changes to support barbers and hairdressers. Travel agents, people would know, uh, have been heavily affected, um, basically 18 months in limbo. Uh, many people have left this sector because it's not seen as an attractive place to work because of the uncertainty. I've even spoken to travel agents around Sydney that have said that they don't think they'd be able to secure um, a tenancy in Sydney because um, why, would, why, would a, why would a person who owns a, owns a retail shop want to let out their shop to a travel agent, um, given the uncertainty that this sector has faced? One of the, I have to say, the most concerning 
uh, factors that I think is facing any industry is the prospect of travel agents having negative revenue. So they're 18 months into the pandemic and they haven't been able to earn any new revenue and all they're doing is processing refunds. And according to the industry, they are processing $4 billion worth of refunds. Uh, so again, this is another, another sector that I think we need to be having a very open mind to providing more financial support to at the end of the lockdowns. Now, the broader travel industry, which is already subject to some financial support, I think is suffering under the, the very low uh, caps, which are available to entry into Australia. Now, there's a whole lot of humanitarian reasons uh, that are happening right now why uh, that determine the use of some of those caps, but we really need to be getting those caps up to a much higher level. And I think we should be getting very close to setting some, some dates alongside the national plan because uh, these sectors, I think, have put up with enough rot and certainly that's why it's important that the state premiers do the right thing and stick by the national plan. Finally, on to hospitality. Again, uh, many businesses down to 95 per cent. Many businesses cannot transition to come and, come and get a coffee uh, while you're out on your walk with your mask. They just can't do that. And so they haven't been able to open. They haven't been able to employ their staff. Uh, some of these matters will be for the, up to the states, but um, if they're going to reopen with having four square metre rules where it's effectively unviable for many of these restaurants and cafes, I just think that they won't, they won't reopen. Uh, they won't be back. Uh, the risks are too great. And so we need to, as we get closer towards the fourth phase of this plan, um, providing some incentives perhaps to the states to ensure that when they open, they are allowed to open properly for the vaccinated Australians, that they are allowed to open and service people and they can get back to business. The hospitality se sector has flagged publicly, I think, quite clearly that they would like to see changes to fringe benefit tax to incentivise the use of their services. Uh, no doubt the budget is under great pressure and I'm sure that the Treasury would be uh, against any changes to fringe benefit tax. But I think we should at least consider the idea of um, giving a one-year holiday so that people could frequent bars and restaurants for the next 12 months to help restaurants and cafes and the hospitality sector get back in business. A one-year holiday from the FBT could be a very, very effective way to try and make up some of the, the extensive lost revenue. And so finally, I just make this point that um, we don't want to see, at the end of this crisis, more big government and more big business. And there's nothing wrong with big business, but we want to see that thriving small business sector, which has been something that uh, my party has been prepared to speak up for over the past 76 years. I think we've done a good job so far, but we should be prepared to open the taxpayer wallet again and to support some of these sectors where they have unique problems and they have been smashed by the pandemic. Um, it will not be a good outcome if we finish the pandemic with more big government and more big business and a whole a much smaller private sector in terms of small business. Thank you. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, we're witnessing a failure of leadership from the Morrison government, which is impacting Tasmanian workers and families who are struggling to pay bills and feed their families. These Tasmanians have been plunged into uncertainty and disruption because of a leaky quarantine system and a slow vaccine rollout. They are not getting assistance from the Morrison government because they are not in lockdown. Even though the New South Wales and Victorian lockdowns are having a massive impact on the Tasmanian tourism industry. While businesses in those states can receive federal financial support, Tasmanian tourism operators and their employees currently receive nothing from the Morrison government to help them survive. Tourism directly contributes $1.49 billion, or about 4.9 per cent, to Tasmania's gross product, and directly and indirectly supports around 42,000 jobs. That's about 17.2 per cent of the total Tasmanian employment, higher than the national average and the highest in the country. In 2020, as borders closed to contain COVID-19, demand in the tourism, hospitality and events sector basically dried up overnight. Tasmanians rallied 
As soon as they could travel, they explored their hometown, their home states, and tried to spend money at home. Despite that, tourism operators and events are facing severe reductions in income as a result of travel restrictions and physical distancing measures, with some delaying their reopening or limiting, limiting their offering and others potentially closing permanently. Ongoing travel restrictions have led to the cancellation of hundreds of flights in and out of the state. At Tasmanian airports, boards are lit up with cancelled flights or they're not even open at all. One worker at Hobart Airport said, we are now looking at around 80 to 90 staff that have been stood down with no pay or support from anyone. My understanding is, he said, because they are on stand down, they are not able to get any support at all as they have not been terminated. I'm sort of lucky at the moment, he says, and have 15 hours of work a week, but all the late cancel cancellations, I won't receive our next roster until Friday with the chance of being stood down like the others. I've been working at Hobart Airport for nearly 20 years. I have never felt so unsure as to how I'm going to survive this with no help. When I travel, uh, in quote, and when I travel from Devonport and Launceston airports, which I do frequently, workers there tell me the same story. A business that I know in northwest Tasmania has invested thousands of dollars recruiting and training a new workforce, but those workers are also now in limbo. The Tasmanian Tourism Industry Council recently stated, the hard truth is some 18 months since borders first closed, we are today looking at the most uncertain conditions we've had, yet with COVID seemingly out of control in New South Wales, no absolute certainty of when borders might open again to our main markets in New South Wales and Victoria, and no job keeper to secure our workforce and provide an industry safety net. The Tasmanian State Government has introduced some short-term measures to support the industry, but there has been no support from the Morrison Government. Prime Minister Morrison and his government have failed and Tasmanian workers and their families are paying the price of his failures. He has betrayed every Tasmanian worker who is currently stood down or forced to accept hours so, so low that they can't pay their bills. He has betrayed every one of the 1,776 Tasmanian tourism businesses, businesses which have shown remarkable resilience in the face of bleak prospects and exhausted financial reserves. The very least that Prime Minister Morrison could do is to provide some support while the Delta variant runs riot down the eastern seaboard. Mr Morrison's failure to take responsibility is playing out in the lives of tens of thousands of, Australian, of Tasmanians who are struggling. The Prime Minister was dragged kicking and screaming to provide wage support in 2020. Then he ended the JobKeeper scheme too early. Then he allowed businesses to keep massive JobKeeper overpayments millions of Australian taxpayers' dollars to millionaire CEOs and billionaire shareholders. Imagine what even a tiny bit of that money could do for those workers around the Tasmanian airports. Workers in the travel industry have been crying out for help. That call has also fell on deaf ears. The words of that worker that uh, raised those issues from Hobart Airport should be ringing in Mr Morrison's ears. I have never felt so unsure as to how I am going to survive this with no help. <coughs> Senator Watt. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting, uh, Acting Deputy President. I see that there's a little bit of time left, um, so I might just take the opportunity to make a short contribution, if I could, uh, because I'm very concerned about reports that have emerged today uh, of the Prime Minister doing what he does best which is blame other people for his own failures. Today, yet again, it's Queenslanders that the Prime Minister is wanting to blame for his own failures when it comes to the vaccine rollout. The Prime Minister has been in the media today blaming Queenslanders uh, and saying that they're not showing enough urgency when it comes to getting vaccinated against COVID-19. The only person in this country who has not shown a sense of urgency when it comes to the vaccination rollout is the Prime Minister himself. This is the man who month after month told us that the vaccine rollout is not a race, it's not a competition. 
How many times did we hear that from the Prime Minister when Labor and many other people were calling on him to speed up the vaccine rollout, to do more deals with vaccine uh, with uh, vaccinate and pharmaceutical companies, but he refused to do so, assuring us time after time after time that it was not a race. And now he has the hide to turn around and blame Queenslanders for any shortfall in our vaccination rollout. That is the kind of disgusting anti-Queensland attitude that we have seen from this Prime Minister throughout this entire pandemic. Let's be very clear. The vaccine rollout is Prime Minister Scott Morrison's job. It is his job to get the vaccine rollout working. It was always his job to get the vaccine rollout at working. And if it's not going according to his satisfaction, rather than blaming Queenslanders, he should have a good look in the mirror and see who's actually responsible for this. If there's any reluctance by Queenslanders to go and get vaccinated now that vaccines are finally starting to roll in, again, it is the Prime Minister's job to put on a decent public information campaign uh, that convinces people to get out there and get vaccinated quickly. It is particularly the Prime Minister's job to do this public information campaign when he's allowing his own members of parliament, like the member for Dawson, George Christensen, Senator Canavan and Senator Rennick, to run wild, spreading all sorts of anti-vaccine, anti-lockdown, anti-mask attitudes within the community and discouraging people from following the government's own health advice. So let's be clear. If the Prime Minister has a concern about the level of vaccination that's occurring in Queensland, that is on him. It is his job to get the vaccine rollout working. It is his job to get a public information campaign working, not uh, anyone else's. And he should stop trying to spread blame uh, towards other people, particularly my uh, Queensland compatriots. Uh, and he should actually, for once, take responsibility and do his own job. This continues the pattern we have seen from Scott Morrison, the Prime Minister, throughout this pandemic. Yesterday, referring to people in Queensland and Western Australia as cave people. We've got other senators from New South Wales, like Senator Bragg, uh, referring to Queensland and other places as being hermit kingdoms. That is the kind of anti-Queensland attitude uh, that we continue to see from members of this government right up to the Prime Minister. The situation has even got worse today because the Queensland government has been forced to put a pause on hotel quarantine from people travelling from interstate uh, hotspots. What is the reason for that? It is because in 18 months this Prime Minister has not been able to build one quarantine station to take the pressure off in Queensland. Do it's, your it job. It is now 1.30 pm. I shall now proceed to two minute statements and I will go Senator Billy. No, Senator Chandler. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. 39,000 Australians put their lives on the line serving in Afghanistan. 41 of our finest Australians gave their lives, something which we will always remember and honour. Our diggers went to Afghanistan to find and defeat those responsible for supporting the September 11 terrorist attacks, and together with our allies, they did that job admirably. But we asked them to stay and to do even more, to provide some semblance of security and some hope for the future for Afghans who would otherwise be subject to the barbaric rule of the Taliban and their evil ideology. And they did that job too. For two decades, their presence gave women and girls in Afghanistan the chance of an education, the chance to work, the chance to leave their own home without permission. Their presence helped keep many women and girls alive and prevented them from having to endure what they would have been subjected to under Taliban rule. Rape, forced marriage, public beatings, murder. Despite the lies and propaganda of the Taliban, this is what Afghan women and girls once again face the prospect of. Now that our soldiers are no longer in Afghanistan, we must step up and protect those who they were protecting for the last 20 years. Australia can and Australia should continue the legacy of our soldiers and our veterans by making an increased commitment to rescuing thousands of Afghan women and girls from the brutality of the Taliban. We will now go remotely to Senator McKim. 
thank you, Acting Deputy President. Hewan Aquaculture, an industrial salmon farming business in Tasmania, is currently on the market. Its owners can no doubt see the writing on the wall and are getting out while the going is good. Or rather, when the going is good for businesses with extremely bad environmental impacts. Don't believe the glossy corporate spin. Big Salmon is trashing the Tasmanian marine environment, it is trashing downstream industries, and it's trashing the amenity of people who use them or live on them. And it's also an animal welfare disaster. So who would take on a business in an industry that is so on the nose? Well, currently leading the charge is Brazilian corporate meat giant JBS. JBS has a disgraceful record of environmental destruction, animal cruelty, civil rights abuses and exploitation of slave labour. This is the same JBS that has purchased and run down abattoirs in Tasmania, leaving employees and communities high and dry. But JBS sees an opportunity here because the Tasmanian government disgracefully is trying to double inshore salmon production in Tasmania's beautiful waterways and double it at any cost. Big Salmon has captured its so-called regulators in Tasmania. It has captured the major political parties in Tasmania, and it is the Tasmanian people and the Tasmanian marine environment that are paying the price. The Greens are proud to stand with people and communities calling for Mr Frydenberg to reject the proposed takeover of Hewan Aquaculture by JB. Thank you, Senator. We will now go to Senator Sheldon. Good, thank you very much, uh, Chair. Well, there's 15,000 hardworking owner driver and employees, truck drivers across the country at Toll, Lynn Fox, Star Trek and FedEx are preparing for take, to take industrial action over the coming weeks. This is one of Australia's most deadliest industries. Truck drivers have worked around the clock through COVID-19 outbreaks and lockdowns to keep Australia moving. Retailers like Amazon and Aldi have seen their profits burn during the pandemic. Amazon's profit increased by 224 per cent to $11 billion in just the last quarter. Yet they have turned around and are now trying to squeeze rates for the very workers delivering their products. And when those at the top of the supply chain, like Amazon, squeeze rates, transport companies like Toll try and recover that money by cutting paying conditions of their drivers and general workers. More than 15,000 truck drivers and the Transport Workers Union have said enough is enough. They have said enough of companies like Amazon and Aldi squeezing the transport sector and destroying middle class jobs. They have said enough of those at the top of the chain, the big retailers, manufacturers and oil companies knocking the floor out of the industry. But transport companies continue to put profits over safety, even as we face down the worst health crisis in generations. A worker on the morning shift at one of FedEx's Sydney depots tested positive for COVID-19 last week. But FedEx allowed the shift changeover to take place at, as normal one hour later without having the appropriate cleaning and the workers being um, not being put into danger. One FedEx worker said, I quote, they just want to keep, at, keep going at all costs. The attack on the rights and pay of the Australian middle class is being felt across the entire economy. Thank you, Senator. We will now go to Senator Hanson, remotely. Yes, we have. Thank you very much. Well, we've got the Premier at it again in Queensland. As of midday today, she shut down the borders to all Queenslanders, anyone who wants to come in from New South Wales, Victoria, and also the ACT. So you have to apply to get here. All They say all the quarantine hotels, they're full, so no one can come back in here uh, into Queensland. And you can apply for a 
exemption if you're lucky. We've seen the closure of the borders. We've seen people can't get across, essential workers, teachers, those people who could not come across. Then you were forced to actually have to have the first shot of vaccination and you must prove that you've actually had that. We've got people who live on the Tweed border, people who rely on doing their shopping, going to the um, facilities, getting medical attention. No, that's all shut now because we're shutting down again because we've got this person who wants to control Queenslanders. Well, it's about time the Prime Minister stepped up to the mark because this is what people want. You're saying that you have an agreement with the states that once we get to 70%, restrictions will be eased, then by 80%, there's no more lockdown. How can you give us that guarantee when you know that these premiers of these states are determined to do their own thing? You're not giving the people the hope that they need that you are in control of this country. And I'm suggesting to you now, you start legal proceedings in the High Court to challenge these states under the Constitution, the right of free movement of people across the borders, because that's what needs to happen. You know this is going to go on because the like final vaccination to hopefully get it up to the 80 per cent, as you're indicating, is going to be to the end of November. Well, people want assurances what is going to happen at Christmas time so they can see their loved ones and their families. Step up to the mark, Prime Minister. Pull the premiers into line. We are one nation and should be united in this. Thank you, Senator. We will now go remotely to Senator Billick. Senator Billick, you have the call. Thank you. The, uh, the Prime Minister, so I'll just, can you hear me, yes. Deputy President? Yes, yes, yes I can hear you. Thanks, had a few technical issues. The Prime Minister had two jobs this year, a speedy rollout of COVID-19 vaccines and fixing quarantine, and he's failed at both. Australia's vaccination rate is 35th, 35th out of the 38 OECD countries, yet Australia has some of the highest vaccine hesitance in the world because of the confused messaging over the AstraZeneca vaccine. Mr Morrison's failure, absolute failure to secure vaccine doses has slowed the rollout to a crawl. He's given up setting vaccine targets because he misses every single target he sets. His, his government is just starting to bring pharmacies on board now. Should have done it months ago, but he's starting to do it now with the rollout, but months too late. We've seen 27 leaks from hotel quarantine, and yet he refuses to step up and deliver fit-for-purpose quarantine facilities. I'll just remind people, quarantine is a Commonwealth responsibility under the Constitution, and the government's own hand-picked advisor, Ms Jane Horton, told the government to develop a national quarantine system many months ago. But instead of taking any action, the Prime Minister, Mr Morrison, has handballed the problem back to the states. Mr Morrison and his government have attacked Labor State for their COVID restrictions, undermining efforts to stop the spread. But when their Liberal mates in New South Wales went into lockdown, Mr Morrison suddenly decided lockdowns are OK. He previously, though, praised Ms Berejiklian for resisting a lockdown, and we all know that it was clearly needed. Adding to Mr Morrison's failure is his refusal to pull into line the backbenchers like Mr Prince Christensen or Senator Canavan and Senator Rennick. They seem to be Thank given you, free Senator. Range. Your time has expired. Senator McMahon. Thank you, um, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise today to speak about the plight of zoos and aquaria in the Northern Territory. Now, in the Northern Territory, we don't have what you would call traditional zoos and huge aquaria. But we do have several very unique attractions, and um, their tourism value is far outstripped by their ecological and their educational value. And some of them are doing it extremely hard at the moment. We know that when uh, down south sneezes, the Northern Territory catches a cold, and that is in fact what is happening. These uh, these attractions rely on um, interstate tourists and large tours of school children that come through in buses which they're just not getting at the moment. Now, we have provided assistance to them, and that's fantastic, but they're still doing it extremely hard and are on the brink or are, in fact, closing. Uh, we talk about the Reptile Centre in Alice Springs, Rex Neandorf, a fantastic, unique collection of reptiles, many of which are exclusively found in Central Australia. Uh, fantastic 
educational and ecological value. And then another attraction up in Darwin, Indo-Pacific Marine, John and Helene. They have in fact closed. They have been there for 50 years. They have living whole reef living ecosystems in aquariums. Now, have they been closed because of COVID? No, they've certainly been impacted because of COVID, but they have been closed now because the Northern Territory government has kicked them out of the premises that they lease, kicked them out and not provided any alternative premises, and they're not looking for a handout. They don't want anything free. They're happy to pay rent, but they have been left with nowhere to go. This is an incredibly unique attraction and it is now lost to Thank the Territory. Thank you, Senator. Your time has expired. We will move on to uh, remotely be joined by Senator Griff. Yes, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Today, I pay tribute to someone who has made an enormous and lasting contribution to the Senate, and that is Senator Rachel Seawitt, who will give her valedictory tonight after an incredible 16 years of service. I particularly acknowledge her service to the Senate Community Affairs Committee since 2008. More than many, she is someone who truly does the work, someone who makes a real and worthy contribution, someone with a burning passion for supporting people, especially those who endure disadvantage, and someone who deploys her incredible breadth of knowledge to raise awareness and very much drive change. Even after years of working together on many inquiries, I'm still awed by her. She is absolutely a legend of the Senate. She has set impossibly high standards in everything she does, in committees, in whips, in the chamber, and of course in her advocacy and representation. All senators should aspire to meet those same standards, and we should all aspire to show the same respect and care that she shows to others, no matter who they are. I'm sure every one of us have benefited from her expertise, her experience and her kindness. I am deeply grateful for everything Senator Seward has given and I wish I could be there to personally thank her for her outstanding service to the Senate and to the Australian community later on today. I sincerely wish Senator Seward the very best for the future and I know without doubt she will continue to inspire and support those in need. Thank you, Senator Griff. Senator Lyons. Recently, several published reports point to women as the big losers coming out of COVID and the subsequent recession and continuing lockdowns. Last year, 8 per cent of Australian women lost their jobs and women's total hours worked were down by 12 per cent. The figures for men were 4 and 7 per cent. The Grattan report shows that in November 2020, there were 40,000 fewer women with bachelor's to degrees employed than at the start of last year. Trends for men went in the opposite direction, and that when university qualified women regain employer, employment, it's at a lower rate of pay. The responsibility for caring and homeschooling children falls mostly to women, and during lockdown, rates of domestic violence increased dramatically. There's no doubt that the effects of COVID and the subsequent recession have negatively impacted women's earnings and economic security. Some of the Morrison government's decisions have adversely impacted women. Carving out universities from JobKeeper, a sector with a female workforce of 59 per cent, and early childhood educators, a workforce of almost 100 per cent, won't forget that Mr Morrison slashed their JobKeeper subsidy first leaving some of Australia's lowest paid without anything. And finally, just a few days ago, the Workplace Gender Agency reported that the gender pay gap has widened to 14.2 per cent. These are all structural issues the government can do something about, but whether it's sexual abuse or the allegations of rape in this parliament, their male-focused budget or their failure to respond in a timely manner to the Respect at Work report, we have a Prime Minister with a tin ear when it comes to women. He doesn't see women in their own right, but as someone's mother, daughter, sister or auntie. And women voters— Thank 51%. you, Senator. We will move to Senator Stilljohn. Thank you. 
We are in a, cri uh, a climate crisis, and yet the major parties are joining together to support fossil fuel uh, loving corporations uh, because they are the ones who donate to them, uh, instead of taking the action uh, that our community demands and needs. In the heart of the Northern Territory is one of the biggest gas, gas reserves ever discovered in this country. If the Liberals, Labor and big gas corporations get their way, this beautiful part of First Nations land will be opened up for fracking. This part of our country is called the Beedaloo Basin, and if the Liberal, Labor and gas corporations eyeing it up all get their way, fracking the Beedaloo Basin will admit at roughly 34 billion tonnes of pollution. Now, to put that in perspective, uh, that is four times as polluting uh, than burning all the coal in the proposed Adani Carmichael mine. The Morrison government, sadly supported by Labour, has committed $240 million of our public money to gas corporations to support this project going ahead. Now, the Greens and the community know that we need to stop all new coal, oil and gas uh, projects now. We are in a critical decade for climate action. We must take this step and support communities to transition. The Beedaloo Gas Project will contribute to destroying our climate. It is not too late, and I urge Labour to join with the Greens, the community, and with community members on the ground, organisers like Aya Goodrich Carlting and like uh, Billy McGinley, uh, members of the community, members of the Northern Territory Greens, in opposing this project. The Greens will always fight to stop uh, the Beedaloo gas project. Thank you, Senator. We will go to Senator Patrick remotely. Thank you. Three weeks ago, I highlighted the impending relevance of being able to pr prove vaccination status and the weakness in the system being relied upon for the government uh, for such proof. In the intervening time, I've met with ministers and, like every Australian, have watched the situation develop. I note the Premiers of Western Australia and Queensland have announced that entry into their states will require a permit, which is dependent on being able to provide vaccination status. I note employers announcing that COVID vaccinations will be compulsory for certain work, as it is for aged care workers, some transport providers, childcare workers and quarantine facility workers. Over the same period, the vaccination program has delivered 4.4 million doses, with almost 290,000 doses being added every day. We need to verify vaccination, and the need for that is climbing. The problem is getting bigger. The systems we're relying on are flawed and could undermine efforts to open up our economy and ease lockdowns. I also note there's an information vacuum regarding the government's solution. COVID Safe was the worst software application ever developed. It's only got one happy user, and that's Mr. Stuart Roberts. We cannot afford to have a COVID Safe 2.0. People are dying, people are losing their livelihoods. We have a proven solution onshore which could. Have been could have been implemented in the three weeks since I first uh, demonstrated it to ministers. The government needs to act. Thank you, Senator. Senator O'Neill. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Acting Deputy President. And I rise to speak uh, to the very concerning and escalating crisis that is engulfing the people of Dubbo and the western part of New South Wales. As we speak, we know that 400 cases are known to be positive that not only Dubbo but the towns of Gadooga, Wilcannia and towns along the Darling are now beginning to really be severely impacted by the COVID uh, disease in their community. In fact, at this stage, 85 per cent of those positive cases are Aboriginal people. This is a massive crisis in the making, and we might have felt that there was protection in isolation previously. That is no longer the case. In my contribution today, I'm going to call on the Minister for Health for New South Wales and the Minister for Health federally along with the Premier and the Prime Minister and the Minister for Defence to have a look at this first massive break into our First Nations community. There is a capacity problem with Dubbo Hospital. 
Narrow Mine Hospital nearby has been set up as a site for the reception of people from all over the western part of New South Wales. That will overflow very, very quickly. The Dubbo Hospital is at risk of being swamped by this illness very, very quickly. So, in terms of what is a prescient response at now, at this point of time, I call on those ministers that I have named to set up a field hospital close to Dubbo Hospital to provide triage and proper management, to also engage in delivering a proper retrieval and movement system to make sure that people who have COVID can get triaged properly and looked after where they are, transported to the level of care that they need. We also really desperately need the capacity of New South Wales to build up. Are there doctors out there who can intubate? Is there sufficient oxygen? Do we have enough PPE? Do we have people who are properly trained in PPE and the use? What are the transport systems like? We cannot wait for this to get out of the gate. We need the ADF Thank in there. Thank you, Senator. Senator uh, Faruqi, remotely. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. We are in a critical time for climate action, and the Liberals are busy giving handouts to their political donors for gas giants to frack the Beetaloo Basin and plunge us further into a climate emergency. Labor's capitulation on this dodgy climate-destroying project is yet another terrible decision from the so-called opposition. The Beetaloo slush fund stinks of corruption. It will be deadly for our climate. This gas rot has already given millions to Minister Taylor's mates. Empire Energy was handed $21 million to drill at three sites in the Beetaloo, despite still waiting on environmental approvals from the Northern Territory government. Beetaloo Basin's traditional owners have condemned the Morrison government for handing out millions to gas companies to frack their land. The Curry Curry gas plant and the Pelaga Narrabri coal seam gas wells in New South Wales need to be abandoned right now. The First Nations people of Coonabarabran want to know why their Gomorrah land, their culture and heritage is being destroyed for this irrelevant industry. These projects are just plain reckless. The Morrison government has used the cover of this pandemic to help their donors in the coal and gas lobby stockpile even more profits while they pollute water and the very air that we all breathe. No matter how these climate criminals spin it, we know gas is as dirty as coal. Unlike Labour, the Greens will not stand by and watch the Liberal Nationals destroy a country and plunge us faster into a climate emergency. I really hope, though, that Labour listens to traditional owners on whose very land we all live and change their minds to protect it rather than be partners in its destruction. Thank you. Senator Canavan. Uh, we see daily evidence of why these cruel, inequitable, selfish and hypocritical lockdowns must end. Lockdowns have long since gone past their use-by date. This week, more small businesses have gone to the wall because we have made it a crime for people to work for themselves. A good mate of mine, Michael Trout, lost a brilliant tourism business in Cairns. A cafe owner in Sydney was locked out of his own business because he could not pay the rent, and there are many, many more heartbreaking stories. Lockdowns have been a boon for big online businesses, but they are the death knell for the small family-run businesses that are the bedrock of our society. Vaccine passports are now being imposed on our health, construction and service workers, while white-collar high-paid professionals have no medical mandates imposed on them and they get paid the same all while working from home. This is the way lockdowns work. The rich wrap themselves in cotton wool and retreat to homes with swimming pools, backyards, gyms and gardens. In the western suburbs, a single mum is jailed inside a two-bedroom home, all while trying to keep her three kids occupied and losing her income and job. Today we learn at a press conference attended by about 10 not especially socially distanced journalists that police are monitoring online church services, presumably in case the Delta variant starts spreading on the interwebs. Yet tapings of the reality TV show The Voice have got the green light to go ahead. And according to the science, of course, the Delta variant cannot spread among politicians and the media. The state has, a no, has no role in a free society to monitor people's religious activities. Our military should be defending our external borders, not patrolling our internal state boundaries. Every Australian child, child has the right to go to school, and everyday Australians should not be treated like prisoners, prisoners and be given permission from their wardens to spend one, outside, one hour outside a day. There is a rebellion brewing within Australia 
We have not been a penal colony since 1869, and I know the free people of Australia have no, no desire to go back to one. Senator Wong remotely. Thank you, Mr President. Australians have made it clear they are angry about Mr Morrison's failures on vaccine and quarantine. And Mr Morrison knows his old pictures have fallen flat. So now he's promising to deliver on an Australia without restrictions. Never mind the failures to deliver on all his old promises. He's already promised previously a COVID normal Christmas last Christmas, and he failed to deliver on all his other promises that Australians would be at the front of the vaccine queue, that all aged care workers and residents and all Australians with disability and disability care workers would be vaccinated by Easter. Four million Australians would be vaccinated by the end of March, and everyone over 70 would be vaccinated by the start of winter, and of course that all Australians would be vaccinated by October. He's failed to deliver on all these old promises, so now he's just making new ones. And if people have the nerve to question how he's going to deliver his new promises, he just attacks them, tells them they're the problem. He mocks people for being in the cave without admitting he's the reason we're in it. He's more interested in political attacks than talking about how we get out of this safely. Contact tracing that can keep up vaccinating vulnerable communities, older Australians, those living with disability, First Nations Australians, and a plan to protect our children. He failed to do his job, and now Mr Morrison's lockdowns are bringing us all down. And even if we're not in lockdown, we can't see loved ones who are. The last thing we all need is more promises. Mr Morrison is the one who got Australia into this mess, and he's just not the one to get us out of it. Senator Davey. Thank you. Last year, I uh, told the Senate of the story of students who were being told that they must uh, traverse through two COVID hotspots to get from one COVID-free zone back to their homes in another COVID-free zone, all because of arbitrary uh, uh, rules that required these students to travel by the most bizarre route rather than the most direct route to get home. Same thing is happening again 18 months later. Uh, this year, students that are resident of New South Wales in Term 3 have actually given up trying to go back to school in Victoria because the last time they attempted to, to get home, many of them had to walk across bridges from Victoria to New South Wales because their parents were banned from collecting them from the school and it was the only way to get them home reasonably. And now we find the horrific situation of 10 students locked into New South Wales without being able to get home to their parents unless they go through two weeks of hotel quarantine in Melbourne. It's a disgrace. Order, Senator Davey. Senators, before we go to questions, yesterday I ruled on a point of order regarding the use of the term dishonestly in an answer to a question in this context that referred to another senator. I ruled that the term dishonest has not previously been considered unparliamentary, but that I would look into the matter and report back. First, the term dishonest is not unparliamentary and therefore may be used. However, the context of all language needs to be considered, particularly with respect to Standing Order 1933, which prohibits, amongst other things, imputations of improper motives and personal reflections upon other senators. The relevant precedent on this terminology is mixed and unclear. On occasions, senators have been asked to withdraw it, and on other occasions, they have not. So to provide guidance to the chamber, I will, provide the, I will apply the following principles consistent with the use of other contentious terms. If the word dishonest is used collectively, for example, about a political party, it will not generally be out of order. If it is used specifically with respect to a senator, imputing that the person is dishonest, it will be out of order. It may be used to observe behaviour, for example, it is dishonest to claim but it should not be attributed in a personal sense. For example, Senator XYZ is being dishonest. I accept this will lead to some grey areas, but in almost all circumstances, it can be used appropriately in an observational sense rather than a personal one. Given I have reviewed my ruling on this matter, I'm going to ask Senator Colbeck to withdraw the imputation yesterday. Thank you, Mr. President. I withdraw. I thank Senator Colbeck. Order, Senator Watt. Um, I thank Senator Colbeck and I thank the Senate. Senator O'Neill. Can I thank you for um, preserving my integrity and for the clarity of your ruling, President? Thank you. I remind senators that standing orders are the outer limit of what is in debate. They're not necessarily a guide to how far to push it. Um, and that applies to all of us. All of us, I should say, no one in particular. Uh, questions without notice, Senator Wong. 
remotely. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to Senator Birmingham, the minister representing the Prime Minister. Yesterday, we saw reports of hundreds of former Australian embassy guards and their families left standing in sewage for hours outside of Kabul airport. Glenn Kolomets, a former ADF officer, now lawyer, has said Afghans attempting to flee Kabul who have been issued Australian electronic visas are, and I quote, being turned away by ADF people because they don't have a hard copy visa in their passports. Are reports that Afghans with Australian visas are being turned away at the airport by Australian officials true? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr President. I thank Senator Wong for her question. Uh, while I can't speak to every incident that is happening uh, at Hamid Karzai International Airport in Kabul, uh, given the very challenging and difficult circumstances that many people uh, across many nations are operating under there, uh, I can assure uh, that in terms of people who make contact with Australian officials uh, and have proof of contact, uh, proof of uh, some engagement with Australia, that every effort is being made to not only process them in terms of boarding, to recognise visas that may have been issued, but also to ensure that those who may not have a valid visa are supported through the processes on the spot with emergency contacts being made to seek to provide them with such visas. And now, of course, the security situation around Ahmed Karzai International Airport in Kabul is an incredibly challenging one. There are multiple checkpoints uh, that are being enforced by the Taliban. Uh, there are then, of course, clearances to access the airport perimeter itself. Uh, and were there to be instances at any of those, they may not be ones that are entirely known to all of us. But I do ensure the Senate and all Australians and that Australian officials on the ground are turning around visa applications, uh, visa requests, or even just those without an application as quickly as they can to get them out of Kabul and to safety. And that indeed is what's got us into a situation now where we've seen Australia help to airlift more than 2,600 people on 22 flights out of Afghanistan. The vast majority of those uh, being uh, Afghan citizens who we're supporting with visa, but of course also importantly Australian citizens, Australian permanent residents uh, and the family members uh, of those uh, individuals. Uh, that's the work that our people on the ground are doing it. They're doing it uh, heroically, can I say, in the most trying of circumstances. Order. And we offer a huge Birmingham. debt of gratitude. Time for the answers expired. Senator Wong, a supplementary question. Thank you. When asked why the ADF were turning people away, Mr Kolomets replied, and I quote, these directions have come from DFAT. Who knows where in DFAT? There's a breakdown in communications here, not between ADF and DFAT, but between DFAT and DFAT, and that is going to cost lives. Have these directions come from DFAT? If yes, who issued the directive and why? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. Well, as I said in response to the primary question, uh, our officials on the ground, DFAT officials working alongside Home Affairs officials who issue and process uh, the visas uh, are not only doing their utmost to ensure that anybody who has any type of Australian visa is able to be able to board and depart Kabul, but they are also responding very clearly uh, to other individuals who have connections to Australia, reasons to want to seek claim and working as quickly as they can to find appropriate humanitarian visas that can be issued in emergency circumstances uh, to be able uh, to expedite those people's departure from Kabul. Uh, we've indeed seen 950 people uplifted order. overnight. Senator Keneally, on a point of order. Point of order, Mr President, direct relevance. It was a very specific question. Have the directions come from DFAT? And if so, who, if yes, who issued them and why? I'm listening carefully to the minister's answer. You've reminded him of it. Um, I'm, I reluctant to rule the material he's dealing with is not directly relevant, but I've let you remind him of it, and he has 15 seconds remaining to turn to that part of the question. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, sir. Thanks, Mr President. Uh, Mr President, I'm not, uh, not accepting the assertion that there are directions that are turning people away. In fact, 
I'm making very clear that every effort is being made to accommodate people in their unique circumstances and to try to help them from Kabul as Order. expeditiously Senator as possible. Senator Birmingham, Senator Wong, a final supplementary question. How many Australian citizens, residents and visa holders remain stranded in Afghanistan? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr President. Uh, well, we know that people continue indeed to uh, register. That may seem a surprising thing that individuals uh, would not have made it known their presence in Afghanistan long before uh, the last little while, but registration is something that we have seen continue during this evacuation process. Uh, what we are doing, uh, Mr President, is working to move through those we can help as quickly as possible. Uh, that means helping all of those that we can who can make it through to Hamid Karzai Airport, to working with the officials from the many nations, particularly the United States, who are helping with security operations, including targeted assistance outside the airport perimeter, making sure that as a nation uh, we are lending assistance to others as we hope for them to lend assistance to us. 2,650 people in 22 flights uh, stood up at such short notice is no mean feat, Mr President. We extend all our thanks and gratitude to the officials and the Order. personnel. Senator Birmingham. Senator Patterson. Thank you, Mr President. My question is for the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Can the Minister update the Senate on the progress of Australia's evacuation operation in Afghanistan? The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator Patterson uh, for the question. Mr President, the government's immediate focus is the evacuation of Australians and their families and Afghans with Australian visas uh, from Kabul. The scenes that we continue to see uh, in Afghanistan are dis uh, highly distressing, and our thoughts are with the Afghan people. Mr President, the National Security National Security Committee of Cabinet continues uh, to meet every day on this matter. Our officials are working tirelessly on the evacuation, as uh, the Leader of the Government in the Senate has uh, indicated, which is uh, moving hundreds of people from Afghanistan every day. I want to thank those senators and members and advocates who are doing the same thing to support so many people in Afghanistan. In recent days, uh, we have uh, been able to run about four flights per 24-hour period. Last night, five Australian ADF flights carried approximately 955 people, which brings uh, to approximately 2,650 the total number of people evacuated since the 18th of August, including Australian and New Zealand nationals, uh, visa holders and citizens of other nations with whom we are cooperating. The government reiterates our thanks to the officials involved, including from my Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, the Australian Defence Force, the Department of Home Affairs. Each person evacuated is a demonstration of their dedication. There are very difficult scenes outside Hamad Karzai International Airport. People, including women and children, are waiting for days amongst crowds numbering in the thousands. Our officials are using every means possible to assist Australian citizens and visa holders phoning and emailing directly, as well as providing regular updates on Smart Traveller. Australia continues to work with partners across all aspects of the operation, and we thank them for their cooperation. Senator Patterson, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister update the Senate on the role of the Al Minhad Air Base in this evacuation? Senator Payne. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Australia's long-standing presence at Al Minhad Air Base in the United Arab Emirates has served as a vital support for our military presence in Afghanistan, and it is now serving a vital role in evacuating Australians and Afghan visa holders. I want to acknowledge and thank the government of the United Arab Emirates for their support and cooperation of this uh, evacuation process. The ADF has, has deployed more than 250 personnel and five aircraft to Al Minhad to carry out the evacuation operation. We have put significant plans in place for the health and welfare of evacuees, including the deployment of an OSMAT team, which is due to arrive today. We are very conscious, Mr President, of the traumatic experience, the fear and desperation of many who are travelling to our facilities at Al Minhad. Senator Patterson, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister update the Senate on the progress of operations to return evacuees to Australia? Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much. And, uh, Mr President, I thank Senator Patterson again for this question. Uh, Al Minhad's capacity has been expanded to accommodate these evacuees ahead of their transfer to Australia. Once the evacuees have been settled 
uh, and processed for immigration uh, requirements and are ready to continue their travel. They are travelling on planes chartered by Defence to Australia. I do want to thank the states and territories that are contributing to Australia's response by receiving evacuees. Last night, 148 evacuees arrived on a charter flight to Perth and Adelaide, bringing the total number returned to Australia since the 18th of August to 419. Over the coming days, we will have regular flights into capitals around the country as these Australians and Afghans with Australian visas arrive. Our thoughts are with them as they deal with the trauma of these experiences, and we warmly welcome them to our nation. Senator Pratt. Mr President, my question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. WA Premier Mark McGowan, whose state has no local restrictions, criticised the Prime Minister for implying, and I quote, Western Australians were like cave people. Why did Mr Morrison liken Western Australians to cave people? Order. Order. On my order, I, before I call Senator Birmingham, I am going to insist on order during the question. I'm going to insist on silence during the question. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. Well, I completely reject Senator Pratt's order. assertion in there. Uh, it is completely false, uh, and indeed uh, the attempt to beat these statements up, statements that were in no way suggesting that any particular part of Australia uh, were, as Senator Pratt has suggested. You know, this was an analogy drawn about the very important pathway out of the challenging situation Australia and indeed the world faces. And our plan, our plan is one focused very much on driving vaccination across Australia to support Australians as we hit 70 per cent, 80 per cent targets informed by the experts at the Doherty Institute to be able to move beyond widespread statewide lockdowns and restrictions, to be able to move beyond the restrictions that prohibit individuals from being able to reunite with families, with loved ones or pursue business opportunities across state borders. We want to see success for Australia as we have succeeded compared to so many other nations in saving lives relative to so many others. We want to see success on the way out of this as well. And, and of course, what we have at the party is no plan. No plan, no pathway. Now, all we have are these sort of cheap political points that we're getting, whilst the rest of the country is getting on with striving Order. towards the plan. In stark Senator contrast Watt. to the Labor Party, Australians are turning out Order. in record numbers, day Order. in, day Order. out, getting vaccinated, driving us toward the targets that we need as a nation, that's what's going to get us Senator there, O'Sullivan, not the type of cheap Senator point Watt. scoring from Senator Pratt or whatever it is that Senator Watt, who I can't hear from here, is saying. Frankly, all of them, Mr President, or to think about the national interest. It's a blessing that I can't hear him. All might to think, all should think about no the problem, national Senator interest Watt. being served by driving the vaccine targets to a point where we can actually give Australians certainty and hope for the Order, future. Senator Berman. Can I ask senators again across the chamber to restrain themselves when people are answering questions, particularly remotely, because I was having trouble hearing Senator Birmingham. Senator Pratt, a supplementary question. The Morrison-Joyce government has spent more than $1 million of taxpayers' money in support of Clive Palmer's High Court challenge of WA's border restrictions. Order. Isn't Mr Order. Morrison— Order. Both sides of the chamber there. Senator. Pratt, continue, please. Isn't Mr Morrison's likening of Western Australians to cave people just the latest in a series of attempts to undermine Western Australia? Order. Order. Senator Birmingham. Mr President, no, it's not. But Senator Pratt's desire to create division across Australia is absolutely a way of trying to hurt the nation. It's a way Order. of trying to hurt and divide. It's a way that will not help Western Australia or any other part of Australia move Senator through the Watt. remaining changes of COVID-19 to a better place. Once we see those vaccination targets hit, 
which day by day we get closer to thanks to the record numbers of Australians being vaccinated. More than 307,000 people who turned out yesterday across the country to have another vaccination dose or to have their first dose. Climbing our numbers, as we've seen with our senior Australians, now more than 85% of whom over the age of 70 have had that first dose and so many of them having had the second. They're setting the example, a positive example, that we want West Australians, South Australians, Victorians, Queenslanders, Tasmanians, New South Welshmen, the Territorians, all to be able to have the opportunity to be able to reach those targets Order. and know Senator in doing Birmingham, so that time for the answer has Biden. expired. Senator Pratt, a final supplementary question. If Mr Morrison had acted like the vaccine rollout was a race, and secured enough supplies, isn't it true Western Australia wouldn't need to have such tough border restrictions? And why is Mr Morrison more interested in insulting Western Order. Australians than taking responsibility Order. for his failures in the vaccine rollout? Order. Again, on both sides of the chamber then, there were interjections during the question. Senator Birmingham. Well, Senator Pratt's showing absolutely no sense or logic of recognising what is happening right around the world at present. Now, Australia has been dealing for more than 18 months, as every other country has, with a global pandemic, a once-in-a-century pandemic. As a nation, we've saved lives far more effectively than most others. And I pay tribute and acknowledge the West Australian government, as indeed all of our state and territory counterparts, working with us in ways that have helped to save those lives. Order. But indeed, it's a challenge Senator writ large McAllister. globally. You need only look at countries like Japan, countries like South Korea, places like Taiwan, or indeed a nation not like New Zealand at present, to see these are difficult challenges with the Delta variant. And what each of us have in common is we've all managed to suppress, the, the, uh, suppress COVID-19 to a fair degree. We've all managed to suppress it in ways that have saved lives. But as a result, we didn't get the prioritisation that Europe or the US did in terms of some of the vaccines that were available. But we are all working hard Order, in terms of Senator Birmingham, I'm going to, to get out. Time has expired. I'm going to ask the indulgence of a senator. It was done in the House yesterday. The parliamentary photographer's here. If we all just want to let him take a shot of this somewhat unique parliamentary arrangement. This was done in the House yesterday, and I'll, I'll, I'll stop the clock on question time for that matter, Senator oppos of opposition senators. Sorry, I didn't. I thought he had the camera set up. My apologies. <laughs> Thank you. It's appropriate the Senate gets recorded as well, not just the House. Um, Senator Seward. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Today, the WA. Australian Medical Association President Mark Duncan Smith said going with 70, 80 per cent of only eligible adults is neglecting our children and bordering on child abuse. Through you, Mr President, Minister, do you agree that opening up restrictions when only 80 per cent of the adult population is vaccinated borders on child abuse? The Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Uh, Mr. President, uh, no, I don't, Mr. President, and I have to say it's really disappointing that uh, Senator Seward comes in here um, and uses parliamentary privilege in the sense to make those sorts of accus accusations. And quite frankly, it's outrageous, Mr. President, that a member of the health profession in Western Australia would actually express those sorts of views um, uh, himself. Uh, purely and simply, Mr. President a cheap opportunity Senator to score Pratt, some political Pratt. points. Mr President, the Doherty modelling, Mr. Mr. President, the Doherty modelling, as I said yesterday. Senator Pratt. Mr President, the Doherty modelling does contemplate the vaccination of children, albeit at a later date, Mr. President. Albeit at a later date, in accordance, Senator Keneally, with the health advice in accordance with the health advice. You, you, can, you can be as pious as you like about this, but we're operating in this country, Mr President, uh, under health advice. Our vaccination, program, our vaccination program in this country, Mr President, has been based on the advice and the approval, the full approval 
of vaccines through the TGA, where in the US they only this week had a full approval for their vaccinations, Mr. President. We made sure, Mr. President, we made sure in this country that there was confidence from the Australian community in the vaccination rollout and the vaccines that we were using by undertaking a full vaccination program the through the TGA and providing advice to the Australian community through ATAGI, Mr. President. So for the Greens to come in here with a quote from a GP or a specialist in in Western Australia, Mr. President, in an attempt to make cheap political points uh, to undermine the public confidence in the, pu the vaccination rollout, Mr. President, I think is an absolute disgrace. Senator Seward, a supplementary question. Yes, I certainly do. Do you admit that if we loosen restrictions when only effectively 56 per cent of our total population are vaccinated? There is going to be a death rate in our children that, in fact, no parent will accept. Senator Colbeck. Mr. President, again, the alarmist language of the Greens in respect of this is completely outrageous, Mr. President. Completely and utterly outrageous. Mr. President. Well, Mr. Order. President, I've got, I would, I've got, I've got, I've got Senator Hanson Young on a point of order. I've, I've got Senator Colbeck. I've got Senator Hanson Young on a point of order. Senator Hanson Young. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. My point of order is on mis uh, is on misleading the chamber. That's not a point of and order, no. Senator. No. So, Senator the, Hanson Young. This was a Senator comment Hanson made by Young, the President of the AM. Your seat. Please, please resume your seat, Senator Hanson Young. There's the opportunity to debate the answers after question time. That is not a point of order for the chair to rule upon. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. I would regard the comments of the president of the AMA to take the point of order in AMA, in Western Australia, as irresponsible and attempting to frighten parents with respect to the impacts of COVID-19 on children is, quite frankly, outrageous. Mr President, there's no question that there are risks to children from COVID-19, but let's look at the statistics. Oh, Let's look at the statistics, uh, and, and I have to say I think it's outrageous that they're trying to undermine the work of the Doherty Institute and all of the other institutions that have participated in this. But the, de but the ICU, the hospitalisation rate for children, Mr. President, is about two percent. For those over the age of Order. seventy, it's Senator forty Colbert, to seventy percent. There is a big difference. Has expired. In Senator Seward, a final supplementary question. I'll ask the same question that I asked yesterday. When will this government include children in the national vaccination targets and acknowledge that they have to be in there? Senator Colbeck. Mr President, the vaccination of children is clearly a part of the national vaccination program. We continue to operate the vaccination rollout based on the health advice. The ATAGI advice with respect to vaccination of children is expected to be available for National Cabinet this week, Mr President. This week. The Doherty Institute has said that the 70 and 80 per cent numbers don't change. With, 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 with respect to the vaccination of children and including of, including of, the ch of children in the targets, Mr President. The National Cabinet. National Cabinet, not the Liberal Party, not the Labor Party, not the Greens, has commissioned the Doherty Institute to do this work. Liberal governments, order. Labor Senator governments across Hansen the country. Senator Hanson-Young on a point of order. Senator Hanson-Young. Uh, on relevance, he still hasn't answered the question. It was about the targets, and we've only got five seconds Senator to go. Hansen -Young, Could he get I to the Senator point? Senator Hanson-Young, with respect, Sen Senator Colbeck, was directly addressing the question. I can't direct him how to answer a question, but he was talking about the matters raised in the question um, to my way of hearing in some detail. Senator Colbeck. Senator Colbeck, have you concluded your answer? Senator Colbeck, to Thank continue. you, Mr President. The, the government will continue to operate on the professional and health advice in supporting Australians Order, receiving Senator vaccinations. Senator Colbeck. Senator Scar. Mr President, my question is to the minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Can the minister update the Senate on how the Liberal and National Government is assisting those who care for our most vulnerable to be vaccinated as part of delivering the national plan agreed by National Cabinet? The minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. 
Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you to Senator Scar for his question. Mr. President, Australia's COVID-19 vaccination rollout continues to expand. To date, more than 17.7 million Australians uh, doses have been administered to Australians across the country. I'm pleased to report that first dose vaccinations for our residential care workforce, who are looking after our most vulnerable, uh, is at 76 per cent today. And I want to thank Mr. President, I want to thank all those carers, nurses, in fact, all those who work in aged care for turning out to get a vaccine. Uh, and I'd urge those that haven't had their vaccine yet to take up that opportunity by the 17th of September. The Department of Health Mr. President, has been working with each residential aged care facility to ensure plans are in place to provide support where needed to ensure every residential aged care worker has access to a vaccine prior to the 17th of September. National Cabinet Mr. President, agreed that the COVID-19 vaccination of residential aged care workers will become mandatory by this date. That is when residential aged care workers must have received at least one first dose of a COVID-19 vaccine. We encourage aged care providers to keep supporting their workforce. There are a number of channels open to support them to do that, including the government's inreach services, vaccinating their own staff and using Commonwealth and state vaccination clinics, also GPs and pharmacies. Mr. President, all states and territories have agreed to use their public health orders to enforce vaccination for workers. Queensland, South Australia, Western Australia, Tasmania, ACT and the Northern Territory have all implemented public health orders based on that advice. Senator Scar, a supplementary question. When can we expect to see children vaccinated in Australia as part of the vaccine rollout? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, thank you, Senator Scar. From August the 9th, around 220,000 children aged between 12 and 15 years old who are at higher risk of severe illness if they contract COVID-19 have been able to receive a Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine. This includes children with specified medical conditions, including severe asthma, diabetes, obesity, cardiac and circulatory congenital anomalies and other serious conditions. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children, children aged 12 to 15 years in remote communities as part of a broader community outreach vaccination program. And from the 25th of August, 40,000 NDIS participants aged between 12 and 15 years will all be eligible for vaccination. The Australian Technological Advisory Group on Immunisation will provide further advice on the use of Pfizer vaccine for the remainder of children aged 12 to 15 very soon. Senator Scar, a final supplementary question. Yes. Thank you, Mr. President. What are the targets in the national plan for returning to a more normal life without lockdowns? And why is it so important for all governments, all governments, to work together in delivering the national plan? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. As the Prime Minister has said, the national plan that we've developed and agreed is our pathway to living with this virus. That is our goal, to live with this virus, not to live in fear of it. When we reach vaccination levels of 70 and 80 per cent, we can look at easing restrictions, lockdowns and reopening borders, first state borders and, in time, international borders. Mr. President. The national plan is our deal with all Australians. The sacrifices they make now will get them to the next step, because if not at 70 per cent and 80 per cent, then when? When? We should not delay reopening. We should prepare for it and we should move forward together. There is a plan out and, Mr President, we are moving forward with that plan. Order. Senator McAllister. Thanks very much, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. Over three months ago, the USA had already administered around 600,000 COVID-19 vaccinations to children aged 12 to 15 and more than 4 million to those aged under 17. Why are children still not 
broadly eligible for vaccination against COVID-19 in Australia. The Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, as I've said a number of times in this chamber, the Australian government is conducting the vaccine rollout based on the health advice to us from the TGA, Order. from the TGA, Mr. President, Order. and ATAGI, Mr. President. It is worth noting. It is worth noting, Mr. President that the vaccines that we are using in this country have been the subject of full approval processes by the Therapeutic Goods Asso uh, Asso uh, Association, Mr President, by the TGA. The US only got a full approval of their Pfizer vaccine or the use of Pfizer vaccine this week in the US, Mr President. So they have been operating under an emergency approval process, Mr President. And Mr. President, and so we continue unapologetic, unapologetically, Mr. President, to work in conjunction with the health advice to make sure that we retain a high level of confidence in the vaccines that we're rolling out, and that we have the best available data to support the vaccination rollout that we're using across the country. We don't apologise for that, Mr. President. And as I've indicated to the chamber already, we've received and implemented advice for the vaccination of children with a certain number of health conditions. That process has commenced, Mr President, and we expect to receive very soon advice from ATAGI with respect of the vaccination of other children uh, in the 12 to 15 year old age group, Mr President. So we unapolog unapologetically continue to work in conjunction with the health advice from our health professionals and experts. The registration processes through the TGA uh, and the advice from ATAGI in support of our vaccination rollout. Senator McAllister, a supplementary question. Thank you. According to the UK Office for National Statistics, 34,000 children under the age of 17 are suffering with long COVID. What advice has the Morrison Joyce government received about the prevalence and impact of long COVID, including in relation to children and infants? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, the advice that I have with respect to the utilisation of uh, COVID-19 vaccines on children in the UK is that, that the advice that they are working on currently sits very closely to the advice that we're operating from on, in respect of uh, children with specific health uh, deficiencies. Mr. President, in respect of the specifics Order. Senator of oh. Senator's oh. question, I don't have any particular research with me in relation to long COVID. Uh, I'm very happy to see what advice I can uh, receive from uh, my, my health department because I know that our officials, that our officials, Mr. President, are in very regular contact with similar organisations around the world so that they can understand the implications a, of the, the virus on various cohorts within the population, but also what they're doing with respect to the vaccination rollout and how they're applying the vaccine to various parts of their community. So Order. we can better Senator operate Colbeck, our I've, systems. I've, we had four seconds left, so I'll allow Senator McAllister to raise a point of order. Thanks, Mr President. It is relevant. I asked specifically around long COVID. I understand from the minister's, if I may, I understand from the minister's response that he is seeking to take is, it on notice. Well, May no, again, I have him confirm Senator, that? No, Senator McAllister, I can't ask a minister whether I'll do that. I can only rule on whether the minister was being directly relevant. And he did cover that as well as other matters, so he was being directly relevant. I'm assuming he's concluded his answer, so I'll call you to ask a final supplementary question. How many children will remain unvaccinated, unprotected and at risk when Australia reaches the 70 and 80 per cent targets for Australians aged over 16 years. Senator Colbeck. Uh, Mr President, I don't accept the premise of the question because I don't accept that children will remain unprotected. Pro vaccinating, vaccinating the rest of the population does in itself provide a level of protection to 
the rest of the order, population that hasn't order. been vaccinated because it actually limits the transmission of the disease. That's the point of having the targets, Mr. Order. President. That's the point of having the targets. So, Mr. President, we will continue to follow the health advice with respect to the application of vaccines to the Australian community. And as I've said on a number of occasions today, the, the advice from ATAGI with respect to the availability of COVID-19 vaccinations to children uh, between 12 and the ages of 12 and 15 will be available to the government and to the Australian community very soon. Senator Davey. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the minister representing the Deputy Prime Minister, Senator McKenzie. Can the minister please outline how our government is supporting regional Australians through the COVID-19 pandemic, including as part of the national plan agreed to by National Cabinet? Minister representing the Deputy Prime Minister, Senator McKenzie. Thank you, Mr President. Thank you, Senator Davey, for your question. Our government understands regional Australians facing lockdowns are asking immediate questions about their incomes, about the weeks ahead and about the pathway back to a normal life where we learn to live with this virus. Rural and regional Australians are feeling the ongoing impact of the pandemic, particularly the Delta variant, which has forced two entire states into lockdown and seen localised lockdowns within states and border communities particularly are feeling uh, the, the effects. However, until we reach the recommended vaccination targets, lockdowns are the most effective way to stop the spread, and they will still be necessary. We're ensuring the financial security of those who live or work in a Commonwealth hotspot through the COVID disaster payment, and we've already delivered $4 billion in support to over 1.6 million Australians. Regional Australians, like others, are doing the right thing. They're pulling up their sleeves and they're getting vaccinated in record numbers. We've already seen 17 million doses delivered so far, 4.6 million of those uh, in regional Australia. We must back the science and the evidence that informs our national plan. Once we achieve our target of 70 to 80 per cent vaccinations, Australians will be able to get back to a sense of normality. Restrictions will safely be able to ease and lockdowns will become a thing of the past. But our government is particularly uh, committed to making that happen and providing Australians with the necessary support that we can learn to live with the virus, not fear it. We're assisting regional families with childcare, providing gap-free waivers to relieve the burden of out-of-pocket costs when their children cannot attend care. We're also extended telehealth and MBS items. Telehealth can't replace face-to-face uh, health services, but it is critical, particularly with the mental health impacts of lockdowns that we see now. Senator Davey, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Minister. Um, we know regional businesses are suffering through the lockdowns as much as their urban counterparts, even where there has been no COVID. What is our government doing to help manage them through the impacts of the lockdowns and the border restrictions that are currently in place. Senator McKenzie. Our government has partnered with each of the state and territory governments to roll out business support packages tailored to their specific needs. In my home state of Victoria, we've combined with the Andrews government to deliver $1.46 million to around 18,000 regional businesses doing it tough during lockdown to help them with those ongoing uh, operational costs so that when lockdowns lift, uh, they can get back to business and employing people as quickly as possible. We're assisting local businesses such as childcare providers uh, with further support for the sector which will benefit over 2,000 providers in regional Victoria and New South Wales. We've committed more than $4.9 billion to the aviation sector. Our primary producers are also supported, and we're addressing air freight shortages and disrupted supply chain for exports through, through the international freight assistance mechanisms. We've got the Ag Workforce Code. These measures are all vital to keep our primary industry sector growing, harvesting and feeding not only our nation but the Order, world. Senator McKenzie. Senator Davey, a final supplementary question. Yeah, finally, Minister, what other supports are available for regional Australians and the communities they live in, and why is this so important to our national plan? Senator McKenzie. 
Well, Mr. President, the Liberal and Nationals government have stood ready to assist states and territories with additional support uh, through this pandemic. Most recently, we deployed support to regional New South Wales, where we have seen increasing case numbers. Around 50 ADF personnel are currently supporting New South Wales police in Dubbo, Burke and Wilcannia. An additional 70 ADF personnel are supporting Western New South Wales Health District to provide pop-up vaccination clinics in remote and regional communities such as Walgett, Canamble and Gilgandra. While this support is absolutely critical right now, it won't be required when we reach our vaccination targets outlined in the national plan. Our plan is based on the best available data and science and is agreed to by all state and territory governments as part of National Cabinet. I am particularly buoyed by the support of the Labor Party uh, and Mr Albanese finally backing Bill and Joel in getting behind the national plan as the only way to end lockdowns and get back to normal. Order. Senator Waters remotely. Thanks, President. Uh, my Order. question. Oh, sorry, question. Senator Waters. I'm going to ask you to start again because there's too many interjections in the chamber and I can't hear you. Senator Waters. Thanks, President. My question is to the Foreign Minister, Senator Payne. The US Ambassador to Australia said on global climate change negotiations last week, and I quote, it would be really helpful to see Australia move forward with a more ambitious effort. What the science is telling us is their pathway needs to be more aggressive, end quote. The US, the UK, the EU, Japan and South Korea have all lifted their 2030 pledges. Why is Australia turning its back on our allies and trading partners in these climate negotiations and instead siding with the petro-states of Russia and Saudi Arabia? The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr President, and uh, absolutely reject the premise and the f facile assertion at the end of uh, Senator Waters' question, quite frankly. In fact, Australia is working very hard to deliver our long-term emissions reduction strategy. We will release that ahead of COP26, as we have made very clear. We'll release our updated forecasts ahead of COP26, which are expected to show a further improvement on Australia's 2030 position. We have a strong record of meeting and exceeding our international emissions reduction targets, including overachieving on both our first Kyoto emissions target and our 2020 target. Our latest data um, emissions are shown at 20 per cent below 2005 levels. Mr. President. We believe in achieving, not just talking about it, but achieving. And those achievements are records to which we can point as a nation. Our emissions are lower than in any year under the previous government and at the lowest levels since 1990. We are strongly committed to playing our part in, glo in the global effort to combat climate change through the Paris uh, Agreement, as set out in all of the Pacific Island Forum's declarations, Mr. President, the Boy Declaration, the Kanaki Two Declarations, and we have been clear, as the Prime Minister has indicated, that we intend to reach net zero as soon as possible and preferably by 2050. Senator Waters, a supplementary question. Yes, thanks, President. It's easy to make crap targets. Is the government's sorry, intention? Sorry, Senator Waters. I, I, sent, I, I couldn't hear it, but I, 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 I couldn't, I couldn't hear what you said, Senator Waters. Can I, can I ask you to start again? Yes, thank you, President. I was pointing out it's easy to meet crap targets. Oh, Senator Waters, that, Senator Waters, that's not helpful in question time. Please, the clock's running. Continue your question. Is it the government's intention to go into climate negotiations in Glasgow at the end of the year? with Russia and Saudi Arabia as our only diplomatic allies? Or is your department working on strategies to satisfy the United States and the rest of the developing world and the developed world by lifting our 2030 target? Senator Payne. Well said. Senator Hume. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. And I think I outlined our next steps in terms of working to deliver on our long-term emissions reduction strategy, our intentions to release that ahead of COP26, our intentions to release our updated forecasts ahead of COP26, which are, as I said, expected to show a further improvement on Australia's 2030 position. Our budget included over $630 million worth of additional investment to support low emissions technologies and partnerships, partnerships that we are 
are securing, Mr. President, with a range of international partners. Germany, with Singapore, the United Kingdom and with Japan. We share with the United States a resolute commitment to ambitious action on climate change. We want to be a partner of choice for the United States on climate and align our climate with broader objectives to strengthen economic integration and advance our shared interests in the Indo-Pacific. We are advancing practical, targeted collaboration with the United States across the broad climate agenda, including low emissions technologies and supply chains. I've discussed this, my, this myself with Secretary Kerry, Order. how Senator Australia Payne, and the US can create practical momentum. Has expired. Senator Waters, a final supplementary question. Thanks, President. The British Foreign Secretary asked Australia in March to stretch our climate ambitions and to match what the science requires which is a doubling of our targets to keep within two degrees or a tripling of them to keep within one and a half degrees. Will you listen to our global allies or will you listen to the coal, oil and gas companies that are slowly turning Australia into an international pariah? Senator Payne. Well, Mr. President, once again, I absolutely reject the premise of Senator Waters' question, uh, which is not founded in reality by any stretch of the imagination. What we are focused on, Mr. President, is not just talking about targets, but actual achievements. And that would be the difference. That would be the record on which we are prepared to stand, Mr. President. We are resolutely committed to Paris. We know that we are on the front. Uh, line of climate change impact. We've indicated, and I've said it again in here this afternoon, that we'll reach net zero as soon as possible and preferably by 10 2050. But that takes real investments in technology, Mr. President. Technology that reduces emissions and stimulates economic growth. I know economic growth is a comp complete pariah for the Greens, but it's not for us, it's not for our country, and it's not for the world. Yeah. Yeah. Senator Keneally. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. The ACT Chief Minister and Chief Health Officer argued that people aged 12 years and above should be factored into the vaccination rate required for reopening. Given that 38 per cent of cases in the ACT are children under 17 and around 30 per cent of COVID-19 cases in New South Wales are people under 20, Will the Morrison-Joyce government consider this? The Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Well, if the ACT Ch Chief Minister actually believed that, why did he agree to the Doherty modelling at National Cabinet, which was agreed by all of the Premiers, which includes vaccination and consideration of vaccination rates for proportions of the policy, uh, population, Mr. President. Of course, vaccination for children is important, Mr. President. It is more important, Mr. President. But the, the ACT Chief Minister sat in National Cabinet, agreed to the targets in the Doherty modelling, and if he wanted to change it, Order. why didn't he do it then instead of in a press conference, Mr. President? He could do it again on Friday when National Cabinet meets again, Mr. President. There will be further information on the Doherty modelling presented to National Cabinet on Friday. That's public information, Mr. President. So, if the if the national if the if the, if the, the chief minister of the ACT wanted to change the parameters of the modelling with respect to the vaccination rollout, why didn't he do it in National Cabinet? Why does he do it publicly in a press conference or get Senator Keneally to ask a question in question time? He's sitting in one of the chairs that gets to make the decisions, Mr President. Why doesn't he ask the questions there? Why doesn't he propose the modification of the parameters at that point in time, Mr President? Why doesn't he do that? He is one of the few people that gets to sit in National Cabinet. He is one of the few people that gets to be a participant in those decisions. So why doesn't he use the forum that he has available to him to actually put those inputs into that process? Senator Keneally, a supplementary question. The New South Wales Chief Health Officer, Kerry Chant, has said in relation to vaccines, and I quote, I believe in, tar I believe in targeting school-aged children in particular high school children, very quickly, because we know that they contribute to transmission. The Pfizer vaccine has been approved for children as young as 12. If the Morrison government had ordered more Pfizer last year, would Australians aged 12 to 19 now be vaccinated? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. And Senator Keneally is right. The New South Wales show does actually believe in vaccination of children. And I have to say I congratulate 
uh, New South Wales and the work that they have done, particularly, Mr. President, particularly with respect to vaccination of uh, senior high school Order. students, so that they, it frees them up to sit there. Very important examinations towards the end of the year, Mr. President. So I, I congratulate the New South Wales government and the CHO on actually taking action to put in Order. place the convictions that they clearly have, Mr. President. Congratulations to them on doing that, Mr. President. What, what this government has done, and we will continue to do, Mr. President, is to work collaboratively with the states. Work collaboratively with the states to deliver the national plan for the rollout Order. of the vaccine, Mr. President. To, to deliver the, the rollout of the vaccine uh, in accordance with the health advice, uh, and of course in accordance with the national plan for opening Order, up the Senator Australian Colbeck. economy. Senator Keneally, a final supplementary question. Is the reason children aged 12 and above are not included in the targets because Mr Morrison did not order enough Pfizer last year to vaccinate 12 to 15-year-olds? Senator Colbeck. Mr President, the reason uh, that they're not in the targets is we actually don't have an approved vaccine or a target advice to support that. To we, we, don't have, we don't have a target Order. advice yet to support that in the rollout of vaccine, Mr. President. So, Mr. President, the, the Labor Party come in here continuously putting false premises to the, to the parliament, but also trying to undermine public confidence in the vaccination rollout program. We continue, Mr. President, as we've done all the way through, to act on the health advice. We don't yet have a target advice with respect to the vaccination of children between the ages of 12 and 15. We are expecting it very Senator, soon, Mr Senator, President. We Senator are expecting Watt. it very soon. In fact, we're expecting it to be able to go to National Cabinet this week, Mr President. Mr President, so, Senator Mr. President uh, we will continue to follow the advice of the health professional, professionals who have very Order, well Senator guided Colbeck. us throughout Senator the rollout. O'Sullivan. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Employment, Workforce, Skills, Small and Family Businesses, Senator Cash. Can the Minister please advise the Senate how the national plan agreed by National Cabinet in bringing confidence to small and family businesses across Australia, and how the Liberal and National Government is supporting these businesses to get through and recover from the COVID-19 pandemic? The Minister representing the Minister for Employment, Workforce, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr President, and I thank Senator O'Sullivan for the question. And Mr President, the Morrison government will and truly believes and acknowledges that small and family business, they are the backbone of the Australian economy. And since the outset of the COVID-19 pandemic, we have provided to them and other businesses around Australia unprecedented economic and health support. And what we're now seeing is Australians will and truly step up and back small and family businesses around the country by backing and supporting our national framework for reopening. Australians themselves, and you can see this every single day, as Senator Colbeck tells us, they are putting their arms out and they are getting vaccinated. And we see that reflected in the vaccination rates every day. Because Australians understand that vaccination is the key to reopening and it is the key, as set out by National Cabinet, to ending the lockdowns and ensuring that our businesses across Australia, but in particular our small and family businesses, they again have the confidence that they need. And Mr President, the Morrison government, we continue to put in place those policies which will help our small and family businesses. And you will have seen today that we have announced that we are now providing additional support to small and medium businesses around Australia who continue to deal with the economic fallout and the economic impacts of COVID-19. And what we are doing is expanding eligibility for the Small and Medium Enterprise Recovery Loan Scheme. What we are doing now is we are removing the requirements for SMEs to who have received JobKeeper during the March quarter in 2021 or to have been flood affected, um, a flood-affected business in order to be eligible for this scheme. This is a good thing for those businesses, and what it shows is that we are continuing to put in place those policies that will back our businesses around Australia every step of the way. Senator O'Sullivan, a supplementary question. 
Thank you, Mr. President. How will the new eligibility for the SME recovery loan scheme assist businesses that have been impacted by the lockdowns and restrictions that are currently in place? Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, SMEs who are dealing with the economic impacts of the coronavirus with a turnover of less than $250 million will now be able to access loans of up to $5 million over a term of up to 10 years. Other key features of the SME recovery loan scheme include the government will guarantee 80 per cent of the loan amount. Lenders are allowed to offer borrowers a repayment holiday of up to 24 months. Loans can be used for a broad range of business purposes, including to support investment. If you can invest in yourself, we want to back you. Loans may be used to refinance any pre-existing debt of an eligible borrower, including those from the SME Guarantee Scheme. Loans can also be unsecured or secured. What again we're doing is the expanding scheme will enable lenders to continue supporting Australian businesses when we know they need it the most. Senator O'Sullivan, a final supplementary question. How can each and every Australian, Australian business and employee, help ensure that the delivery of the national plan so Australia can chart its way out of this pandemic? Senator Cash. Mr President, that's exactly what we know Australians want to do. Chart our way out of this pandemic, and in particular, when it comes to those mum and dad small businesses around Australia, we all know that the best thing that we can do to support them at this time is to get vaccinated. Vaccinations, not lockdowns, are the answer to getting us out of the COVID-19 pandemic. And we all know that by hitting the vaccination target, we'll be able to reopen and we all will be able to see that light at the end of the tunnel. Mr President, small businesses, if we don't hit the vaccination targets, they will close. Jobs will be lost. What we owe to every small business around Australia is to get behind the plan that has been agreed by National Cabinet. That is the plan to give them the confidence that they need, that they know that we're backing them every step of the way and that the country is backing them every step of the way. Senator O'Neill. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Government Services and the NDIS, Senator Reynolds. How many children with a disability in Australia have had their first dose of the COVID-19 vaccine? The Minister for the NDIS and Government Services, Senator Reynolds. Hmm. Uh, thank you very much. Oh, start again. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President, and I thank the Senator for her question. Uh, this is. So, can I just clarify? You're talking 12 to 15s. So sorry, can you, sorry, sorry, I'll just I missed um, some of the questions. Not really iterative, but I'll, I'll, I'll allow Senator, Senator O'Neill to clarify the question. Yes. Okay. It's children Senator. with disability. So, Senator. Including Senator Reynolds. those 12 to 15. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I've Order. Thank you. Uh, in relation, first of all, to the uh, under 12s, children with, uh, with disability, uh, as the senator would know, that no country in the world yet has vaccinations for under 12s. Order. In relation to 12 or, 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 to 15, are you raising a point of order, Senator O'Neill? Po point of order, just because there was a little lack of clarity. I'll ask the question again. Was no, no, Senator O'Neill. No, no, I'm sorry. I can't. I, 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 the minister asked you to clarify. The question was, look, Senator O'Neill. The question was, how many children with disability have had a first dose of a vaccine? The minister is being directly relevant by answering the question in the form she is. Um, I can't instruct the how-to. We're not long to the debate of answers after question time. Senator Reynolds. Uh, well, thank you very much, Mr. President, and that's why I sought the clarification because obviously there are different cohorts of children's ages. However, if the senator is referring to 12 to 15, I can confirm that this week I confirmed uh, publicly that all participants 12 to 15, of which there are 48,308. Uh, we're now eligible for the Pfizer vaccination uh, nationwide. And since uh, that announcement that it opened yesterday, we have had over 1,056 participants in this cohort who have already received a vaccination. Senator O'Neill, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. Uh, Sydney mother, Heike Farbig, 
whose son Bodhi lives with multiple disabilities, including neuropathy, has said, and I quote, it took me eight attempts and eight dead ends before, by pure sheer coincidence, I found somewhere that would vaccinate my child. Why has the Morrison-Joyce government left it up to sheer luck for children with disabilities to be vaccinated? Senator Reynolds. Uh, Mr. President, and can I just say that is one of the most ridiculously uh, dangerous questions to ask in this place, a bit reminiscent of the Greens' question today. We have over 8,000 8, locations people can book, including several thousand in uh, New South Wales. So, to give you an idea, we have been since I become minister, we have provided new Order. ways of getting people vaccinated. Um, as I've said yesterday, we announced that Pfizer vaccinations, and there are over 8,000 locations, including 2,500 in New South Wales, Order, Senator Watt. providing a safe access to vaccinations, not just for people with disability, but also their families and carers, Order. is a priority. So, at the moment, we're vaccinating 1.8 million people each week, and we are also providing new ways. So, since we started the new approach. 90,000 NDIS participants have been uh, vaccinated, and that rate is increasing exponentially uh, over the Reynolds, last few weeks. Time's the answer has expired. Senator O'Neill, a final supplementary question. I'm sure the mothers are listening very carefully. Sydney mother Yolanda Cayley, whose 14-year-old daughter Zoe has Down syndrome, was forced in desperation to turn to Twitter to find a vaccine appointment. The risk of dying of COVID-19 for people with Down syndrome is 36 times higher than the general population. How many children with disabilities will remain unvaccinated, unprotected and at risk when Australia reaches the 70 and 80 per cent targets for Australians aged over 16? Senator Reynolds. Uh, well, thank you very much, Mr President. And again, uh, I can confirm that there are thousands of ways and locations for people to get vaccinated. I understand, I understand in New South Wales at the moment, given the number of cases and the number of vaccinations that are occurring, but there are two ways uh, she can also try, is through her local pharmacist and her local GP, who I know many of them are giving priorities Order. to parents and children and workers in the disability sector. Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President, and I ask that further questions be placed on notice. So we now move to the attendance by a minister regarding the order for production of documents pursuant to the order of the 12th of August. Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. And uh, Mr. President, the government does not make public interest immunity claims lightly. We never have, and we never will. And we certainly don't do it without the careful consideration of the particular harm to public order. interest. I have carefully Order. reviewed the claim. I have personally, again, carefully reviewed the claim of public interest immunity, and recognise that it would not be in the public interest to disclose the information over which the claim is being reiterated in relation to legal advice and also to the deliberations of cabinet. Now, our deputy president, the government has engaged in good faith with the Senate and its committees at all times. We have provided updates and additional explanations as litigation in relation to the income compliance program has progressed. Uh, in addition, government agencies and witnesses have responded to many hundreds of questions at hearings and on notice in relation to the design and implementation of the income compliance program. So, Firstly, the claim of uh, disclosure of information relating to legal advice. It doesn't automatically follow from the federal court's approval of the class action settlement that there is no longer a proper basis for the government to maintain public interest immunity over the legal advice it received in connection with the income compliance program. The claim for information relating to legal advice has been made on two grounds. Firstly, the very, very long-held practice of claiming privilege over legal advice and associated documents obtained in the course of normal decision-making processes of government. The second ground is in, in relation to the possible prejudice to the Commonwealth in relation to the conduct of litigation relating to the income compliance program. The claim is grounded in the importance of government being able to obtain legal advice in relation to the normal decision-making functions without the risk of the advice or the information relating to that advice being disclosed. 
If such a risk existed, it could prevent governments from appropriately seeking and obtaining such legal advice. The availability of frank legal advice to decision makers within government should be and must be protected as a fundamental principle of good government. Although the class action settlement has been approved, as recognised by the Federal Court on the 11th of June 2021, not all potential claims arising from the Income Compliance Program will be resolved through the class action. Disclosing the content or dates of any legal advice would obviously have the very real potential of prejudicing the Commonwealth's ability to defend the claims. To this point, I note that the Federal Court has previously found that advices are the subject of this public interest immunity claim to be privileged legal advice. In fact, His Honour Justice Lee upheld the Commonwealth's claim of legal professional privilege in connection with every one of those documents, subject of the challenge from Gordon Legal. Deputy President, allow me to remind the Senate that former Labor, that former Labor Minister Joe Ludwig told Senate estimates that he would refuse to provide the Labor government's legal advice for the very same reason. And he said this, it has been long-standing practice of both this government and successive governments not to disclose the content of advice. Similarly, this practice has also been previously outlined by former Hawke Keating uh, government attorney general, the Honourable Gareth Evans QC, who said this in this very chamber in 1995. Nor is it the practice or has it been the practice over the years for any government to make available legal advice from its legal advisers made in the course of the normal decision-making process of government for good practical reasons associated with good government and also a matter of fundamental principle. Now, secondly, Deputy President, the, minister, the minute disclosed of deliberate deliberations of Cabinet. So I will now turn to the uh, public interest immunity claims relation to cabinet deliberations. Providing a copy of or information about the minute requested by the Senate Community Affairs References Committee would or could reasonably be expected to disclose the deliberations of cabinet. It is in the public interest for the deliberations of the cabinet not to be made public. By making a public interest claim in respect of the minute, the government is doing no more than standing by a well-established right to protect the disclosure of cabinet deliberations in the same way that has been done by past successive governments. In interlocutory hearings in the class action, the federal court upheld claims of public interest immunity in relation to cabinet materials, including this minute. Further, as recently as 4 August 2021, the Freedom of Information Division of the AAT found that this document was properly the subject of Cabinet exemption under the Freedom of Information Act. So, In closing, the letter from me setting out a detailed explanation about the basis of public interest immunity claim has been provided to the Chair of the Community Affairs References Committee. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Um, Senator Seward. I rise to take note of the minister's uh, response to the resolution of this place and her, the comments that she has just uh, made in the chamber. Um, I reject the claim made by the government and the continued claim and the, the basis on which the government. Sorry, I will take this off. I apologise. The basis on which the government is claiming uh, public interest immunity. I put it that this is they're actually claiming government interest immunity, because this is about protecting the government and making sure that, or trying to make sure that the community does not get access to the information that the Community Affairs Committee has, I will note, repeatedly asked for. And I will remind uh, this place, as I did yesterday and as in fact Senator um, Pratt was just commenting, the Senate has never it has never been accepted by the Senate, nor in any other comparable representative assembly, that legal professional privilege provides grounds for a refusal of information in a parliamentary forum. What we have here is a system that took illegally or made people who would received income support illegally those debts were claimed and it made people pay $1.7 billion to the government. 
So on top of refunding the $1.7 billion to all those hundreds of thousands of people that were affected deeply by this scheme, they also, of course, had to pay 100 and I think it's $112 million to cover interests. That's not compensation. That's just pure up covering, uh, recovering, uh, paying back the debts. That, but nobody could ever, I would argue, fully repay and compensate the people that were affected by this scheme fully because it caused untold damage. So what this government is saying is that other people who weren't covered by the class action may in the future, may in the future want to bring action against the government. And the government wants to protect itself against Australians who consider that their debt was also raised illegally. That's what the government's saying here. And the sorts of things that we were asking for, I don't think is unreasonable. Legal advice. Did they get it? If they did, when did they get it? Who provided it? Did they seek? In fact, it, as I said, I don't think that these requests are unreasonable. Now, as we know, we have uh, this Senate inquiry is ongoing, and we had a hearing on the 19th of August, and we had Mr. Gretsch from Gordon Legal, as again we mentioned yesterday, uh, present evidence to us, and he made a number of observations when I asked about uh, the case, the ongoing case, and the issues around claims of uh, public interest immunity. Uh, Mr. Gretsch went through a number of issues. But he also, uh, on specifically around these issues and the claim that uh, the court found that upheld the government's claims of public interest immunity. It's funny, it's not how I understand the evidence that Mr Gregg gave us yesterday, who said that some documents the judge agreed uh, were covered by public interest immunity, but others not. He, he said, in answers to questions um, from myself at this stage, Having said that, I must say that one of the concerns we had throughout the conduct of the proceeding was what we considered to be the Commonwealth making quite spurious claims of legal professional privilege and parliamentary privilege in respect of documents. The record will show that there are very extensive court processes involved in persuading and at times it required judges to make orders to co coerce I can never say that word. Um, the Commonwealth to abandon some of the claims it made. I think it is quite concerning. It is a quite concerning feature, increasingly, of the way the Commonwealth litigates disputes, that it tends to claim both legal professional privilege and parliamentary privilege over a very, very wide array of documents. Um, he then goes on to say, amongst other things, that there is a deep concern that we have, and I know it has been expressed in academic circles as well, of how those privileges are being abused. He goes on. When he went on, when, the gov when governments abuse these privileges, it brings the whole system into disrepute and creates an enormous undermining of public confidence in the way our governments operate in, and in particular, in relationship between our public servants and the government. I argue very strongly that, and support, in fact, what Mr. Uh, Gretsch said during this inquiry. We expect the government to be model litigants. And Mr Gretsch elsewhere talked about the fact that that's what the uh, government should in fact be. Mm -hmm. And yet they are claiming, in this case, parliamentary privilege over a very, very wide array of documents. And he talked, or reiterate, it creates an enormous undermining of public confidence. Well, the government has already undermined confidence in it and the way it operates our social security system by the very fact that robo debt happened in the first place. <coughs> it caused such distress, and they further undermine confidence in governments by the fact that they now seek to hide it, because that is what they are doing. 
Let's make no bones about it. They are seeking repeatedly to hide in very, very important details about this whole sorry saga. And unless we actually identify what went wrong, the Australian community has no guarantee that this sort of thing will not happen again. Sort of saying you're sorry, which is in fact sort of what happened with robo-debt, there was a sort of sorry, actually means and should mean that you mean it and that it won't happen again. And as I just said, we have no guarantee that this won't happen again if the government doesn't come clean. And you, by seeking to perpetually claim public interest immunity, what you do is build further the case for a Royal Commission on this issue. Because I can tell you all the people that I get contacted by about robo-debt express complete lack of confidence in the government and the way they handled robo-debt and how upset they continue to feel that they were hounded, hounded with debt collectors at the door in some instances, not all instances, but in some instances debt collectors at the door, on the phone, feeling intimidated, feeling scared, feeling like they'd done something wrong. I had pensioners crying in the hearing, literally tears streaming down their throat, their face. They're, they're unable to speak because they were so choked up because, because they thought that the government and the community thought they had stolen money, thought they had cheated the Commonwealth and they had done no such thing. Now that causes deep psychological distress. We don't want to see that happen again in this country. But we are at risk of seeing that happen again if this government continues to hide behind the fact, uh, hide behind public interest immunity. And I am hoping that this place will continue to try and hold this government to account to get access to this, this information, information that the Australians affected by this deserve to know. I urge the government to reconsider and not just with all due respect, cut and paste yet again their excuses for not presenting the information that the committee is after. We are after whether legal advice was sought, whether the advice was provided internally or externally, the dates when the legal advice was sought and provided. The minister has not articulated how the release of this information could possibly prejudice ongoing court proceedings. You just, just exactly, Senator O'Neill. You just claim it. You don't explain it. It's not good enough for our community. We expect better, particularly in the face of how outrageous this robo debt scheme was. Thank you, uh, Senator Seaver. I'm going to go to Senator Patrick on the screen. Thanks. Senator Patrick. Thank you, Deputy, uh, Madam Deputy President. Um, I uh, wish to just follow up on some of the things that Senator Seward said and uh, firstly make it very clear that if the government were to table legal advice in this chamber, then that advice is protected by parliamentary privilege and cannot be used in a court, just in the same way that uh, legal advice is otherwise protected through the normal doctrine of legal professional privilege. <clears throat> now, I'm very glad that the attorney is sitting there because she will be aware of the case of Egan and Chadwick in the New South Wales Court of Appeal, where uh, three justices made a unanimous ruling that legal professional privilege does not, uh, is not an exemption uh, that can apply in relation to uh, a request by a House of Parliament. The court ruled that it is quite within the rights of a House of Parliament to gain access to the advice upon which governments made their decision. That's part of the oversight process. It's uh, disingenuous for the minister to walk in to the, into the uh, chamber and suggest that it's okay to do so because the court upheld legal professional privilege. 
The whole point of legal professional privilege is not to keep things uh, secret. It's to make sure that uh, discussions between lawyers and their clients cannot be used in a court. Cannot be used in a court. That's the only place that the protection applies. And so it's quite incorrect to uh, try and roll out that a justice may have upheld that claim uh, and use that as some reason for not uh, tabling something in this chamber. Uh, again, the relevant case is Egan, Egan and Chadwick, and I'm sick of ministers standing up and saying that. Uh, repeatedly, attorney generals have said uh, something in this uh, uh, in this chamber that suggests legal professional privilege uh, documents shouldn't be tabled because it is wrong. It is wrong in law, and it's wrong for attorneys to make that sort of assertion. Now, I acknowledge that this assertion was made by Minister Reynolds and not the attorney, but the attorney must always uh, uh, seek to uphold the law. Uh, outside of the, the, this building, but also uh, inside, and recognise uh, the uh, the ju jurisdiction of uh, you know, of the of the courts. Then, in relation to claims that uh, somehow a uh, document shouldn't be tabled here because uh, it's legally uh, it's legally privileged, and the AAT upheld it again. The AAT is a an environment. Uh, in which the same rules don't apply in terms of uh, ability to uh, to look at uh, uh, legal do legal privilege legally privileged documents. Then I'll now move to cabinet uh, claims, and I've got a bit of background on cabinet, uh, having won a few uh, of these matters in the in the uh, uh, information commissioner and indeed in the AAT. Again, the Senate has never accepted. Uh, that just because something is a cabinet document, uh, that it can't be ordered for uh, production. Uh, that is not true of deliberations of cabinet, but there has been a ruling uh, in our courts that the deliberations of cabinet are the actual discussions that take place between cabinet ministers as recorded in the notebooks. Now, the notebooks uh, that, that are associated with cabinet are very special in that they uh, even under the National Archives Act, have an additional 10 years over cabinet documents. Cabinet documents re are released after 20 years. Cabinet notebooks still are only released after 30 years, recognising that is the place in which deliberations are recorded. Uh, in the minutes of, uh, of cabinet, uh, only a record of the decisions are made, at which recommendations are accepted uh, uh, and what actions might need to be taken are, uh, are actually recorded. And it's long been accepted that in exceptional circumstances, and I will, uh, to, to make sure I'm not misleading the chamber, state that it has to be exceptional, uh, that either the courts or the Senate uh, cannot uh, seek access to cabinet documents. That ruling was made in Northern Land Council in the High Court basically making very clear that if, in the, that if the interests of justice required it, then in fact cabinet documents could be uh, required to be produced in a court. The, uh, in relation to the, to the Senate, I encourage senators to go and have a look at a uh, lecture that was given by Brett Walker SC as part of the parliamentary series that also stated the same claim uh, as uh, uh, as exists in the court, that ultimately the Senate can seek these sorts of documents. Again, the, the burden is high. I don't uh, necessarily suggest that the burden in this instance uh, would warrant it in relation to the Cabinet documents, but a minister should not walk into this chamber and mislead by, by uh, su suggesting that uh, these documents can't be provided. They must be much better off simply saying that the burden hasn't been met. Uh, we need to make sure that in the, inside this chamber, when we're dealing with matters of oversight, when we're exercising uh, the, the, our role uh, in relation to oversight of government, uh, that things are done properly and in accordance with the judgments of, of courts. Now, you might think that the courts don't have application or don't have jurisdiction to examine 
uh, whether or not the Senate does or doesn't have a power. Uh, that was found in the case of Egan and Willis that the court can, uh, can make a determination as to whether or not the Senate has a particular power. It just can't uh, then decide on the use of that power. So we must respect the court's views on this and it's inappropriate that, that uh, ministers wander in here and simply quote that previous people have said that this doesn't need to happen and therefore it's right. Because it's not right, it's wrong and it's unlawful. Thank you. Uh, Senator Askew. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. <clears throat> well, here we go again, Groundhog Day once again. We've been here before and those opposite are using the valuable time of this chamber to make their political points again. Minister Reynolds has made a claim for public interest immunity in respect of the deliberations of Cabinet and the disclosure of legal advice in relation to the Centrelink Income Compliance Program. As has been said in this chamber, every time this topic has raised its head, and despite what those on the other side might say, it has been a long-standing practice of successive Australian governments of both political persuasions not to disclose the fact or content of privileged legal advice. We have heard previously, even today, that Labor Minister Senator Joe Ludwig told Senate estimates in 2011 that he would refuse to provide the Labor government's legal advice for the same exact reason. And as we also heard earlier, it was confirmed by another Labor luminary, the Honourable Gareth Evans QC in 1995. Furthermore, we all know that successive governments have upheld that deliberations of Cabinet and its committees should be conducted in secrecy. This ensures the freedoms of Cabinet deliber deliberations can be preserved as it is not in the public interest to disclose those deliberations. I reiterate, this is a long-established basis for a public interest immunity claim. As the Minister stated in the Order for Production letter, even though the class action has resolved and as recognised by the Federal Court on the 11th of June 2021, not all potential claims arising out of the Income Compliance Program will be resolved through the class action. This is because a significant number of class members opted out of the class action and are free to bring their own individual claim should they wish to. As everybody in this chamber knows, the Income Compliance Program has been subject to extensive scrutiny already. This includes from the Common Commonwealth Ombudsman and within parliamentary inquiries, including through the Community Affairs References Committee. The process has also been subject to decisions of the Federal Court. As you are aware, the Community Affairs References Committee recently tabled its fourth interim report and has already held nine public hearings on it. And in fact, this committee will be holding another, the 10th hearing, later this week. As announced in November 2019, the agency no longer raises debts by averaging ATO income information without other information on the basis that it is not sufficient. This relates to the sufficiency or adequacy of information used in making an administrative decision, specifically whether or not there is enough information to make that decision. The government respects the decision of the court, including the finding of His Honour Justice Murphy, that the settlement agreement proposed was fair and reasonable and has approved the settlement. Yeah. Group members who objected to the settlement will be given a further opportunity to opt out of the class action by 17 September 2021. Information about the opt-out process has been sent to objecting group members from 26 July this year. And once this process is complete, further information will be sent to class action group members on whether they are eligible for a settlement payment. And I note that there is a web portal and telephone line that will be established so class action members can review their information, raise a query or a dispute. Importantly, in the class action settlement agreement, both Gordon Legal and the Commonwealth acknowledge that the settlement is not an admission of liability by the Commonwealth and it does not reflect any acceptance by the Commonwealth of the allegations that the Commonwealth or any of its officers had any knowledge of the unlawfulness associated with the Income Compliance Program. The Federal Court similarly found that there is little in the materials placed before the Court that could have sustained such an allegation. Once it became clear the basis upon which the debts were being raised through the sole use of average ATO income data was insufficient, Services Australia paused in-scope debts as they were identified. 
As at the 20th of August this year, about $736.6 million has been refunded, which is about 98.1 per cent of the estimated total of $751 million. Around 423,000 people have had their debts refunded and or reduced to zero. Everyone who has responded has either been refunded or is in the process of being refunded. In cases where people haven't responded, their eligibility for a refund will remain on their record, but Services Australia are unable to pay them until they provide up-to-date details so the transaction can be processed. The government is focused on ensuring that the settlement agreement is implemented. Madam Deputy President, the continued rhetoric from the opposition and crossbench that the government is not assisting those who need assistance is a falsehood. It is typical of their political gains that they have so frequently been used to scare the most vulnerable in our community. Frankly, it's no different to Medi-Scare. Within the social service space, the Morrison government is focused on supporting all Australians as the economy recovers from the coronavirus pandemic. From 1 April this year, working age payment rates, including job seeker payment, were increased by $50 and the income-free threshold increased to $150 a fortnight. This was done to support job seekers as they secure employment and re-enter the workforce. This reform has been the single biggest year-on-year -year increase to the rate of unemployment benefits since 1986 and represents an increase of 9.7 per cent between 1 April 2020 and 2021. While the opposition has claimed otherwise, the truth is that our social security system has served Australians very well. Prior to the global COVID-19 crisis, we saw the proportion of working age Australians who were reliant on welfare payments drop to 13.5 per cent, just 13.5 per cent, the lowest level recorded in more than 30 years. No government has done more for Australians doing it tough than the Morrison government. Throughout the height of the pandemic, we provided $32 billion in emergency support payments. This was on top of the previously mentioned increases in welfare payments. The Morrison government's key focus is creating jobs and getting people back into work. We know that getting a job is the best way to improve the living standards of people and their families. And it's not just about the money. It's about self-respect too. Providing for your family promotes self-respect. The continued conduct of the opposition and crossbench is frankly appalling. Finally, Madam Deputy, oh, Mr President, I would like the Senate to note that, as outlined in our dissenting comments to the interim report, during the interlocutory hearings in the class action, the Australian Federal Court upheld claims of public interest immunity in relation to documents such as Cabinet materials. This includes the executive minute to the Minister for Social Services dated 12 February 2015. Thank you. Senator O'Neill. Thank you very much, uh, Mr President. And I, I rise to uh, respond to this gross failure to actually tell the truth, to come clean, and give the Australians who were inflicted upon with robo-debt access to the information that they need about what the government knew, how they organised this terrible, terrible experience of public policy that has seen the government have to pay back its own citizens $1.8 billion because they charged you through robo-debt illegally. They sent you a bill you should never have received, and if you didn't cough up without question, they chased you. They chased you and chased you. Well, I, can, I don't care what names the people on the other side of this chamber call me, because I'm going to keep coming in here and raising this on behalf of the hundreds of thousands hundreds of thousands of Australians who had a debt inflicted on them by their own government. We have the minister claiming that hundreds of questions were answered by public servants. This government's claimed public interest immunity in those hearings over and over and over and said it is against the public interest for them to know the truth about how Mr Morrison cooked up this scheme, how he oversaw it with Minister Robert, with Minister Tudge and now with Minister Reynolds, continuing to try to hide from the Australians what they did, how they decided to make this historic mistake, and they refused to, continue, they refused to provide it. Now, it's just not good enough. Going forward, this has got to be fixed. We've got Senator Reynolds coming in and saying, oh, on this case, in this occasion, no, the government didn't give any response. When it was a Labor government, you didn't give a response. Well, let me just give you, you know, a few back. 
2007, the Minister of Immigration, Kevin Andrews, Minister for Immigration and Citizenship, he released advice in relation to the power to cancel the visa of Dr Hanif. So, before you try to convince people you don't have to fess up, that you don't have to get these documents because that's never been done, let's tell the truth here for a change, shall we? Of course governments hand it over if they have any integrity, and that's what Minister Andrews did. In 2011, Prime Minister Julia Gillard advised the House of Representatives that she had made available to the Leader of the Opposition, who was then Minister, Mr Abbott, the advice of the Solicitor General on asylum seekers and offshore processing. So yes, legal advice is handed over, and even Christian Porter handed over information about the eligibility of Mr Dutton. So this claim that no documents about legal information get handed over, that's got to be put to bed once and for all. And I've got a feeling we're going to be back here debating because I can tell you I will not let this rest. I will not leave all those people who are attacked by their own government hanging in the wind with this litany of lies that the government comes forward and they start talking all the gobbledygook legal, privilege, legal professional privilege, public immunity claims, as if they could snow the Australian people with this professional language. But the Australian people are on to this government, especially those who are impacted by robo-debt. They know what was really said so clearly by one of our witnesses last week, who described what the Australian government had done to its own people as a shakedown. That's how they described what happened to them. We've heard from amazing witnesses who told us that this problem is actually continuing. We had a Miss Eagle come and speak to the committee. She, sp she spoke about the problem that happened with robo-debt continuing today, and that's why it's so important that we get these documents. And the government cannot continue to hide behind the smokescreen that it's against the public interest to tell us how you got this so wrong. The public deserve to know. You should be coughing up these documents. You should not be able to do again to the Australian public what you did then. Ms Eagle says this is how it rolls at the moment. A client receives a call from a private number, perhaps on a Saturday, and they're told that they need to make an arrangement to repay a Centrelink debt. The first contact they've had, they ask what the debt is about. They're told to look it up on MyGov or at the app. The client checks. There's no letter there that explains how the debt arose, and it goes on and on and on. The litany of failures, the abuse of artificial intelligence against human rights being perpetrated by this government on its own citizen continues. And that is why the mistake of robo-debt has not yet been acknowledged by this government. Despite the fact they paid $1.8 billion back, they still need to come in here and cough up Order. the documents. Senator O'Neill, the question is the motion to take note of the statement be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. We now go to motions to take note of answers. Senator Pratt. I rise to take note of the answers given by Senators Birmingham, Colbeck, Reynolds to the questions asked by Senators McAllister, Keneally, O'Neill and myself. Well, what a question time. We have a Prime Minister who has this week called Western Australia cave people, the gall of our Prime Minister, who wants to drag WA into the COVID mess of New South Wales, and then Order. to call Western Australians Order. cave people. That's right, cave people. Oh, it's an analogy, they said. Oh, well, yes, it is an analogy. It's an analogy for a lack of evolution and living in a cave. It's time this Prime Minister remembered that he governs for the entire country and not just for New South Wales. The people of WA don't believe we have a Prime Minister that governs for Western Australia. This Prime Minister wants to differentiate himself as a champion for freedom in these difficult political times that he has, no doubt, very clearly created for himself. Well, there is no freedom when you live in fear of COVID, in shortages of hospital beds, in fear of getting sick and in fear of bringing disease home to your family. This bloke's got no idea. We've had from, what we've had from him for the last three months, three years, 
is nothing but blame shifting over and over again, blaming Western Australia because we won't open up, blaming states, states for leaks from quarantine, quarantine that he, this government, is constitutionally responsible for. The Doherty Institute says 80 per cent means we can open up. Well, I'm sorry, but that is not what the Doherty Institute modelling says. He's gone on and blamed the states for vaccine rollout when states had no supply. The Premier said so yesterday. And besides, our Prime Minister said it's not a race anyway. And now our Prime Minister has the gall to whack Western Australians and tell us to get out of our cave. Well, we know that Scott Morrison hasn't supported lockdowns in Western Australia. We know he, tr he tried to gang up with Clive Palmer to tear down our border restrictions. This Prime Minister may not like it. This government may not like it. You may choose to sneer at Western Australia, but Western Australia's COVID strategy has worked. We don't want to be like New South Wales. We have a truckload of freedom right now in Western Australia a lot more freedom than other parts of the country. Short, sharp lockdowns have worked for us. Locking COVID out of the state has worked for us. Keeping the state working hard with exports has worked for us, and it certainly worked for the country. We are the freest in the country, perhaps the freest in the world. Australia is a lot bigger than New South Wales, and it's time that Scott Morrison, our Prime Minister, realised that. Western Australia is a very different place. We don't have spread of coronavirus. We are the most successful economy and community in Australia, and we are providing the export revenue and tax revenue that is supporting the rest of the country. So Western Australia is right to continue to be cautious. The national plan does allow WA to keep COVID out, including by managing the border. And Mark McGowan insisted on this. Order. Mark McGowan insisted on this when the plan was agreed. The real issue isn't what's happening in Western Australia right now or in what's happening in Western Australia in a few months' time. The real issue is what's happening in New South Wales. And this Prime Minister trying to deflect attention from his, the messes of his own making. We know we will need to remain uh, vigilant in relation to COVID. Areas right around the world reliant on mining have been taken down by COVID and lost production, whereas Western Australia has not. It might surprise our Prime Minister to know the WA industry is staying open is the only reason the government can afford to offer financial assistance to other states that need us. Right now, WA is one of the safest places, if not the safest place in the world, and if that's a cave, I'm going to stick in it. Senator O'Sullivan. Well, there you go. That was, a, that was, a, that was a, an effort. Let's just put it that way. That, that's about as much as I could. Order. I could. It was an effort. Order. Was... Senator Watt. Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Uh, in, in that uh, five minutes uh, of Sorry. ranting from the other side, uh, thankfully, another uh, uh, what was it? five times, help me out here, five times 200, uh, that's two that's about a th thousand extra people went and got vaccinated just in this last five minutes. And now that's despite the, the, the efforts of those on the other side that just want to run down the program that is seeing Australians getting protected from the coronavirus. And thank goodness that Australians are stepping up and doing that in spite of the rubbish that comes from those opposite. It's absolutely outrageous. Now, it is true. Western Australia, frankly, uh, living here or, or spending this three weeks or so here in Canberra, I just can't wait to get home. I can't wait to get home back to Western Australia because it is the best place in the world to live and you really wouldn't want to be anywhere else. It's absolutely fantastic. And the way that West Australians have stepped up to deal with the coronavirus pandemic is phenomenal. Is phenomenal. But let's just, let's just deal with some facts and some reality here. The last 
Delta case that we had come across the border into Western Australia occurred when a, a woman uh, came from Bondi over to Perth. She worked as a, as a health instructor, as a um, physio or something like that in a, in a gym, and uh, it, it spread to uh, just a couple of people that, that she was in close contact with. And those people were isolated. Those people were appropriately isolated, uh, and they uh, uh, tested positive. Uh, and then, as cases emerged out of those few people that were isolated away due to being in those uh, in those uh, COVID hotspots, uh, it was at that point, 48 hours after the index case was known, that uh, the state government appropriately locked down because we just didn't know how much, uh, how far the spread had occurred across across Perth and across the metropolitan area. But as it turned out, there was no further transmission. No further transmission apart from those that were in those initial close contact areas. Now, thank goodness for that, because it meant that we didn't have to have an enduring lockdown like what we're seeing here in the ACT and certainly what they're seeing in New South Wales. Now, you contrast that to what's happened here in the ACT. In the ACT, uh, the, the, uh, the Chief Minister uh, immediately locked it down. We all recall the press conference that was held at about 12.15. Uh, in the afternoon, and then by 5 p.m. that day, it was already locked down. Now, this was about uh, you know two days earlier than what uh, the state premier of Western Australia locked down. Western Australia, in the last outbreak occurred. So this notion that he crushed and killed the virus is an absolute outrage. I mean, it's just it's just it's just it's just what you're seeing here in the ACT is is a situation where the the virus is spreading. Uh, and, and there's a, a huge amount of compliance uh, across. You know, ACT people are very compliant people, uh, and there is a huge effort being taken by the authorities and by the health professionals to ensure that this uh, virus doesn't spread. Now, I drove home from here the other night. Uh, I hired a car to be able to get uh, to and from my apartment. So I was here all last week, and I drove home, and I've got New South Wales number plates on my uh, on my hire car, and I was pulled over by the police. And the police asked me, where have you been and where have you going? I uh, obviously uh, complied and told them exactly what I'd been doing. I'd been at work and I was going straight home, as, as per what we're allowed to do. Now, they're taking it very seriously here, very, very seriously, but there's still an element of, of COVID spread. So for Senator Pratt to, to come in here and sort of pretend like there's this you know, miraculous thing that's going on in WA just because you know we're West Australian. I, I, look, I sympathise with that. We are a very special type of people over there. Very that's that's very true. But I tell you, I mean, it's just outrageous to think that we're somehow immune from this. Now, Western Australia is just as prone to having an outbreak as anywhere else. That we have hundreds of trucks coming across the border, and the question is, are we actually ready? Are we actually ready? Is our health system ready? I mean, the, the, uh, the Deputy Premier, the Health Minister over there, blamed Western Australians for the rise in health issues when he said that they weren't presenting because of the COVID issues last year. I mean, it's just outrageous. We're going to make sure that we're actually ready for when there's an outbreak. The best thing that Western Australians can do is go and get themselves vaccinated, but we've got to also make sure that the health system is set up and ready. And I'm concerned, Mr President, whether or not Western Australia is actually ready and the health Order. system is Senator ready to take on Senator board. O'Neill. Uh, thank you, Mr President, and I rise today to take note of the, as usual and sadly, utterly inadequate answers from those opposite to questions of vaccine for children. This is such an important issue. As with every single other aspect of the vaccine rollout, the Morrison-Joyce government has botched the landing on this. They've missed every deadline, they've missed every goalpost that they set themselves, and Australians are paying the price. Yet their failure is even more egregious when we consider the at-risk communities that they have not only failed but long ignored. The Disability Royal Commission heard evidence last year that there was a glaring lack of pandemic planning for children and young people with disability, yet nothing, nothing has been done to effectively prepare for this new stage of the rollout. I read in an ABC article from yesterday that Bodhi, a young man with neuropathy, was forced to make eight separate attempts to get vaccinated in Sydney. And his mother rightly asked, I understand we're in an unprecedented, uh, unprecedented pandemic, but does it really have to be this hard? Yet, in her response to my question today, Minister Reynolds just denied that mother's lived reality. 
It was dismissed out of hand by the minister. And it just reveals his failure to actually deal with the, cr the, the crushing reality of parents just trying to get access to a vaccine for a disabled child. It really didn't have to be this hard, I say to Bodhi's mum, but it is because of the ineptitude of this government. Bodhi's condition means that he's difficulty managing his lungs, and were he to get COVID, he would have much greater difficulty breathing than if you or I got COVID. And tragically, his older brother had a similar condition, and that poor family is suffering the grief of losing uh, that other brother who died of pneumonia three years ago. We've got to make access to vaccines for kids with disability as easy as possible. And it hasn't been on the to-do list for Mr. Morrison, for Minister Morrison and Minister Reynolds. In the US, they've managed to get around 600,000 vaccinations out the door for children aged 12 to 15, and more than 15, 4 million of those under 17 have got the vaccination. Yet Scott Morrison's ruled out including children in our vaccine targets before opening up. Now we all want to open up. We all want to be with our families. We all want some sense of normal. We all want businesses to get back up and running if they can. We want to get back to work. But no one, no one in those groups wants to trigger an attack on our children of this illness, deaths of children, because this hasn't been properly planned for. Modelling by epidemiologists from ANU have warned that excluding children from our vaccination targets could result in thousands more deaths across this community with those children who are most vulnerable caught up with Delta, because it's highly transmissible with children. This is going to be particularly worrying for populations also that are disproportionately young, like Aboriginal populations in Western New South Wales. And I'm advised that Dubbo, um, in Dubbo, the ABC News Central West has reported that only 6.3 per cent of Aboriginal people in Western New South Wales are vaccinated at this stage. And there's a massive outbreak about which I made a contribution just before question time. Now, this government's appalling mismanagement of the rollout has left Indigenous communities without the recommended Pfizer vaccine. And remember, Mr Morrison was offered, offered 40 million doses by Pfizer in June 2020. He squibbed it. He didn't get those vaccines. And because he made that choice, this is where we are, without adequate Pfizer. People on lists waiting, desperate for it, who can't get it. And it all comes back to the Prime Minister's decision to reject those Pfizer, those 40 um, million Pfizer vaccines. With only 8 per cent of the First Nations population fully vaccinated across the country. Words fail me. I cannot think of what's going to happen in the remote communities that will be inflicted with the Delta strain very, very soon. Chronically underserviced by successive Liberal national governments, particularly in New South Wales, those communities have been forced to stay away from members of their community lest they contract this deadly disease and have to leave country for indefinite periods. But that is what's happening right now in the central west of New South Wales. This government is failing the people of Australia. Order, Senator O'Neill. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Mr. President. So let's just start with a fact, shall we? And for those opposite, a fact is something based in truth. So when we talk about vaccinating children and suggesting that we should be looking at children under 12, there is actually not a vaccine approved for them globally. So let's just stop with that little piece of fallacy, shall we? But I'm, you know, perhaps you want those of us with children under 12 to offer them up as guinea pigs, but uh, I can assure you that won't be happening. But I do note, as the parent of a 12-year-old boy who is an NDIS participant, I'm thrilled that my beautiful boy is now eligible from today to get the vac Pfizer vaccine. But what I also know, we were able to get an appointment, had I been in Sydney, tomorrow morning, 7.30am, at the hospital that is less than 250 metres from my apartment. 250 metres from my apartment at 7.30 tomorrow morning, I could have got him his first Pfizer jab. And there were multiple other options available across New South Wales. 
So, unfortunately, I'm not in Sydney. I'm not there to be able to take it up. But had I been there, we would have been able to get our first dose tomorrow morning of Pfizer for a 12-year-old boy who's an NDIS participant. And I do accept, though, that sometimes families can struggle to find this information to figure out where they can get a booking, because they are available in health hubs, in pharmacies, through GPs. So for those opposite that might actually be interested in assisting people, perhaps you'd like to direct them to my website, hollyhughes.com.au. My staff have put together a fantastic COVID page, collating all the information from federal, state and private sites, letting people know where they can book a vaccine, what vaccines are available and how long it will take for them to get in. But also on top of that, as of yesterday, in recognition of all participants, the NDIS over 12 now being eligible for a vaccine, Tom in my office really went over and above. He's put together a page specifically for people with a disability. So not only have we included information on where people can go and get a vaccine, we've actually put information in there containing social stories. Because we understand for a lot of people with a disability, doing something new, something a bit scary, something that you don't really understand can be challenging. So we've included links to social stories, and for those of you that don't understand what that is, they're very simple stories with language and pictures that help families and carers explain to the person with a disability what's going to happen, what does it mean, how they might have to wait, what they're going to have to do when they get to their appointment. And this is because some of us actually understand the challenges of having a child with a disability and what that means when coming to get a vaccine. So we've gone out of our way, or in fact not even out of our way, just done what we do to include information to assist these families. But I would like to also acknowledge David in my office. He got a couple of phone calls last week from parents of children with disabilities who were struggling to find where to get a vaccine. So for one family in particular, one, he pointed them in the right direction on our website and they managed to find one themselves. But for another one that was still struggling, he went out of his way. He made the phone calls for them. And that child received their very first vote dose of vaccine this week because I saw the letter yesterday from that parent thanking him for the assistance and going over and above what was required. So perhaps for Senator O'Neill, next time she gets a phone call from someone like Bodhi's mum, perhaps rather than using Bodhi as, a, as an opportunity to score a political point, perhaps Senator O'Neill and her office might like to go to some effort to actually assist the family, to actually work with them through this issue, not use it as a political point scoring exercise. It is absolutely disgraceful. So to you opposite, to all of those opposite sitting there, casting those stones, throwing those barbs but not really ever helping anybody, let me give you some advice. Perhaps you'd like to find some real information. Perhaps make it available to your constituents. Perhaps ensure that people know where to go when they find information rather than running a fear and scare campaigns. But rather than parents with disability offending us and patronising, maybe try and help us. Order, Senator Hughes. Now, at 4pm, in about 15 seconds, we are interrupting debate to go to the disallowance. So I was going to return to take note after that. Um, rather than interrupt someone 15 seconds into a speech. So it being 4pm, we'll go to the motion moved by Senator Waters, and I'll call the clerk. Business of the Senate Notice of Motion No. 1, standing in the name of the Leader of the Australian Greens in the Senate, relating to disallowance of an instrument. Senator Hanson-Young, could you formally move the motion on behalf of Senator Waters before I call her? Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I move the motion, and uh, I know Senator Waters is sitting there, ready to make a great contribution. Senator Waters, remotely. Thank you very much, President. I uh, note that the business of the Senate notice of uh, motion number one has been moved to disallow the Beedaloo Cooperative Drilling Program grant. Now, I want to start by saying clearly what this vote is about. In the middle of a climate crisis, at a time when the International Energy Agency, the G7, and the IPCC are all saying stop funding coal, oil and gas. The 
Morrison government is gifting $50 million of public money to the fossil fuel industry to frack the gas in the Beetaloo Basin in the Northern Territory. It's doing so against the wishes of First Nations communities and before key environmental baseline studies have been completed. $20 million, uh, $21 million of that slush fund has already gone to the first applicant, Imperial Oil and Gas, a wholly owned subsidiary of Empire Energy, a company linked to major Liberal Party donors and life members, a company that's been lobbying relevant ministers for months. And there is absolutely no requirement for the company to repay any of that largesse if they go on to make millions from exploiting a public resource. No assurance that the companies will not send the money offshore and avoid paying tax locally. Today, the Senate has a chance to stop this misuse of public funds, to stop the rorting, to listen to First Nations communities, to listen to the climate science, to protect precious groundwater, to save $50 million that could be better spent on housing or education or increasing job seeker. We have the chance to stop it. But yesterday, the Labor Party said that they won't. We beg them to change their mind because there is so much at stake here. Firstly, for the climate. The Beetaloo Basin holds 34 billion tonnes of gas, which is the equivalent of 68 years of Australia's current pollution levels. It alone would increase Australia's annual emissions by 6%. It is a climate bomb. Opening up the basin would completely blow our chance of meeting our already weak Paris targets. And the IPCC advice could not be clearer on this. We have until 2030 to halve the world's climate pollution if we want to have any chance of, of staving off chain reactions that will lead to runaway climate breakdown. This is the critical decade, and even conservative bodies like the International Energy Agency recognise that and have urged governments to stop subsidising climate wrecking fossil fuel projects. And yet this government wants to hand out more public money to its fossil fuel mates, and it seems like the Labor Party are going to let them do it. But it's not just climate impacts. Our precious groundwater is also at risk from fracking. The independent review of fracking in the Northern Territory, or the Pepper Review, noted significant environmental, social and economic risks of fracking the Territory. The review made 135 recommendations, and it said that only the full implementation of all of those recommendations could provide any assurances that those risks could be managed. But less than half of those recommendations have been implemented. The Senate inquiry was told, the one that the Greens initiated into this insane proposal. Um, and the federal grants program that we're seeking to disallow would actively fly in the face of at least three of those PEPA recommendations. Firstly, environmental baseline studies won't be completed before the drilling um, expedited by these grants would be done. There's no requirement for carbon offset arrangements to be locked in before the drilling commences. And the federal government has no plans to extend the water trigger under the EPBC Act to assess the impacts of shale gas extraction on water, um, as amendments that I moved in 2013 uh, would have achieved had they not been voted down by both big parties. Perhaps most importantly, the justice of our nation is at stake. The Senate inquiry heard from traditional owners right across the Territory deeply concerned about fracking the Beetaloo Basin. First Nations countries are worried for their country. They're worried for their water, they're worried for their kids, their access to cultural practices, and they are furious that this government is handing out millions of dollars to their donor mates and offshore shareholders while towns like Borroloola don't have footpaths or safe water, where houses are poorly built and overcrowded and while kids can't get a decent education. These traditional owners told the Senate inquiry that they have not been consulted in any meaningful way by this government or by the companies that are so keen to pillage their country and their groundwater. There's been no scientific explanation for the work being undertaken or information provided to those TOs about the long-term impacts and risks their questions have gone unanswered and their concerns ignored. Traditional owners despair as their wishes, their responsibility as our custodians of this country continue to be ignored. And yesterday, Senator McMahon 
shamefully dismissed the views of First Nations community members who gave evidence to the inquiry. Her comments were so typical of the attitude of this government and their approach to consultation. If you don't like what you hear, dismiss it, belittle it, ignore it. First Nations communities have spoken loudly and clearly in opposing fracking in the Beedaloo Basin. This Senate must listen. But even if you were to overlook the climate impacts, the groundwater risks, the opposition of First Nation communities, these grants should be stopped because it is because it is yet another dodgy Liberal slush fund for Liberal Party mates. The rogues gallery of applicants for the grants includes Sweet Pea Petroleum, a company registered in the tax haven that is connected to a Russian oligarch currently on a US sanctions list. It includes Tamburan Resources, registered in a tax haven and so opaque that we don't actually know who even owns it. Santos, Australia's 11th biggest polluting company and regular political donor to both of the big parties, is also in the mix. And Empire Energy, a company with extensive links and lots of financial support to the Liberal Party, uh, and one of whose main sh uh, shareholders is a man with an outstanding arrest warrant from Hong Kong uh, for insider trading. Now, yesterday in his contribution to the interim report of the Senate inquiry into fracking in the Bidaloo, um, Senator Watt for the Labor Party went through the shopping list of everything that is wrong with this program. The meetings between Empire Energy and Minister Taylor, meetings at which Minister Taylor says the grants programs weren't discussed, something that is contradicted by emails from the company disclosed under FOI. The Empire Energy funded joy flight for Minister Taylor, for Liberal donors, after Minister Taylor's fundraising arm, the Hume Forum, a Sky News journalist, Senator McMahon and her then staff member, who incidentally was recently pre-selected the, by the CLP uh, for the daily by-election, and if elected, could vote on future NT government decisions regarding Empire Energy's fracking operations. Uh, and thirdly, the coincidence of Empire meeting with Minister Taylor just days before the first in, first served grant guidelines were released and then happening to be the first application, and so far the only one to be served. Now, we know that Minister Taylor isn't the Minister for Resources, as Senator McMahon so helpfully pointed out yesterday, but he does represent resources in Cabinet. And Empire Energy was pretty keen to talk to him and for his help to get them a meeting with Minister Pitt. Applicants for grants under the Beedaloo Cooperative Drilling Program are required to declare conflicts of interest. Where no conflicts are declared, no further questions are asked. Being a massive donor to the Liberal Party apparently isn't a conflict. Having met with a relevant minister just prior to the guidelines being announced apparently isn't a conflict either. The whole program is so dodgy that the Labor Party want to refer it to the ANAO. Why not just stop it now? Senator Watt says that if people want to know where Labor stands, that they should look at their policy platform. Well, I think people will look at Labor's voting record. And right now, Labor has a chance to actually avoid another sports rorts or park and ride style abuse of public funds, rather than give the program a catchy name and then be outraged when the ANAO finds that it was a really bad idea. You could just vote to stop it now. The community will remember that Labor had the chance to stop public money going to climate wrecking projects that First Nations communities have said they do not want. Labor has decided they will just step aside and let the Liberal government do the bidding of their fossil fuel donor mate. This grant program is a bad one. The evidence to the inquiry was clear. Uh, the criteria doesn't require climate risk to be considered. It won't consider the adequacy of First Nations groups, uh, consultation with them, it isn't interested in the environmental history or the tax avoiding behaviour of applicants. It doesn't look for conflicts of interest. The only relevant criteria seem to be if you are a friend of the Liberal Party. Australia should not be spending public funds on fossil fuel projects when we know that we have less than a decade to prevent climate catastrophe. Health, education, increasing job seeker, there are so many better ways to spend $50 million in the Northern Territory handing public money to party donors for a climate wrecking project that no one wants is unethical, wasteful and a danger to our children's future. I urge the Senate to disallow this program.
Minister. Uh, Acting Deputy President, this instrument should not be allowed, or so the instrument should not be disallowed. Uh, the Beetaloo um, Cooperative Drilling Program will unlock new gas potential and accelerate exploration and development in the important Beetaloo Basin in the Northern Territory. The basin is a new world-class gas province with an estimated 200,000 petajoules or more of gas. The Australian government's $50 million accelerated drilling program is designed to realise the benefits of gas development as soon as possible for all Australians, including the traditional owners in the basin. Senator Watt. Thank you, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. Um, I just rise to make a contribution on behalf of Labor in this debate, and I make clear at the outset that uh, Labor will not be supporting this disallowance motion. Um, I think it's really important to be clear as to what this motion is about. What it seeks to do is to disallow funding or disallow a funding program in its entirety. It seeks to disallow and to effectively abolish the funding that the government has decided to allocate for exploration activities in the Beetaloo Basin. This motion is not, as the Greens suggest, about trying to stop a grant to Empire Energy. It goes beyond that. It's not just about Empire Energy. It seeks to abolish the entire funding program from which grants to Empire Energy have been made. Now, Labor does not support disallowing this entire funding program, and that's why we will not be supporting this disallowance motion. The motion is not to disallow or to stop grants to Empire Energy. The motion that promoted by the Greens is to disallow an entire funding program from which those grants have been made. The reason we are not supporting the disallowance motion um, and the, the reason that we do not support getting rid of this funding program altogether is because our platform, which I have directed people to already, says that we support new gas projects and associated infrastructure subject to independent approval processes to ensure legitimate community concerns are heard and addressed, uh, and that we will ensure the industry assesses and manages environmental and other impacts, including on water reserves and coexistence with other agricultural activities and engages constructively with landholders. That is the balanced position that Labor came to at our national conference, uh, and that is our position on all matters to do with gas. So uh, supporting this disallowance motion would be in conflict with our policy position, and that's why we are not supporting it. We do, however, have serious concerns about the grants that have been made to date from this program. Uh, as I outlined yesterday in my contribution on the Senate inquiry report, uh, we have particular concerns about evidence received in the Senate inquiry about um, the adequacy of consultation with traditional owners and First Nations people generally in relation to proposed gas developments. And we also have serious concerns about what has become clear are the close links between certain ministers in this government and the only beneficiaries of this grants program to date. Uh, and that's, it's because of those concerns that we were part of the majority report in the Senate inquiry into this matter, uh, and we supported the recommendations of that uh, committee inquiry. Uh, it's because of these concerns that, unlike other parties in this chamber, we have referred and are in the process of referring this gross grants program to the Auditor General, because there are serious concerns about conflicts of interest between uh, Liberal Party ministers involved in this program and Liberal Party donors who have benefited from this program. That is the appropriate way to deal with these sorts of concerns about particular grants. Uh, it's also because of these concerns that we are moving in order to produce documents seeking further documentation about um, this latest scandal involving Minister Angus Taylor, uh, and it's why we're pursuing other remedies as well. Now, this motion doesn't do any of those things that Labor has already put into action. This motion doesn't do anything about trying to tackle the particular conflicts uh, between Minister Taylor in particular uh, and the beneficiary of this grants program, uh, which is a, a number of significant Liberal Party donors. Uh, Labor has a very strong record in trying to fight this government's rorts. It's why we have consistently called for some time now for an anti-corruption commission. Uh, it's why we led the charge on sports rorts. It's why we led the charge on car park rorts. Uh, but I might point out that while we have taken up 
uh, big issues uh, and big complaints about sports rorts and car park rorts inv involving this government. We never called for those particular funding programs to be abolished. What we did was refer matters to the Auditor-General for investigation and have taken up the charge on them ever since. That's the appropriate way to deal with these issues involving the particular grants that have been made. That's what Labor's doing, uh, uh, but going beyond, beyond that to uh, disallow the funding program in its entirety is, would be akin to disallowing uh, sports programs which were rorted by this government. It would be akin to abolishing car park funding programs which were rorted by this government. We didn't do that in those cases and we don't intend to do it now. Senator Hanson Young. Thank you, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. I, ride, I rise to speak to this uh, disallowance motion and add my uh, voice to uh, those comments already made by Senator Waters so eloquently in relation to this issue. But I do want to point out just the sheer hypocrisy of the Labor Party in relation to this and the hypocrisy of the government who on one, on one hand says that they care about uh, climate change and on the other spending public money making climate change worse. I mean, let's just be honest here. The Morrison government, the Liberal Party, the neoliberals of this government pretend that they are the best economic managers around. And yet what we've got is public money being handed over to a bunch of gas fossil fuel polluting companies for an industry that we're apparently having to spend more money trying to clean up after in years to come. That is not good economic management and it's certainly not good environmental management and it is not good for the planet. No wonder uh, this government is being uh, embarrassed on the world stage uh, by Boris Johnson, the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. Uh, by uh, the US in relation to their commitments, even in relation to climate change. Many of our closest trading partners, even China, for heaven's sake, is saying that they've got some uh, targets to reduce carbon pollution and have a net zero uh, ambition. This government's got none of that. And instead, they're handing over money, public money, to make climate change worse. Now, if this industry is going to is is worthwhile, stands on its own, where's the free market? Why isn't it being able to do it on its own? Because this prime minister has said out of the COVID crisis that we're going to have a gas-led recovery. Well, I can tell you what, that's not going to go down very well when the prime minister and his bureaucrats get to Glasgow at the end of this year, because the rest of the world knows that we have to get out of fossil fuels and we have to get out of making climate change worse. That means reducing pollution, not making it harder. And that's before we even get into how dodgy the deals have been to hand over this initial $21 million—$21 million! Can you imagine where that money would be better spent? Housing First Nations peoples in the Northern Territory, health services, education, perhaps clean renewable energy sources that are going to be there for the future. And this government is pouring more and more public money, propping up an industry that is making our job to tackle climate change even harder. There is no way we're going to be able to reach the targets that we need to if this gas field is opened up, propped up and subsidised by the public purse. And it is just extraordinary that the Labor Party is now lining up with the Morrison government to say, you know what, go for it. Drill as, for as much gas as you want. We don't care about the impact that that's going to make on the environment and on our pollution and on climate change. Well, it's pretty damn clear today, hearing the comments from uh, the government and from the Labor Party, that both of these major parties are in the pockets of the gas and the fossil fuel industry. Because otherwise, why would it be that the Labor Party are refusing to uh, stop this dodgy rort from going ahead? Because they admit 
that we've got all the evidence that this money shouldn't have been handed over. They admit that this is just a rort for the, for the Liberal Party mates. They admit that there's been no due diligence done, so much so they've written to the Auditor General to ask him to have a look at it. But when it comes to actually being able to do something about it, they're refusing. And they're refusing because they don't want to upset their other mates, their Labor mates in the gas industry and in the fossil fuel industry. You know, the Labor Party also got some election donations from Empire Energy. You know that? So is that any surprise that they've, that they've come in here all guns blazing but actually can't actually deliver uh, when, it, when it's needed? All, si all sizzle, no sausage is what we've got from the Labor Party on this, and Senator Watt in particular. This government is making climate change worse, and they're spending your money, public money, taxpayers' money, propping up an industry that is going to condemn the future of this planet and our environment to a dust bowl, making climate change worse. That's what's going on here. It's like asking McDonald's to run the school canteen paying them to do the school lunches while you're trying to fight child obesity. There is no logic here. If we want to stop climate change, we have to stop polluting. If you want to stop polluting, you have to stop subsidising those who are polluting, those who are making money out of making climate change worse. This parliament should be doing that. And it's sad today that we see the Labor Party rolling over into bed with the Morrison government and satisfying both of them, their big fossil fuel mates and fossil fuel donors. Now, I believe we have a contribution from Senator McCarthy remotely. Senator McCarthy, you have the call. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Can you hear me OK? Yes, we can. Go ahead. Thank you. I would like to share the words of Ms Joni Wilson, my Guyaga, a Yanua Garo woman from Borula. Country is important to me because it's my life. It is a part of my body, my soul and my spirit. It provides food, medicine, water and healing. It's important for my cultural connection to the land and my language and the identity of who I am through my skin name. My skin determines how I fit into my clan Country is important because I live off the land, like my ancestors did. It's my responsibility as a Jungai, protector for country as a traditional owner, to protect it with my people for the next generation to come. I want my kids to be able to practice, teach and learn on country, like I did and like my people did before me. Without our land and water, we are nothing and we are nobody. Miss Joni Wilson, a strong Yanua Garo woman from Borrola. She said this in her evidence to the Senate Environment and Communication References Committee inquiry into oil and gas exploration and production in the Beedaloo Basin, an inquiry that would not be happening without the support of Labor. And I do recall, as we do, all of us, that it is because of Labor that we're having this Senate inquiry at all. It is traditional owners like Ms Wilson and many others who are able to tell their story, voices that have not been heard for way too long, for many, many years. Traditional owners who have not had that opportunity to speak directly to the Senate, to the Australian Parliament, to talk about the importance of protecting country and culture, that this is just as valuable and important as protecting industry interests. Labor will continue to advocate for ongoing and meaningful consultation with traditional owners by both government and industry, and all about the cultural heritage, which is so critical to our people as First Nations people across the Northern Territory and Australia, but also the environment as well. It's because of the support of Labor, and I say this, that we are uncovering the story of how these grants are being made. It is enormously difficult, as any politician can tell, but certainly, as I stand as a Yanua Garo woman in the Australian Parliament, trying to pursue as best I can 
the many ways of navigating through the Western system, how to find the voices of our people through your system in terms of the Westminster system. And I do that as a Labor Senator of the Northern Territory. As often as difficult as that may be, in terms of the complex and oftentimes contradictory nature. But I firmly believe that we are in this position because of the support of my colleagues in terms of this inquiry. We have a way to go, and I will not give up in ensuring that we do persevere most genuinely to find out what is going on in the Beetaloo. I look forward to working diligently over the coming months as a member of this Senate committee inquiry to examine the grants process further. And I am pleased that Labor has referred the grants process to the Auditor General to examine the potential conflicts of interest. And I most certainly will be pursuing that most vigorously as well. And I am aware that Labor will be using every strategy at our disposal to continue to prosecute this work, to shine a light on the probity of this grants process and the conduct of particular ministers in handing out public money to their mates. But this message I give now is to the First Nations people of the Beedaloo region. I will not give up in fighting for the rights of country. I will not give up in walking away from what is so critical to all people of the Northern Territory that we must have a fair and just process in going forward in understanding how it is that millions and millions of dollars can be so easily granted. Thank you. All right, there being no further contributions, I will put the question on the motion to disallow as moved by Senator Waters. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. no. The noes have it. No. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Dr Bells, question is the motion moved by Senator Hanson Young on behalf of Senator Waters be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Seawitt teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart teller for the noes. The result of the division is ayes 2, noes 21. The matter is resolved in the negative. Senator Patrick, you'd like to put something on the record? Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I'd just like to indicate uh, and have it put on the hand side that I, that I was paired in support of this uh, motion. Thank you, Senator Patrick. I don't know if there was no pairing, Senator Patrick, but you've put it on the record that you were in support of the motion, but you can't vote remotely. But there was no, there was no pairing for that, for that matter. So we will, now, we will now return to taking note of questions, and the motion was moved by Senator Pratt. So, Senator Green, remotely. Thank you. Uh, thanks, um, Mr. President. I think Senator Reynolds. Sorry, I think um, Senator Roberts is seeking the call. Sorry, we. Senator Roberts, you're seeking the call. Can't hear you, Not Senator. On taking note. You're either frozen or on mute, Senator Roberts. You need to unmute yourself. Thank you. I'll... Senator Roberts, were you trying to record your vote with respect to the previous motion? If you're not, I'll be able to. But I can't hear you. President, President it's Senator Patrick, I can hear um, Senator Roberts, and he wishes to, to uh, be recorded as, as uh, um, rejecting the motion. Senator Roberts, I will ask you to nod if that is the correct interpretation. Uh, what I'm going to ask you to do, Senator Sorry, Roberts, is we're in now favour we're... of the disallowance. You are in favour of the disallowance, Senator Roberts? Yes, he is. So Senator Roberts will be in... And Senator Roberts, we've found that to solve that problem, if you log out, then log in again, that tends to solve the microphone problem. Senator Green, thank you for that. Thank you, Mr President. Um, very happy to facilitate. Uh, uh, Mr President, um, going back to question time today and taking note of those answers, what we heard uh, from the ministers um, and what we continue to hear from this Prime Minister is an attempt to misconstrue the facts and avoid scrutiny on some very important issues uh, relating to the vaccine rollout. And we know that the vaccine rollout is the responsibility of the federal government and this Prime Minister. And yet when we ask these questions, they continue to ignore the answers and not contribute to what we need to know and what families need to know about what we will see over the next couple of months. We know at the moment that there is an agreed national plan and we know that we need to reach 80 per cent to see restrictions start to be pulled away. Uh, but we also know that reaching 80 per cent doesn't mean that every restriction will be minimised. Uh, that is what the national plan says. It's a document. It's freely available. It is publicly available. Um, and yet we seem to have this idea from ministers and from the prime minister uh, that there is a magic solution. We need to understand how we're going to reach that magic 80 per cent mark and how many people will be vaccinated in vulnerable cohorts. And that is why Labor asked these really important questions today. 
we need to understand how children will be vaccinated. We need to understand how children with a disability will be vaccinated. We were asking questions about how many people will be vaccinated from first infections uh, groups. Uh, and these, these are questions that need to be answered, and yet the government continues to avoid these questions. It seems to me that the government wants to move forward in a way that avoids any scrutiny of what is happening right now. That is very convenient for them. We understand they've got their talking notes and they're out there pushing this idea, picking fights with premiers and trying to talk about something that will happen five or six months down in the future. Where we are headed is incredibly important, but how we get there is important as well. Right now, we are not even close to this target. And right now, half of the country is in lockdown. Right now, only 13% of Indigenous Australians are vaccinated. And right now, only one in five aged care homes across the country are ready to, to have fully vaccinated staff when they need to be. Right now, where I live in Cairns, there's two aged care homes that only have 10% of their workers fully vaccinated. So, of course, these questions need to be asked and, of course, they need to be answered. We know that uh, right now we want to understand how we got into this mess in the first place because not committing to, uh, to vaccinate these vulnerable cohorts will get us into a mess no matter what happens with our targets. The Prime Minister wants to pick a fight with, uh, with our premiers about what might happen later on. And that's because he is trying to distract from what is happening right now and his responsibility for this mess. We know that in the last 18 months of this pandemic, the Prime Minister has failed to build a single national quarantine facility. And right now, sadly, we've had to close uh, interstate arrivals in Queensland because the Morrison government failed to help us build the, the um, quarantine facilities that we needed. We know, right, we know right now that vulnerable Australians are not vaccinated. Groups that need to be, that were a priority under this government's plan, their own own plan have not been vaccinated yet. We also know that that is because Scott Morrison failed to get enough vaccines. Then finally, with the last minute that I have to discuss this very important issue, I just want to uh, respond to some comments um, from the government, from senators um, opposite, about, the, about accusing Labor of running down this vaccine program. Nothing could be further from the truth. It was an incredibly difficult decision for me as a pregnant woman to decide to get um, vaccinated. And I did that freely and as soon as I possibly could. And I made sure that that information was public. I encouraged other pregnant women to be vaccinated. I posted a photo with a needle in my arm. There is no one on the Labor side that is not encouraging people in this country to go and get vaccinated. What we have on the other side of politics, though, are MPs that are making sure that they're flirting with the anti-vaxxers out there, the anti-lockdown, anti-mask. If there is someone undermining this program, it is the government, it is the MPs, it is Scott Morrison. The question is, the motion moved by Senator Pratt be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contra, no. The ayes have it. Senator Hanson-Young. Thank you, Mr. President. I understand that Senator Waters would like to take note of the I'll answers. Take it, uh, I'll take it you're moving a motion to take note yes. of an answer to the question from, from Senator, Senator Waters. From Senator Waters. Senator Waters. Thanks very much, President. And I rise to take note of the response given by the Foreign Minister uh, to my question of her today about Australia being an international climate pariah and when we're going to stop hanging out with petrostates like Russia and Saudi, uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, and rather than looking to the actions of the US, the UK, the EU, South Korea, Japan, all of the other nations that have said that they will increase their 2030 targets. Now, I put that to um, the foreign minister, and I put to her that, in fact, the criticism that Australia has recently received from the US ambassador, um, a country on whose coattails we generally seem to uh, sit without question, not so much in this matter. I put to her what we're going to do about that criticism, um, that Australia needs to uh, have a more aggressive pathway 
um, and a more ambitious effort on climate. And I'm afraid I didn't get a very satisfactory answer. I got the um, I got the bizarre statement that they uh, believed in achievements, not targets, um, which is somewhat somewhat bemusing. Um, but I made the point that it's very easy to meet very weak targets. And I'm a bit crowing about meeting our Kyoto target, which was a plus eight, an increase in our carbon emissions is, you know, really nothing to crow about. And then crowing about um, attempting to meet really, really low 2030 targets that are one third of where they should be if we are to have a chance of meeting one and a half degrees um, is really nothing to write home about. Um, unfortunately, the minister that um, took the opportunity to throw about how uh, the government is funding. Uh, oh, so just getting interruption on the audio here, it might suggest that after Senator Abet's objection on my speech yesterday, that people on remote go on mute when they're not talking. Thanks, uh, thanks very much. Um, the foreign minister referenced the fact that the government is supporting so-called clean technology with the tune of uh, 30 million. Well, what she didn't mention was the $11 billion in subsidy to the fossil fuel sector that the most recent budget dished out, which somewhat makes 630 million pale in comparison with the hand to the fossil fuel donors that run this government. And we've just seen a disallowance fail where we could have stopped yet more public money going to fossil fuel companies who happen to be Liberal Party donors. And again, um, the chamber squibbed it. Um, now, the foreign minister then uh, quibbled with uh, my assertion about the need for Australia's climate targets to be increased, uh, which again, is somewhat bemusing because the IPCC report released not two weeks ago clearly pointed out that the trajectory that Australia is on is not, is, is not adequate. And by sheer mathematics, we need to at least double this government's 2030 targets to stay within a two degree window and we need to triple them to have any chance of staying within a one and a half degree window and the difference between those two numbers is whether we have any of the great barrier reef left at all and whether we are going to continue to have an agricultural sector and a tourism sector um, these are just bits of uh, numbers on a page these have incredibly serious real world consequences um, but I'm afraid the, um, the minister, other than engaging with the science, as this government should be doing, simply dismissed it. Uh, what's that classic phrase? I don't accept the premise of the question. Um, I'm afraid that the Australian public don't accept the premise of your government anymore, um, and they want climate action. Now, the final um, question, I again reference the um, international remarks that have been increasing in severity against Australia, pointing out how weak our climate targets are. And the minister then resorted to the, uh, the feeble remark that the prime minister wants to reach net zero by 2050, um, uh, preferably, which is of course a sop to Mr. Barnaby Joyce, who doesn't uh, accept any of the climate science at all. But the IPCC report says that 2050 is simply far too late. Critical decade is now. If we muck about with 2050, we're all stuffed. We have the chance to reduce our emissions now, and that's what's needed. The reason that this nation is not doing so is the vast dollars that flow into the re-election coffers of the Liberal Party, of the National Party, and of the Labor Party. The mining companies are running this parliament. This government should give up the pretense Order, of being in Senator charge. Senator Waters, time for the contribution has expired. The question is the motion moved by Senator Hanson Young be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Are there any notices of motion to be given for another day? Senator Fioravanti Wells. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. On behalf of the Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Delegated Legislation, I give notice of my intention at the giving of notices on the next day of sitting to withdraw business of the Senate, notice of motion number one for 11 sitting days after today, proposing the disallowance of the bankruptcy regulations uh, 2021. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other notices of motion? Senator Urquhart. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I seek leave to uh, postpone general business notice of motion number 1223 to the next sitting day. Is leave granted? Leave is not granted. 
Yeah. I know. I haven't got. Um, I, I, was, I was letting it jump for that. <laughs> yep. So we haven't got to postponements yet. I, I assume that was arranged. When I come to postponements, I'll take it as you have um, saw. But then any senator can request a mo the motion be put today anyway, which I'll take it as what Senator Rustin would like, because it's on the notice paper. Um, are there any other notices of motion? Uh, I shall now proceed to the placing of business. Senator Smith. Thank you, Mr. President. I seek leave to move a motion relating to leave of absence for Senator Patrick. Is leave granted? It is. Senator Smith. I move that leave of absence be granted to Senator Patrick from the 24th to 26th of August 2021 for personal reasons. Thank Question you. is that motion be agreed to? Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Are there any other similar matters? I shall now go call the clerk for postponements and extensions. Postponement notifications have been lodged as follows. Business of a Senate number one standing in the name of Senator Patrick for the 1st of September to the 18th of October and general business notice of motion 1223 relating to extension of a select committee reporting date. I remind senators the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. Senator Rustin, you would like 1223 put to the vote. So the question is, I'm going to look at the clerk to make sure I get the wording right. The question is whether it can be postponed, but it's not a vote on a substantive motion yet. The question is um, whether motion 1223 can be postponed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. no. The noes have it. The noes have it. Senator Urquhart. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Can we record that we voted um, to yes to that? Right. Yes. Senator Urquhart, the opposition's position is so recorded. Senator Seward. Also ask the Greens' position is in support of uh, the is opposed to that. <laughs> the, the Greens' position is to postpone that motion or to oppose the postponement? To postpone the motion. Thank you. Um, I shall now proceed to discovery of formal business and I'll commence with government business number two. Senator Rustin. I ask that government business notice of motion number two. I think it's on, is it? Yep. Is that on? Okay. Um, I ask that government business notice of motion number two be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Rustin. I move that the following bill be introduced. A bill for an act to amend the Crimes Act 1914 for related purposes. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Rustin. I present the bill and move that this bill now be, may proceed without formalities and be read a first time. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. The clerk. Bill for an act to amend the Crimes Act 1914 and for related purposes. Um, sorry, S Senator Rustin. I table the explanatory memorandum relating to the bill and move that this bill now be read a second time, and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated into Hansard. Is leave granted? It is. In accordance with Standing Order 111, further consideration of this bill is now adjourned to the 18th of October this year. I'll now go to general business motion number 1220 in the name of Senator Hanson Young. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 1220 proposing an introduction of a bill be taken as formal. Is there any um, objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Hanson Young. I move that the following bill be introduced a bill for an act to establish a live performance federal insurance guarantee fund and for related purposes. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Hanson Young. I present the bill and now move that the bill may proceed without formalities and be read a first time. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. The clerk. Bill for an act to establish a live performance federal insurance guarantee fund and for related purposes. Senator Hanson Young. Thank you. I move that this bill may now be read a second time and I seek leave to table an explanatory memorandum and uh, relating to the bill. Is leave granted? It is. Senator Hanson Young. I table the explanatory memorandum and seek leave to have my second reading speech incorporated into Hansard and to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? It is. So I'll now proceed to the matter 1223, which is now being dealt with today, which is the uh, motion for the extension of time. Senator Urquhart. Um, thank you, Mr President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 1223 proposing an extension of time for the Select Committee on Job Security to report be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Urquhart. I move the motion. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. 
To the contrary, no. no. The noes have it. Senator Urquhart. Could I, oh, could I just record that it's but obviously our motion, yeah, so we the support it. Yeah. We're in favour of the motion. Senator Seawitt. Quires in favour of the motion. And the Greens are in favour of the motion as well. So the noes have it. The last matter is number 1224 in the name of Senator Keneally. Senator Urquhart. Thank Sorry. you, Mr. President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 1224 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Urquhart. I move the motion. Senator Rustin. Leave is granted for one minute. The government opposes this motion. The Doherty Institute modelling report for National Cabinet was publicly released in full on the 3rd of August. The Doherty Institute issued a public statement on the 23rd of August 2021, confirming that the published and widely available modelling is uh, applicable and aligns with the national plan to manage COVID-19. The director of the Doherty Institute confirmed that oral advice consistent with the public modelling was provided on the weekend of the 21st and 22nd of August. This motion is a waste of the Senate's time and should be opposed by senators who do not want to play politics with this pandemic. Question is, <coughs> motion number 1224 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. no. The noes have it. The noes have it. Senator Urquhart. Oh, obviously, it's our motion. We'll just record that Recording we support. Recording the opposition's position in favour. Senator Seward. Greens also support this motion. I thank, so the noes have it. I record the Greens position. I thank senators for their understanding and not calling unnecessary divisions. Um, now we'll move to commence the MPI, and after the first speaker, we'll then interrupt for Senator Seward's valedictory statement. I've received the following letter from Senator Watt. Pursuant to Standing Order 75, I propose the following matter of public importance be submitted to the Senate for discussion. The Prime Minister's statement that it would be very familiar, I think, to many the reopening plan to get Australia open by Christmas of this year, made in October 2020 in relation to Christmas 2020. Is the proposal supported? It is. I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers for today's discussion. With the concurrence of the Senate, I shall ask the clerks to set the clocks accordingly, and I call Senator Polly. The motion uh, that we're debating today on the MPI, there could not be a more important day to be having this debate. Today has been another heartbreaking day for Australia with 919 cases in New South Wales, 45 new cases in Victoria, nine in the ACT, which has set, unfortunately, a new record of daily COVID-19 uh, for the infections for, uh, thank you, Senator, for, um, for Australia at this time. Now, it is devastating. I was up in my office just a short time ago and I heard that there's been two more deaths in New South Wales. And I guess it's just affected me as I'm sure that um, Senator O'Neill would be feeling this as well, coming from New South Wales, that a, a young mother in her 30s uh, has died and her husband is in the ICU. Now, this is devastating to our country. Too many deaths. Too many people haven't been able to have their vaccination, and we've had a government and a prime minister who is scathing of anyone who would scrutinise their lack of commitment and urgency when they knew from what was happening overseas that there was a crisis coming to Australian shores. They did nothing to ensure that they had adequate supply of vaccines to keep all Australians safe. Now, we've heard in this place today, we heard yesterday, we heard on Monday, the tragedy of those families who were trying to seek out and find access to a vaccine. It's devastating, absolutely devastating. There have been 76 deaths since this outbreak began. There's almost one person a day dying in this country from failing to have access to a vaccine or have had a vaccine and still unfortunately have died. Now we have a Prime Minister who has demonstrated every day this week in the other place, as we have with government senators here, they do not like and will not accept any scrutiny of their failures. They come in this chamber day after day this week trying to justify how they should be so 
uh, bullshy about the fact that there's so many vaccines have been rolled out in the last week or so. Well, I'm sorry, you cannot rewrite Australian history. You have failed the first hurdle as Prime Minister of this country to ensure the safety and the health of every Australian. That was your first job, protect people's health, yeah, yeah. to protect the economy, both of those critically important to every Australian. But you also have failed. Under the Constitution, we know, and you know as well, that it was your government's responsibility to ensure that we had safe and secure quarantine for people in this country, for people coming home. We've also learnt today that the Ruby Princess crisis, oh, the federal government and Mr Morrison, he wiped his hand, no responsibility, don't look at the Commonwealth government. No, no, no. But it was, in fact, hidden away, but it's been uncovered, the report that clearly lays the blame partly, I say only partly, on the federal government. This is the same federal government and the chief minister health um, adviser at the time when the Ruby Princess broke out in my home state of Tasmania down on the northwest coast, which um, our whip here, Senator Urquhart, would remember very clearly coming from that community when there was allegations that there was an outbreak because the, a, party, a party was being held by doctors from that very hospital, from the Burnley Hospital. These are the same people who come in here day after day trying to rewrite what has really happened in this country, and that is we've had a Prime Minister who has failed on every single hurdle to provide security of Australians' health, security of their jobs, security of our economy. We don't forget these things any more than Tasmanians don't forget that it was their chief health adviser, now the secretary of the Department of Health, that made those outlandish allegations at the time of hard-working, dedicated health workers and doctors at the Burnie Hospital. Well, you can come in here each and every day, have speaker after speaker in this debate that will try and rewrite history and blame the Labor Party for all the lockdowns. What have we seen this week? The Prime Minister, who does not like any scrutiny, no scrutiny from him, no responsibility, no crisis here, look the other way. Well, we're not going to allow that to happen because we are going to remind you each and every day of the warnings that you had from what was happening overseas that you failed to protect older Australians in this country. We still have the same health minister who has failed again on every hurdle to ensure the health and safety of Australians in this country. Every single issue and crisis that we've had in aged care still have with aged care workers not being vaccinated. We still have a crisis in the disability sector. We still don't have uh, workers fully vaccinated in either aged care or disability. We've heard today from Senator O'Neill about the travesty that's happening in New South Wales, Western New South Wales, in that community, which I am very familiar with, the crisis there with First Nations people. This is outrageous. The warnings were there. But what's happened to the health minister? Absolutely nothing, because it's so typical of this government. Not our responsibility, not our fault. We are now rolling out the vaccines. We're rolling them out, so everything's all right. Let's not worry about those people who are dying. Every day there's an Australian who is dying needlessly. And it really doesn't matter how old they are, whether you're in your 80s or your 70s, in your 90s, or if you're in your 30s or in your 20s. These deaths could have been avoided if this government and the Prime Minister had done his job and ensured that we had sourced enough vaccinations. That has been the fundamental problem of why we have lockdowns, why Queensland's gone into lockdown, why New South Wales. The ACT, Victoria, 
the health, the mental health impact on our community is going to last for a long, long time, and we won't see the full impact of that for some time. And we have raised our concerns today in this place in relation to the lack of vaccines available to children from 12 upwards. These are children in disability, those people with disabilities themselves, with those teachers that are teaching children with severe disabilities. I know only too well of a case in Orange where they tried, the special education teacher tried to get a vaccine. And what was she told all last week? You'll have to wait till next year. You have to wait till next year. That is outrageous. That is outrageous. We should be doing more. The Prime Minister of this country has failed, as I said from the outset. He's failed to take responsibility. He doesn't like to have any scrutiny. This is not going to go away. And every death that we have in this country, we should be reminding ourselves and reminding the government and particularly the Minister for Health, the Minister for Aged Care and the Minister for Prime Minister himself, we should have prevented these. We could have prevented these. We failed our duty of care. That's what this Prime Minister has done. He should be looking at his own performance, his own failings, instead of looking, as he normally does, to blame everyone else. There's no crisis here. I'm not taking any responsibilities. And if I keep saying that over and over again, I know I'm going to believe it, and maybe the Australian people will believe it. Well, I don't believe they do believe it, because my office has been inundated because of the concerns that our economy is having in the tourism sector, yes. in every sector of hospitality. Yes. We have been hit by the fact that we've got three states in full lockdown, Queensland, New South Wales. Victoria and now the ACT. That's having an impact on my own community in Tasmania. We feel it. We want to get out of these lockdowns. We want to get back to our Australian way of life. But that responsibility still rests with the Prime Minister, who isn't up to the job of leading this country. Thank you. It being after 5 p.m., pursuant to order, we interrupt debate on the MPI to proceed to valedictory statements for Senator Seward. And I call Senator Seward. Thank you, Mr President. I acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, the Ngunnawal people, and acknowledge elders past, present and emerging. I would also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the Buja, which I live and work on, Brulu, Perth. Brulu is located in the country of the Wajak Noongar people, who have been the traditional owners of the southwest of Western Australia for at least 45,000 years. Sovereignty of this land was never ceded. This land has always was and it always will be Aboriginal land. First Nations peoples continue to practice their culture and strengthen their communities, despite the policies and interventions of governments over the more than two centuries white people have been here and that we were, Australia was colonised. Their culture is thriving and growing and their fight for justice is gaining momentum, despite the punitive and paternalistic policies of successive governments that have sought to deny First Nations peoples their rights and their proper place at the heart of our nation. Having the longest living history and culture still thriving on this ancient continent is what helps make us uniquely Australian. It has been a great pleasure to work with First Nations peoples and organisations around this country. Thank you to all of the First Nations organisations and groups I've worked with over these 16 years. Thank you for your support, your knowledge and wisdom that you have shared. There is still so much unfinished business, many injustices that need to be put right. We still have some of the, of the worst First Nations health education, employment and life expectancy outcomes in the world. We have by far the highest rates of over-representation of Aboriginal children in our child protection system, and the numbers of Aboriginal youth within our justice systems are the worst of any developed nation in the world. 
I am so pleased there will be two strong and determined Aboriginal women as part of our Greens team in this place to drive change. It has been a privilege to represent the people of Western, of Western Australia in the Senate. I have always been driven by achieving better outcomes for people and planet. Just to confirm, this is my formal, last, last fa my formal farewell speech. However, as I'll be here for another week, providing that we are sitting, it won't be my very last word. You can't expect, surely, that I will sit here silently for a week. <laughs> You're spot on. In my first speech, I said, we need to remember that we live in a community, not an economy. That our economy is one means of sustaining that community, an important part, but definitely not only one part. It is one we need to get right. But it is not the be-all and end-all. Ultimately, what we all want is the opportunity to lead meaningful and fulfilling lives. If instead of striving to be richer, we could strive to be more equal, everyone's well-being would improve and we would have healthier communities based on compassion, honesty, fairness, justice, respect and equality. This statement is as true today as it was 16 years ago. We have seen over the last two decades what happens when we put the interests of the wealthy ahead of those of the broader community. Wealth doesn't trickle down and it doesn't float all those boats. Now more than ever, it is critical that we put the people and the planet ahead of all else. The pandemic has laid bare how important a strong and inclusive community is and how important it is to look out for everyone in our community. COVID showed us that poverty is a political choice. In a country as wealthy and prosperous as Australia, it is shameful and unacceptable that we have so many people living below the poverty line, there are, that so many are homeless and struggle to have enough to eat. Early on in the pandemic crisis, we had a small taste of what it could be like if our economy was truly designed to serve us. Briefly, across the political spectrum, we were all truly in it together and focused on the best community outcomes. For the first time in over two decades, people on income support had enough to get by. Those experiencing homelessness were given shelter and communities came together to support each other. After having campaigned in this chamber and across the country for an increase in income support for well over a decade, I was in fact overjoyed when the government suddenly doubled the rate of the job seeker payment during COVID. After decades of community ca campaigning, we finally got to see firsthand the dramatic increase in the quality of life brought about because people who were being marginalised and excluded finally received an adequate living income. We heard firsthand the impact this made on people on income support, and I shared many of these accounts that were entrusted to me in this chamber. The COVID crisis shone a light, shone a light on how broken our social security net really is. Suddenly, a significant number of Australian households holders needed to access income support for the first time in their lives. In doing so, many people discovered how complicated and punitive our social safety net has become. We saw the biggest shift in attitudes in, in decades everywhere across our communities. But it turns out, unfortunately, those attitudes towards the poor and the excluded did not shift very far in this place. For decades, there has been an approach by successive governments, reinforced by our mainstream media, that seeks to undermine the character of those who are struggling to get by and seeks to blame them for the desperate circumstances they find themselves in. Our income support system seems designed to grind people down, to rob their lives of hope and meaning, rather than assisting them to find their, life, their purpose in their life, to make a contribution to society and to have a good life. We are again seeing the government pursuing people for overpayment errors, many of them most likely by Centrelink. At the same time, our Treasurer and Prime Minister refuse to do anything to recover the hundreds of millions of dollars in JobKeeper subsidies made to billionaires and big corporations. Have we learnt nothing from robo-debt? Through this crisis, the government has clearly shown that poverty is a political choice 
that we quite deliberately continue to choose to make. We have seen how they can provide our citizens who are out of work with a living wage and how effectively this stimulates local economies and improves outcomes for our community. Instead, they have chosen to entrench economic inequality by only increasing the job seeker payment by a mere $3 a day, keeping the payment below the poverty line. Remember, this includes single parents, people with a disability who can't get DSP, older workers being discriminated against and, and ageing into retirement in poverty. We could and should imagine a country where everyone has the opportunity to live their best life, to find and develop their talents, to follow their passions and build meaningful and purpose, meaningful and purpose in their lives to be given the opportunity to make a contribution to our community and to be recognised for it. Our role in this place should be to make these dreams possible, not to crush them. We are given a unique opportunity here to help create a better country. Now is the time for an unconditional livable income so that nobody has to live in poverty in this country. Now I would like to turn to the biggest crisis we all face, the one that threatens not just our health and well-being but the health and resilience and ongoing viability of all life on this planet. It is with a heavy heart and an immense sense of disappointment and frustration that I stand here and acknowledge that after 16 years in this place that we as a parliament representing the Australian community have failed to achieve anything meaningful and constructive for them in the face of this excess—I can say this—existential threat of climate change, I could say it when I practised it. We had legislation, and it was starting to work, and it was torn up. Shame. We are in a climate crisis. It is code red. The first duty of a government should be to keep people safe. We do have a duty of care to all our children and our future generations. In the last few years, we have seen the start of a dreadful acceleration of the rate of catastrophic climate extreme weather events across Australia and around the world. We have faced fires on a scale and ferocity never seen before, knowing at the same time that the conditions will only get worse. Droughts, cyclones and floods continue to become more frequent and more severe. As we continue to cause more widespread damage, the resilience of our ecosystems, their ability to recover and to continue to sustain life is eroded. In turn, their degradation and loss contributes more greenhouse gases. It's a vicious cycle. The climate crisis is, dam is damaging our vital ecosystems, all the life we share this planet with, our health, our water, our ability to grow food and the air we breathe. Climate change now threatens all species, and if we fail to act quickly and comprehensively, many more species will be lost to extinction within our lifetimes. All the while, donations from fossil fuel industries continue to influence political decision-making. The latest IPCC report adds more detail to the science and more certainty to the predictions of the temperature rises and habitat loss. But fundamentally, we already knew and have known for a long time that we have to act with a sense of extreme urgency. This is a collective shame on this place, in my opinion. History will judge us very harshly because the evidence is there in black and white in the Hansard that we knew about this monumental threat to our community and our planet. When the lives and livelihoods of Australians were threatened by the coronavirus, governments listened to the science and took action. It is beyond time to treat the climate crisis as the national emergency that it is and take urgent action. We are running out the clock on this crisis. We have very little time left to, pre to prevent catastrophic climate change. We already know that, we, that the last two decades of inaction have cost us and our children very dearly. And increasingly, there is a risk that things will get away from us and our efforts will be too little, too late. I would like to reflect on some of the important and often un unrec unrecognised work that we have achieved in this place. 
Unfortunately, parliamentarians agreeing and working together is not all that newsworthy. And I think perhaps we should all, including the media, look at what we click on and report that reinforces conflict and controversy, and failing to seek out and share stories of good processes delivering positive and good outcomes. One of the ways that we can achieve outcomes is through the committee process, and I think it comes as no surprise to anyone in this chamber that I'm a big supporter of the committee process. I do acknowledge that not all the inquiries we undertake through the committee process has us singing kumbaya and agreeing, but they are very, there have been some very good outcomes from committees and they drive change. It has been my privilege to be the chair of the Senate Community Affairs Reference Committee for a number of years. Working together in committees and with community, we've been able to shine a light on many, many issues, including past adoption practices, the experiences of former child migrants and forgotten Australians, hearing health, suicide prevention, violence and abuse, uh, violence and, abuse and neglect of disabled people, indefinite detention of people with cognitive and psychiatric impairment in Australia, the aged care workforce, out of home care, grandparent carers, income inequality, Lyme diseases and, of course, robo-debt and so many more. One inquiry that stands out for me is the 2012 inquiry into forced adoptions. I will ne never forget the trust and confidence people in the community had in the committee to share their very personal and often deeply, tra deeply traumatic experiences. Because of their courage, we, have ex we exposed this dark chapter of our history and made immeasurable changes to the lives of those in our community who were so badly affected by this inhumane treatment. That is where this place shines. I remember that day so clearly when we delivered the report, people spoke and we all in this chamber stood up and clapped the mothers and the children and those affected by forced adoptions who were all in the gallery. We clapped them and it was a day that I think we can all be proud of. During my time here, I've, supported, I've been supported by so many parliamentary staff and I would like to take this opportunity to thank the procedures office, the tables office, the library and Hansard, con car drivers and all the wonderful people that keep this place running. And where would we be without our fix from Aussies? Thanks to the amazing and fantastic Chamber assistants who keep assistants who keep us all on track, Stephen, Diane, Wally, Rosemary, Adrian and Fiona. I would like to thank all the committee staff for their dedication and support during the many Senate inquiries I have chaired, referred and participated in. In particular, I would like to thank the Community Affairs Committee Secretariat for their support and for their always ensuring that we can hear the experiences and voices of the community in this place. It is one of the important things that I, that I hope continues is that we continue to ensure that we hear the voices of the community in this place. My work would have been greatly diminished if it had not been for the support and generosity of our deeply valued stakeholders and community and not-for-profit sectors. I would not have been able to manage my portfolio responsibilities and campaigns without your expertise and the time you have spent over many, many years um, investing in various issues, uh, lob campaigning, um, advocating for change in this place. I thank you for your invaluable help to help us raise pressure and bring the issues out here in this chamber. I think together we have made some changes to some key issues. I would also like to thank all the staff they have worked with in my office, the WHIPS office and the WHIPS clerks and the broader green team, the Greens teams over the last 16 years. I have received so much support from all of you over many years and I could not have done the work that I have done without your dedication, expertise and patience. I would like to make a special shout out to all my office staff over the years. It is a long list. Thanks to Rebecca, Bridget, Nicola, Scott, 
Fluffy, Tim, Chris, Dee, Donna, Tennille, Joe, Nadine, Georgia, Andrew, Jess, Elise, uh, Eloise, Fernando, Claire, Harriet, Ryan, Tarek, Oggy, Elliot, Giz, Dave, Alan, and my current amazing team, Rose, Lucy, Jana, Grace, and Alison. I thank you from the bottom of my heart. We have truly operated a team at all times, and I will miss you so much. I will note that a lot of those staff are now currently working for other Green senators in the Australian Greens and in the Leader's Office, and many have gone on to very other very exciting work. As I said in my first speech, I stand here the fourth in a line of strong Green women from the West. I pay tribute to Jo Valentine, Christabel Chamaret and Dee Margetts and thank them for the support they have given me over the years. I know that our next WA Senator, Dorinda Cox, is also a force from the West and she is very strongly to be reckoned with. Thank you to all our volunteers at Greens WA. Your commitment to our values and passion for making our community better means that I have been lucky enough to be able to represent you and our beautiful state for the last 16 years. When I started out here, we were a much smaller team. In fact, there were just four of us. And I want to pay tribute to Bob Brown and Christine Milne, who both guided and mentored me during the beginnings of my political career. It did take me a long time to realise I was actually a politician. I would also like to thank Richard and Adam for their support and guidance and commitment to our Greens movement, and I thank all my party room colleagues. It's such a shame you can't be here. I'm sending my love to you all and thank you very much. I have enjoyed working with all of you. It's been a great honour. I would also like to thank, from, again from the bottom of my heart, all the people who have sent me such lovely messages over the last couple of days. It's very much appreciated. Senator Keneally, I'm using your trick of the tongue in your top of your mouth. <laughs> Finally, importantly, I'd like to thank my family. We all in this place have the same family issues as everybody else. We have our ups and downs. We have family crises, children being sick or simply children, young people being teenagers, <laughs> supporting our parents as they age, coping with the loss of loved ones. So often our families have to cope with these issues without us because we are in Canberra, on the road, or in a meeting. We all have missed, I'm sure, so many family occasions. My son will really hate me saying this, but I missed his school ball and seeing him in his formal suit. That can never happen again, and so many people in here have had the same. My family's love and support and understanding have seen me through many challenges and I'm so lucky to have you by my side during this journey. It's been up and down and bumpy sometimes, but overall, I think that we have managed to make some change. Thank you all to my family for being there and, actually, and being on my side. I thank everybody in this place for also the support that you have shown um, and given to me. Thank you. I will now call for contributions to the list I have, and I'll commence with Senator Birmingham. Thanks, sir. Thanks, Mr. President. And uh, Mr. President, the, the departure of any of our colleagues from the Senate chamber is often an occasion for a little bit of reflection and in the departure of Senator Seward, of Rachel, uh, as a senator from Western Australia. Uh, I look at the fact that Rachel is now uh, the only Green senator to have served in the Senate longer than I have served as a senator, and making such an incredible contribution 
uh, with such conviction over such a prolonged period of time. And Rachel, I want to start by just expressing how much you will be missed, I think, from right across the chamber uh, by colleagues who respect you from right across the chamber. As we saw in the remarks you made just then, and we've seen right throughout your career, you're a person and have been a senator uh, of passion and of compassion, uh, that you are someone with strong convictions, but also just such a thoroughly decent person in the way in which you engage and conduct yourself in a principled and a thoughtful manner at all times. 16 years of service in the Senate uh, is an incredible accomplishment uh, in anyone's terms. It's a long way uh, from work uh, as an agricultural scientist, uh, digging through the fields and studying the soil and the salinity in Jerramunga. It's a long way from uh, the 14 years you spent as uh, the coordinator of the WA Conservation Council. But in the 16 years, you've made a real imprint, not just on the institution of the Senate, but I think probably far more importantly on the lives of many people. And you touched on that in your remarks through the committee work and the advocacy work that you've undertaken. Uh, there must be so many thousands of Australians who are grateful uh, for the engagements they've had with Rachel Seward and for the advocacy they've had from Rachel Seward and for the passion and thoughtfulness that you've brought to that. You mentioned your recollections of the work on the inquiry and forced adoption as one of the many different areas that you made a mark uh, as uh, a senator and particularly as chair and participant in the Community Affairs Committee. Um, and indeed, I remember that day too. And I remember the respect that was had across the participants in that inquiry uh, for the senators who had engaged in that inquiry and between the senators for one another and how strongly that extended uh, from senators, coalition senators, Labor senators, to you and to the work that you had done uh, as a champion and advocate in that area of such enormous sensitivity, uh, of such deep emotion for so many people uh, and the care that you had shown throughout. Of course, it's not to say that, uh, that you don't know how to make a point either. Uh, we've certainly all had to turn the volume down occasionally from the odd Rachel Seward contribution in the chamber. Um, but uh, sometimes I think it's safe to say some senators come into the chamber or go into committees or elsewhere and raise their voices for perhaps a little bit of grandstanding uh, to get themselves noticed, to make sure that people turn and see what they're talking about. Whereas I think we all know that when you decided to raise your voice and make sure we all turned around and listened and thought, God, what's Rachel um, you know, so worked up about now? It was because you really cared. It was because it was something that really mattered to you, not just because you were going after a headline uh, or some attention at the time. Uh, and that's a credit and a testament to the type of person that you are. Uh, in your work across the committees, in your work as the Greens whip, in all of those different areas, it has been a demonstration of somebody truly committed to the service of the people of Western Australia, to the service of your supporters and those who share your convictions and your ideologies. And although we may have our points of difference and you have absolutely championed your values, your opinions and those who have elected you relentlessly. And for that, you've got all of our respect. We want to thank uh, on behalf of the government, your family uh, for the sacrifices they've made to lend you to the service uh, of the nation in the Senate. Uh, they should be proud too of what you've achieved. And so Rachel, I'm sorry that I'm not there today in person to wish you well, um, but we do wish you well. Uh, it's been a pleasure uh, for so many working with you. I know that's a sentiment that has been echoed since your announcement and to me and by government senators, by Labor senators and others that you'll be missed. Uh, the Greens certainly need to think carefully in terms of your replacement as whip and making sure uh, that, uh, that uh, somebody brings the same sense of how to get things done while standing up for uh, your values at the same time and getting that balance right as you've done. So good luck, all the best, and uh, and I'm sure that we will keep hearing those uh, those passionate views of yours from outside of the Senate chamber uh, as somebody of, uh, of your beliefs will no doubt continue to do so. Thank you. Senator Keneally. Thank you, Mr President. I rise on behalf of the opposition to acknowledge the valedictory remarks of Senator Rachel Seward and to reflect on her contribution to the Senate. 
one of the longest serving current senators. First elected from Western Australia in 2004 and re-elected to two further times in 2010 and 2016, taking her seat on 1 July 2005, at the same time as our current Senate colleague, Senator Polly and Senator Stirl. Her tenure is extended beyond 16 years. At her heart, an environmentalist. With a background in agriculture and conservation, as a senator, she's made a particular impact in the area of social policy, where she's been a relentless advocate for some of Australia's most marginalized citizens, as well as the management of this chamber as the Australian Greens whip. Now, when Senator Seward arrived in the Senate, it wasn't the first time a Green senator from Western Australia had occupied the benches in this place. And as she noted in her first speech, and here in her almost last speech, and I quote, as the fourth in line of, of a determined Green women from the West to take on the Senate and progress the Green vision. Continuing this proud legacy of women from that state representing her party, Senator Seward paid particular tribute to the support she'd received from Dee Margetts who was present to witness her to begin the next chapter. It says something about the determination of Senator Seward that she's now spent more days as a senator than her three prede predecessors combined, today reaching 5,900 days of service. She joined the Senate, though, at one of the darkest times in its history, with the Howard government having secured a majority. Perhaps those on the other side don't think it was a dark time, but for those like Senator Seward and others, it was a frustration about the egregious exercise of power that included the abolition of half of the Senate's legislative and general purpose standing committees and the passage of the infamous work choices legislation and the sale of the remaining publicly owned component of Telstra among the policy missteps of the time. And it was a tough time for all non-government parties. Senator Seward joined three Greens colleagues, Senators Brown, Nettle, and Milne, and immediately took up duties as the Australian Greens whip in the Senate. And she has maintained her grip on the whip's role for the entirety of her 16 years as senator, a length of time I'm not sure we would wish to commit anyone to the task of whipping even a senator from the Greens. In all seriousness, we recognize the role of whips as a critical one in the management of the chamber. The Senate would not function effectively without the cooperation and the coordination between the senators who serve as whips, something I thank Senator Seward for her part in making happen. I will note the demands of her position have undoubtedly increased for her as the size of her party room has increased, but I'm pretty sure she's not complaining about that. Now, Senator Rachel Seward really did take on the Senate, and no, so, no more so is this the case than in the area of social policy and social justice, where Senator Seward has been a leader in advocating for those who are often discriminated against or on the margins of society. As she said in her first speech, she held a vision of community. And I note she just now quoted one part of that speech. I'd like to quote another. She says, a community extends beyond the borders of our neighborhood, suburb, or state, a community in which people care about each other and the future of our planet and act carefully and responsibly to ensure its ongoing success, a community that embraces diversity and understands that people living creative, fulfilling lives are more innovative and productive and will make a greater contribution to society. She identified the negative impact of government policies that were designed to undermine the ability of nonprofit organizations, such as community advocates, to advocate and lobby. She decried cuts to government services that outsourced welfare and expected volunteers to pick up the slack. She lamented attacks on the rights of workers, especially the least advantaged in our society, young people, women, those in low-paid work, casuals, and temporary workers. She promoted the work of indigenous leaders and was disappointed in the lack of support for First Nations communities to build active cultures that foster safe and healthy family environments. It's a source of ongoing frustration and disappointment for all of us on this side of the chamber that many of these issues of social justice remain unresolved and that some of these attacks are even being re-prosecuted today. 
Senator Seward has been most vocal in her advocacy for people on income support, especially with regard to the rate of New Start and its successor payment job seeker. She's similarly drawn the attention of the Senate time and again to the impact of Social Security policies on the everyday lives of many Australians, including in the areas of housing and homelessness and the cashless debit card. As chair of the Senate Community Affairs References Committee since 2009, another substantial tenure, she's been involved in significant inquiries, such as into past adoption practices, former child migrants, hearing health and suicide prevention. And as we've heard in the Senate this week, she's joined with Labor senators in bringing to light the shame of robo-debt and continue to highlight the detrimental effect of this policy on so many Australians. Senator Seward similarly brought the needs of Australians with a disability to the parliament, especially through the parliamentary committees on the National Disability Insurance Scheme. And just as she did in her first speech in this place, she's continued, continued to be a consistent voice in support of First Nations people and relentlessly called for reconciliation and for governments to address the causes of this disadvantage and empower them to improve their living conditions. The Senate has benefited from Senator Seward's tenacity and perseverance in always highlighting the impact of government policy on those in our community who have often battling to get a hearing, to get a fair go, and she's always been about uh, proposing alternative pathways. Senator Sewer, you said tonight that you feel that you've made some change. I say you've made a significant change, and you have given voice to the voiceless, and you've given hope to many, and you have made lasting change in this place. I will say, on a personal note, when I first came to know Senator Sewer, I thought of her as a firecracker, a burst of energy. She seems to have endless energy. And I will say, as someone who, along with Senator Seward, does frequent the gym, often very early in the morning, I won't reveal the names of the few other senators who we sometimes see there, but she does have endless energy. From 6.15 a.m. onward, Senator Seward never rests in order to bring a fair go to her fellow Australians. There's never been any doubt on whose side, whose side Senator Seward is on. Now, Senator Seward has chosen the timing of her departure from this place. She does so having made a substantial contribution as an advocate for some of Australia's most vulnerable people. I hope she leaves satisfied with what she's been able to accomplish and with energy and passion continue to advance the causes that she believes in for a fair and more just society. On behalf of the opposition, although I know many of my colleagues will wish to speak tonight as well, I acknowledge Senator Rachel Seward's service in the Senate and wish her well for the future. Yeah. Yeah. Senator McKenzie. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And I rise on behalf of the Nationals uh, with great pleasure to farewell Senator Seward. And not because she's a Green, but because she has served our nation and her community in Western Australia for 16 years in this place, and that's no easy task. And you have made an impressive contribution. You're well respected by all in this place, Senator Seward, uh, for your professionalism and the manner in the way you conduct your politics uh, and the consistency that you've done that and the way you've represented your values and your views and your community uh, across that time. It should come of no surprise that the National Party and the Greens are rarely in agreement on anything. Um, but I would like to commend Senator Seward uh, for having a particular focus and a um, lived experience of rural and regional Australia that she's brought to this place uh, and to all the conversations that she's had in and outside of this chamber. And that passion shines through. So not just a passion for the regions, uh, for ensuring that agriculture should be rightly recognised, uh, but also for getting yoga and strength training into the parliament uh, gym, I recall, many, many years ago. We got that done as well. Um, she also recognises, unlike, uh, unfortunately, some of her colleagues, obviously not another regional Australian there, uh, <laughs> Senator Hanson Young, but on, on that side of the chamber, regional Australia does deserve 
equitable access to health and to education, and you have been a champion of those uh, issues as well, because you understand that the regions are the engine room for the uh, economy. In fact, Senator Seawood has had a long service of representing the regions in the Senate. The committee is a long one, but two that I have served alongside of you in uh, um, the Senate Standing Committee on Community Affairs and uh, Rural Regional Affairs and Transport. On the 11th of August in 2005, Senator Seawitt delivered her first speech, and with a Bachelor of Science in Ag and a background as a research office with, officer with the State Department of Agriculture, uh, she said, I am determined to ensure our rural communities can continue to survive and, in fact, thrive. And uh, that is uh, a message that uh, the National Party obviously shares and wants to assist with. People from right across Australia have benefited from your efforts, Senator Seawitt, not just those in WA, and we're grateful. Uh, there were occasions when Senator Seawitt backed our farmers, and the backpack attacks was not the first time uh, that the Nats and the Greens joined forces uh, to support rural and regional Australia. On the 13th of November in 2013, Senator Seawitt uh, said, We get to Grain Corp. This is one area where I agree with the Nationals. I'm very concerned about the takeover by ADM of Grain Corp, and I agree with the Nationals. I can't say it enough, but you, you said it first. Uh, it does present problems for our farmers. We should restart the inquiry into this takeover. We're concerned that it will be anti-competitive, that it will have a negative impact on our farmers, and we urge the Nationals to continue their opposition to this takeover. Well, guess what? The Nationals did. And Treasurer at the time, Joe Hockey, uh, made the right decision in blocking that takeover bid. So we thank you for the strong arm over there of the Greens on behalf of Regional Australia, Senator Seawitt. We're going to miss you, I think. We're going to miss you. Um, I think that was a, a great example of uh, party politics not getting in the way of doing the right thing. And as I said, I've served with Senator Seawitt on, on RAP, but also on community affairs. And I, I came into that role when we we're in opposition. Uh, with two other powerhouses, uh, Senator Susie Boyce and Senator, uh, former Senator Claire Moore. Now, though that dynamic trio taught me a lot about this place. Um, they focused on being collaborative, on driving consensus when possible, without compromising your views and values. And uh, I'm going to get emotional now. Um, it was uh, a, a great pleasure as a new senator, um, someone who hadn't been in politics uh, as a staff or anything, to come and learn from the three of you. And I do think, as you said, part of our work should be about finding common space, because that's where most of Australia, who sent us all here, is. And Rachel, the way you've approached your work. Um, has sought to always find that where you could. And I think uh, all of us could do better to find more of that space. I think over the decade I've been here, that's something uh, that I hope we're not losing. Um, but you did, and the Senate provides us all with that unique opportunity. Um, that forced adoptions inquiry uh, was incredibly powerful and showed me what you can do from the Senate you don't have to be in government. You don't have to be a minister. You just have to find consensus, uh, like-minded individuals, go with the evidence. And uh, what we're all able to achieve out of that, I think, on behalf of those women uh, and their children, I think was uh, quite incredible. It will stay with me my entire life um, as something very, very powerful. Um, your pragmatic, grounded approach that you brought to RAT. Uh, as an ag scientist, I think I, I can never uh, thank you enough for that. Wherever life after the Senate takes you, um, Senator, I know that uh, you'll embrace it broadly, robustly, with both hands. Uh, you'll squeeze every bit of uh, joy out of that. Um, I wish you all the very best on behalf of my party, but also on behalf personally um, and on behalf of Regional Australia. Thank you very much for your service. Go well. Thank you, Senator Mackenzie. I think we're going to Senator Waters. Senator Waters. Thanks very much.
Thank you, Deputy President. And uh, I rise to speak in awe of Senator Rachel Seawitt. And it's so sad that we can't all be there with you in person. Um, it, each of our senators will be making their own contribution. So I hope you've got enough tissues there, Rach. Um, and Adam, of course, sends his love. I'm going to be sharing some words um, from him and a few other of your former colleagues in this contribution. But after 16 years of contribution to our polity, to our parliament, to society, um, we are going to miss you so very, very much. And there are such big shoes to fill, even though you have really tiny feet and very pointy shoes. <laughs> um, this place isn't going to be the same without you, Rach, and you are held in the absolute highest regard uh, by not only all of our party room and our party members, but by everyone in this chamber, as you've just heard and as you will hear um, for hopefully a long while yet tonight. Uh, your, your work ethic is just phenomenal. Your integrity is unquestionable. Your honesty, the respect with which, with which you treat others, um, your dedication, your tenacity, your relentlessness is legendary and um, the way you do politics, Rach, is a lesson to how we should all do politics, in my opinion. Um, we are going to miss you so desperately. You can be so proud of what you've achieved after a lifetime of service, not just in this role, but in your previous careers as well. Um, it's service to the planet, service to its people, and you have now well and truly earned the right to have some of your time and some of your life back uh, your family needs you now and you need that time also. And we know that you have a very exciting chapter coming up. Um, you're so well loved that we are going to share around um, some of the contributions and some of your former colleagues have asked that I uh, share some words from them to you. Um, there's, there's too many of them. So Senator McKim will be sharing um, some messages from Christine and Bob. Um, and I've got messages from Adam and Richard and Scotty. So I'll start off with um, with Greens leader Adam Bant, who of course would be here, but he's in lockdown in Melbourne. Um, says, For 16 years, Rachel has been a force of nature in the Senate and she has made an immeasurable contribution to the community, to the Greens movement and to Australian democracy. Rachel is recognised across the political spectrum as being one of the most hardworking and dedicated senators this place has seen. She is a tireless campaigner, and no matter what is thrown in her way, she will keep fighting for justice for people and the planet. Her time in Parliament has been shaped by her belief that when the people in Parliament work for their community, we can do powerful things together. Rachel has been instrumental in fighting for a fairer income support system and has humanised the experiences of people on income support, ensuring their voices are heard. She has led the campaign to increase New Start and Job Seeker in the Parliament. It goes on, Rachel has been the leading voice in Parliament fighting the punitive measures successive governments have imposed on some of the most vulnerable in our community, including cuts to single parenting payments, um, the Northern Territory intervention, income management and the cashless debit card, work for the doll, the community development program and the woefully low rates of income support. Rachel has campaigned alongside the community for justice for the victims of the illegal robo-debt scheme and demanded the ministers responsible be held to account. Rachel chaired and referred the robo-debt debacle to the Senate inquiry in 2017 and again in 2019. He continues, she has been the chair of the Senate Community Affairs References Committee for 12 years, where she has chaired and referred issues such as past adoption practices, thank you for that, former child migrants, hearing health, suicide prevention, the violent abuse and neglect of disabled people, definite detention of people with cognitive and psychiatric impairment in Australia, the aged care sector workforce, out of home care, grandparent carers, income inequality and robo debt. She was a driving force behind the forced adoptions inquiry and was instrumental in securing a national apology to mothers and their children. They to be proud of indeed. Um, Adam continues, Rachel was one of the first politicians to campaign for a royal commission into the violent abuse and neglect of disabled people, pursuing a royal commission since 2015, when it was a key recommendation of the Senate inquiry. In 2012, she made history by introducing a private member's bill into the Senate to help address petrol sniffing in the Northern Territory, which passed the parliament and became law. 
Rachel played a key role in the community campaign which stopped a major Woodside gas hub at James Price Point in North uh, WA. And he says, I'm sure her persistent presence at estimates will be missed by many, but perhaps not by um, the public servants that you have grilled over the years, Rach. Um, I'll continue on with Adam's um, comments here. Rachel has been the only Greens whip and the Greens spokesperson on family and community services, First Nations issues, ageing, mental health, health, healthy oceans, agriculture and industrial relations. Before being elected to the Senate in 2005, as the fourth in a long line of strong green women senators from the West, Rachel, Se uh, Rachel Seward spent 16 years as the coordinator of the Conservation Council of WA and played a role in a number of national and state forums tackling pressing environmental and social justice issues, including the World Heritage Listing of Shark Bay. He finishes, it goes without saying that Rachel's departure is a huge loss to the Senate and the Australian community. Now, another former leader of our wonderful party, dear Richard Di Natale, also wants to share this with you, Rach. Um, Richard says, Rachel, a huge thank you for fighting so hard for so long for people who don't have a voice. You will be remembered for your work to help people out of work live with some dignity, for your work with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and for campaigns like James Price Point. I'll remember you as a friend. Good luck on the other side. I can highly recommend it. <laughs> He's doing well, as you know. Um, and lastly, from the senator on to the senatrix, a message from Scotty, former Senator Scott Ludlam. He says, this place has never known anyone as fierce, tenacious, smart and grounded as Senator Rachel Seward. To say her voice will be missed in here would be an understatement because her voice has been raised for so many people sidelined and shut out of this place. From day one, 16 years until today, it's been rage against the machine. Thank you for everything, he says. Um, Rach, your work will live on. Um, your 16 years in this chamber will live on for many years in the successes that you have driven and achieved. Um, and I've already detailed through the words of, of our leaders and former leaders the impact that you've had in so many policy areas. Um, but I want to really briefly reflect on how much I value you as a friend and a confidant in this place. Um, and I want to um, remember to you some of the weird and wonderful experiences that we've shared in this bizarre um, and privileged role that we've that we've had um, from the very early days campaigning against the Traveston Dam before I was um, before I had the honour of being a senator for Queensland, um, campaigning against that dam that was proposed for the Mary River, which we successfully stopped, Rach, in, in part, no doubt, because of you um, and those uh, beautiful places and wonderful farmers that we spoke with in Gympie. The tour throughout WA that we did opposing gas fracking, um, which sadly we will continue to have to fly, um, but flying in that tiny, tiny little plane um, out of Broome over the Canning Basin, um, where you, me, and Scott had all inadvertently worn exactly the same thing and uh, looked somewhat like Mormons on the day, um, to the shared committee trips that we did um, on the Northern Australia Committee um, out the back of Burke and then some. Um, to our trips to Bundaberg and Harvey Bay opposing the cashless debit card. Um, to that beautiful, joyful day of your wedding that I was so blessed um, to share in the joy of with you, as, as many of our colleagues did as well. Uh, to standing with you at a press conference in Perth to support your re-election um, when I was actually secretly pregnant and for the first time was doing a press conference without coffee um, and welcomed everyone to Cairns. Uh, which you kindly corrected me that no, we're in fact in Perth. Um, to all of the wonderful chats that we've had um, in the chamber and on our walks home or over dinner at coffee about terrible sci-fi, um, about about food, about your family, about your skiing and your paddleboarding prowess, about Fluff's latest surfboard lighting design and and shark deterrent um, amazing paraphernalia. Um, to your aspiration to ensure the protection of biodiversity, including the spiral shitfish, which I believe it is um, incumbent upon us to uh, have entered into the Hansard Annals for history to recall. For all of those times and more, Rach, um, we will miss you so very, very dearly. I, I actually can't imagine the place without you. And of course, we'll do our best without you. And um, the wonderful Dorinda Cox will soon be a senator for WA in your stead. And 
fantastic Senator Nick McKim will, will soon be our whip. Um, but there's no one like you, Rach, and um, our team will miss you so desperately much. And we wish you all the very best. And thank you so very much, everything that you've done for the wonderful party that you represent and for the values that we all share. Esther Black, and we'll miss you very much. Thank you, Senator Waters. I think we're going to Senator Lambie. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy President. Um, gee, Rach, well, they're all going on about how, how hard you work. I just don't think they've called it right. Mate, let's be honest, you're like a bloody Trojan horse. I've never seen anything like it. I mean, not even I can keep up with you. I'll be honest with you. I tell you, I have, I, it is going to, you are going to leave a massive big gap up there because people knowing social services like you do right across the board. Uh, is absolutely amazing. You've actually either got to live through it or you've got to th sit through a lot of committees and listen to a lot of people. Uh, and that is really hard to find uh, people up there in that circle. Uh, and I don't mean to go at other people. I'm not doing that over um, a valedictory speech. But bottom line is uh, life experience is missing and Rachel seems to have a lot of it, uh, whether that's because she's done a homework, because of a background, uh, whatever. But you will be really, really sadly missed because trying to get those voices up there um, for those millions of Australians and there are millions of vulnerable Australians out there. So I know you know that. There's some in there that don't. Uh, there is a lot of them and it's going to get worse. And I think your voice is going to be really, really deeply missed. Uh, look, I'm not going to take up much time. Um, you know, I'm in awe of you too. It's been fabulous to be able to have the opportunity to sit down um, and have you next to me um, since I've been up there. I have to say, I, I do blame Christine Milne for that though, just so I don't want to blame myself or you because you see, I used to lean on her when she was there and I asked her when she left, could she put somebody in there that knows procedure? And unfortunately you got that seat, right? So blame Christine, that's my first point of call. My second one is, and I do ask before I, uh, before I let you go, is that uh, whoever you're gonna put in that seat, can you please make sure that they need procedure? Otherwise, if you're expecting me to teach some procedure, I'm sure everything's going to get really, really ugly in there really quickly. So once again, look, I've, I've worked on you with committees. You have been fabulous. Um, you take the politics out of policies, girlfriend. You are really going to be sadly missed, and so is your knowledge. So thank you for all the help that you've given me over the years. But um, and my door's always open. You've got me on speed dial. You know that. If you need anything, you call me. But thank you so much. Thank you for everything. Thank you, Senator Lambie. Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy President. Well, 16 years as a senator travelling backwards and forwards from Western Australia, Rachel, is a pretty phenomenal task. I don't think those of us that live on this side of the country actually recognise the additional toll uh, that, that that travel takes on you. So um, to have done it for 16 years in, uh, in representing your state, I think is an absolute, um, you, know, you should be absolutely commended for it. And I take your hat off. I mean, I get really tired flying all the way back to South Australia, so I can't imagine what it's like when you fly back to Western Australia. But um, I mean, I know you've had a very broad range of things that you've been interested in this place. But in my time, particularly, uh, first of all, in rural and regional affairs, but more recently as the Minister for Social Services, to see your extraordinary passion in areas of health and aged care, um, caring about Indigenous Australians. Uh, and, and I suppose particularly your, just your extraordinary compassion for more vulnerable Australians, Australians that perhaps need a little bit more help than other Australians. And you know, you have always been the person that has stood up for those people that maybe haven't been able to have a voice of their own, and you've been their voice. And um, you know, I think it is, you know, it's, it's an extraordinary thing for you to be able to take away from this place the things that you have been able to do for Australians that haven't been able to do it for themselves. And so. Um, I don't think any of us could possibly um, underestimate um, how many Australians have benefited from your voice. Um, we don't always agree, but I have to say I, I think many Australians would probably be surprised how many times we do agree. Um, and the working relationship that I've had with you over the time, particularly in these last two years, has, has been absolutely phenomenal. And I just wanted to actually mention one area of work that we have done together. Um, and I'm really pleased that the culmination of much of your effort will be realised um, before you go, but we will still continue afterwards, and that's been the National Redress Scheme. Um, you know, your constant voice of, of wisdom, um, your understanding of, of the issue 
has informed the development of a scheme, which we all admit wasn't a perfect in the first place. But every day that we've been able to work together to improve that scheme, and I think now we're introducing legislation tomorrow um, that will start the first tranche of reforms on the scheme. Um, very importantly, the advance payments for people who are, are, are elderly or, or um, likely, sadly, to die sooner than. Uh, than uh, the scheme may be able to respond to them, that we were actually able to give them. Because we know that the $10,000 is really not the important bit. The important bit is that by doing that we're saying, we're listening to you, we believe you. So I'm, I'm really pleased that we've been able to do that. But the one thing I'd say that, agree or disagree, nobody could ever question your motivation. Your motivation has always been pure. Um, I'm not sure all of us in this place can perhaps be uh, to claim to have the kind of of, uh, of purity of motivation that you do. The other thing I think that is probably one of the hallmarks of your time here is you are always across your brief. Your understanding of the technical detail terrified me when I first became the Minister for Social Services. I'd say, I don't care who I get a question from, just not one from Rachel, because Rachel is more likely to understand way more about my portfolio uh, than I do. And I have to say, in the first few months of my job, my office used to say, Watch Rachel. She's the canary in the coal mine. If Rachel's chasing something, there's sure to be something on the other end of it. Um, and you actually have taught me an awful lot about where to, where to chase something to make sure that we get to the salient issue that needs to be dealt with. Um, the other thing, and I think Senator Birmingham raised it, you're not somebody for a media grab. You're not somebody for a gotcha moment. You go into everything you do, whether it be a committee, whether it be in this chamber, whether it be in estimates, you're actually prosecuting the issue. You never play the player. You always play the ball. And I think that is an absolute commendable um, attribute. But as I said, you've always sought to represent and project the voices of your constituents and never your own. And I think the ability for you to have done that and your constant commitment to doing that, as I said earlier on, has meant that so many Australians have had a voice that they otherwise wouldn't have had. I mean, you've been tireless, you've been dedicated. Um, your, your advocacy on behalf of the most uh, vulnerable is something that I don't know that we'll ever see in this place um, again, although hopefully we do. Um, and also the respectful way in which you engage with everybody in this chamber, whether it be those that you disagree with, those that you agree with, the respect that you show to the attendants and everybody else that you come into contact with this, in this building is an absolute testament to your character, your personality. Uh, and I think everybody here has got to miss that and, and also your uh, cheeky way of, of dealing with things. But you've made a huge contribution. You can leave this place knowing that you have done a lot. Um, I think if all of us could leave this place having achieved as much as you have, then I think we would all have every reason to hold our heads up high and be extremely proud. But Rachel, look, I wish you all the best. I hope that paddleboard is all shined up and ready to go when you get back to Western Australia. But I'm also <laughs> but I'm also equally sure this is not the last that we've heard of Rachel Seawitt. I'm sure we'll see your head popping up frequently advocating on behalf of the people that you believe need a voice. So go with our blessings. Thank you so much for the friendship you've shown me. Um, it has been an absolute honour to work with you and good luck. Thank you, Senator Rustin. Senator O'Neill. Thank you very much. And I have to wonder how Senator Seawitt is sitting, sitting there and feeling at the moment. It's just sort of after all the years of slings and arrows that you know sort of are a part of this place to finally hear that people think you're a pretty good person, Rachel. It's kind of a, it must be a, a, a profoundly interesting moment to be sitting here experiencing that. I, I just want to reflect briefly on your contribution, you know, to hear your voice um, and the particular tenor of your, of your review of your 16 years here, you know, a voice thick with emotion because you care about what you do, which has been reflected by everybody who's made a contribution so far. And to have been serving in this place about which people have become sadly increasingly cynical with not a skerrick of cynicism in your voice is just a testimony to how resilient you are and how much integrity has been part of what you have brought to your role and what you've continued to model here for, for many senators and members of parliament who could well and truly take a leaf out of your book in terms of a model of deep service for community, because that is exactly what you've, you've given. Um, and of course, you, you did indulge yourself in a, a very brief record of your service, but that again just reveals the humility that you bring to the task that you've undertaken here. Um, I also note that 
your comments tonight were somewhat tempered by a bit of a sorrowful statement about the things that were unable to be achieved, and in particular your passion for you know, the, the challenge of our time, the, the red alert, the, the climate change reality. That is just so much a part of this time in which we live, and I know that you care about that so much as I do for the next generation and what the impact is. And I, I also uh, stand with you in knowing that there is capacity in this institution to make a change that is material. And, uh, and you acknowledge that, that, that one period of time under the leadership of another great woman uh, from a different party, my party, the Labor Party, the, the former Prime Minister, Julia Gillard. Um, and I have in my drawer the actual first document of when that legislation came in, and I've got it signed by the four ministers who introduced it. Because when that happened, I knew that was a day that we could make a change. And it is heartbreaking sometimes to put all that effort in and get to a point and have it pulled apart. But you know, incrementally, these things, even if we're sorrowful about not having achieved the goals as easily as we might have, if there wasn't such a miserly vision of that issue, um, you have been part of bringing to bear that pressure to move us towards a better place. And uh, I'm sure that the task will get done eventually, Rachel, and it'll be on the back of efforts of people like yourself, but particularly the passion, energy and integrity that you've brought to that, to that issue is absolutely notable and noted. Um, I, I pick up on the remarks um, of Senator uh, Waters about your work at Estimates. And I have not in my entire time here in the Senate seen um, public servants so aware that uh, they're going to have to provide an A3 sheet profoundly densely printed with every single piece of detail about how many people have come or gone from a particular program. And you've just got them so well uh, trained. Well, that's probably a bit, a bit of a, a pejorative term. So well um, prepared for the degree of scrutiny and integrity that you're going to bring to the work that you do, both in estimates and in the committee work that you know, I've been so privileged to share in with you. That is quite some achievement. Now, it's probably not going to make the front page of a newspaper, but it's exactly the kind of thing that should, because that is the real work of the Senate, reviewing the work of government with care and, and kindness and compassion and a standard of professionalism that just is replete in everything that you do. I wanted to acknowledge the service of the great state of Western Australia. It is a beautiful state, and I spent quite some time um, in the year that I took off with my husband and we travelled all around the country before we, had before we were grey. Uh, we were nomads and we were very fit and healthy and we had the most wonderful time in Western Australia. And you've been a champion for that state and you've brought a very powerful perspective from the whole state, not just Perth, but uh, you know, the southern areas where you live, but also you're roaming across that state and the, and the very real perspectives um, and the long-standing relationships you've had with people of the First Nations communities across that, of, across that country. Uh, is absolutely known, acknowledged, and you've done great work in that area as well. Um, a lot of people in this place draw attention to the points at which we disagree. And of course we do disagree, but this is democracy in action. It's a choir of different voices. Sometimes we really get it right and we sound harmonious, but discord's part of our journey to understanding what that is. And you know, where there's disagreement, that is a sign of a healthy democracy. And I think that you've stood and had a strident voice when it's required. And as many have reflected, you found the harmonious points whenever you could. Uh, and that's a remarkable trait of character for you. Um, you bring to the debate in this place your passion, care, detail and information. But uh, it's in the hearings that I've been able to be with you, whether you've been sharing or we've just been participants, that you really see you know, who, you, who you are and um, how you lift and encourage people so completely unfamiliar with the parliamentary processes into the place. You have, as Senator Lambie said, a really rich and practical knowledge of the standing orders of this place and how it runs. But you are one of the few people who have never used that as a weapon against people who don't. In fact, your understanding of it makes you more respectful of those who don't, and that comes through in everything that you do. 
you're a person who lives your values. And I'm very pleased to have shared with you quite a few meals after hearings as we've been on the road in all sorts of places. Um, and I think perhaps the word for in integrity means to me that somebody who lives their values, and that is exactly what you do. Uh, in terms of how the Greens are going to go with Senator McKim doing the job that you've been doing as the whip, I just, oh my gosh, he's he's going to find it incredibly difficult to, to do. I see you marshalling the troops over there. I'm always impressed. You do it discreetly, but you do it very, very, pro uh, very, very powerfully. And uh, everybody knows that they can trust your word and your direction and your insight. And, and that is a great tribute to you as well. Um, I just want to reflect briefly on a, a, a tour that we took, a mental health tour. We, we did it in two ways. One part was in Australia when we were looking uh, at access to mental health services for the country. And, and, and like Larissa, uh, Senator Waters, uh, we were in small planes on a sort of a milk run across the north of the country to see what we saw. And uh, you know, I'm sure that you would remember some of the evidence where people had so little faith in being able to access any decent health care because there's so many locums coming through that they just called all health professionals white Toyotas. Once something like that washes over your experience, it's hard to forget. And discussing that and so many other things over dinner with you, getting to know one another, that's what is one of the great things about being in the Senate, this committee work that we do where we actually get to know each other's stories and find out about each, each other, and, and that helps us do our work more collegially. Uh, we also, um, and I haven't checked with him, but I'm sure he won't mind me acknowledging what a significant trip uh, this was on behalf of the Australian people. It was our research tour with our colleague who co-chairs the Friendship of Mental Health Group here, um, Andrew Wallace, from the other place. Um, we, we work together as Team Australia, and that's one of the things that I'm always proud about when uh, we do, in the olden days, get to travel overseas, and hopefully sometime in the future, the near future, we can hope. Um, to work as Team Australia with you to really pick the eyes out of best practice in other contexts, understand that and bring it back and try and bring that to bear in our committee work and to inform the government has is, is been something that I've been very honoured to, to do with you. Um, and I just want to acknowledge uh, the drip feeding of some of this pressure, uh, particularly when I was in the role as the Assistant Shadow for Mental Health, um, along with Mr Wallace and yourself, getting to that point with eating disorders where we were able to firmly recommend that there would be a minimum of 20 consultations necessary to help with eating disorders, actually did imprint, and Minister Hunt did bring that in. And with that as a floor, we have seen during COVID that capacity for people to access mental health services, a minimum of 20. That was our work. It did take the minister to listen and implement, but it wouldn't have happened without the sort of passion and energy that brought you brought to the task. So I'm so proud to have been able to help with that alongside of you. Um, of course, there's the Centrelink compliance, the sort of lovely name of what is really the robo debt debacle, and uh, it's been great giving you know a hit from the left and a hit from the right over here onto the government to try and get them to pay attention to the fact that they inflicted this debt on their own people, and we cannot let it continue. Um, I've been so glad to stand with you and fight that fight, and I've given you my word and I give it here publicly. I will not let that go, Senator Seawish. That deserves a much better response from the government than we've seen so far. Four rejections, that's just the beginning. We're going to keep pushing this because the Australian people deserve to know, and I will, um, I will channel your determination and uh, perseverance to make sure that we get a good outcome at, on, on that matter. Uh, finally, I want to um, just acknowledge uh, what a family person you are and how much of a challenge it has been, I'm sure, for your family to give you up, to provide you in service of the nation on all those flights over 16 years, everywhere that you've been and the service here in this particular place in the Senate of the country that we're so proud to call our home. Um, your care and compassion for them, uh, I'm sure, is absolutely reflected in what you do here. And I know that you feel 
like all, I don't know if it's, if it's a, just a deep guilt of being a serving senator or if there's a gender dimension to it as well, but the, to be away. You talked about missing your son's you know, end of school ball and seeing him in all his finery. There are great sacrifices, but your family have enabled you, supported you, and I acknowledge them for doing that, and I acknowledge the sacrifice that you have undertaken in getting what you've given to this place. So finally, can I um, wish you a safe return to them after 16 years? Can I wish for you very deep, powdery snow when you resume your skiing career? Um, and I hope it's for many, many more weeks than you've been able to do as you've sandwiched it in between your service in this place. And can I wish you the very best of health into the future? Thank you. Thank you, Senator O'Neill. Senator Hanson Young. Uh, thank you. Well, um, what lovely uh, comments and reflection on the contribution you've made in this place, Rach. I, um, it must be really weird sitting here and, <laughs> and listening to, to, to everybody just um, piling on their love and admiration and respect. Um, firstly, I just want to say um, you've been a fierce whip. Uh, you know, I've only missed three votes in 13 years that you've been the whip. I just want to put that on the record because I learnt very early on that you don't, um, you don't mess up when Rachel uh, is in charge. Um, you have kept us uh, running a tight ship. Uh, we are a much better party room and a much better green force in this place because of the leadership that you show and that you have uh, steered. It hasn't always been easy. Um, we've had changes of leaders. You've had to train each one of them. <laughs> and um, you've done it um, just beautifully. You've trained uh, new senators who have come on board. And I think uh, everybody's had that experience of where they've shown up late to something or missed a vote or uh, didn't jump to speak when they should have. And um, I think all of our colleagues uh, know that um, you don't do it again. Um, Rachel makes sure that uh, you learn your lesson and you learn it once. Um, but your passion, your empathy, your strength, you know, I think in politics we often get uh, categorised as being either pragmatic and strong or emotional and bleeding heart. And you have proven that that is utter rubbish. You can be both empathetic and compassionate, come to an issue with pure emotion and integrity, but be ruthless and pragmatic about how you're going to get it done. And it's harder for women too to do that, and you've proven time and time and time again that those stereotypes are just rubbish. Thank you. The leadership as a woman in this place, I think um, we have to pay testament to. Uh, your, the, the approach you bring uh, to the debates internally and externally, I think um, uh, you've, you've just been an absolute role model. Uh, and over the years when um, you know, things have happened uh, uh, you know, in this place, I remember when you were here, when Cora was thrown out of the chamber. That was a baptism of fire for me. And um, you were there, right by my side, as a mum. And I'll never forget that. Thank you. The testament of your approach is clearly reflected in this place tonight, of people of all sides just respecting the way you engage, your commitment. We've heard the words of honesty and integrity, uh, but you know what? I think more than all of those things, everyone knows you are the hardest worker in this place. Everyone knows that. There is n you never miss. Uh, you're always across your brief. Uh, you've chaired that committee, uh, community affairs, because even though it is um, has one of the biggest workloads, if not the biggest workload, uh, in this place of legislation coming forward. But the issues that you deal with take such a toll, and uh, mm -hmm. 
you've just, you've, you have never even wavered uh, in your commitment to that work, and that is incredibly uh, inspiring and a, uh, and a model for, for all of us. Um, I also want to say that you know, we've got now um, Senator Thorpe as our first uh, First Nations woman in our team and the first First Nations representative from Victoria. Uh, I don't think we would have had Senator Thorpe and Lydia in this team um, necessarily without your leadership internally in our party as well as in the chamber. Um, uh, and the fact that you are, you've committed so much of your life work uh, and work in this place to giving First Nations a voice and a voice for themselves uh, is just incredible. And it is just it, that's all summed up by the fact that uh, Dorinda Cox is coming in to replace you. You were determined that an, a strong Aboriginal woman, First Nations leader, would come in following you, and you've done it. And I'm not convinced that um, uh, you know others may um, have um, aims and aspirations to do things like that, but you've actually delivered it. And I think that that is a, a wonderful testament to you. So thank you. Um, others have already mentioned the uh, adoptions inquiry. Oh, the emotion uh, as that inquiry went, did its work that you led was incredible. Um, the emotion in, in this place uh, on the day was incredible. But I know from talking to you over the months and years as the evidence was being um, gathered, just the toll that that was taking uh, and hearing people's stories and feeling them deeply and having that sense of responsibility that you had to do something with it. Because we can set up inquiries and we can have people come and tell their stories and we can take, uh, give them the sense of, uh, of trust, but you took it with pure responsibility that you knew something had to come from it. This wasn't just about a tick and flick process. Um, and I think um, oh, many, many people uh, are indebted to you because of that. So um, on behalf of all of them, thank you. Um, we are going to miss you. Uh, Senator McKim um, has big shoes to fill, and uh, I'll put it here first. I, I think um, I reckon it'll be a bit rough in the beginning. I think um, I, I think there'll be a, there, there'll be a bit of um, mess as we muddle through, but uh, that's because no one can no one can replace you. And no one's going to be able to do the job the way you do it. So, um, good luck, Nick. <laughs> um, your care and the absolute understanding that you have for the dignity of people who are vulnerable. Um, I, I don't, I think it's very hard to find anybody in this place that can match that, Rachel. You don't look down your nose ever at people. You've never made people feel less than they are and because of the position that you hold. Um, and uh, you know, it's, it, the parliament can be a pretty overwhelming place at times, and inviting people in to give evidence or offering support to them or saying that you know, you're going to uh, work in the parliament for them. Um, you haven't just taken their stories and given them a voice. You've welcomed them into this institution with open arms. And you have, a, you have joined that connection between us as a parliament, you as a legislator, and them as the people that we are here for. This door might close, but in your heart and your mind, it's never closed. And uh, I think that's the great, the great service that you've brought to this place and to the people of Australia and to the most vulnerable in our community. I'm going to miss you a lot, Rachel. Thank you.
Thank you, Senator Hanson Young. Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Deputy President. And I too stand to pay tribute to my fellow West Australian Senator and colleague, Senator Rachel Seawitt. Um, and I associate myself with all of the comments uh, that we've heard so far from right across this chamber in what is a very fitting acknowledgement of your service to the Senate and also to our nation. I was very saddened, genuinely very saddened, to hear of your decision to leave after 16 years. But then conversely, I was really happy for you as well after 16 years of crossing the Nullarbor. And one of my first uh, recollections of Senator Seawitt was crossing the Nullarbor time and time again for committee hearings and would do it twice in one day to attend a committee hearing, you know, which is just a sign of the dedication and passion and commitment that you have, but also the sacrifices your family have made uh, for everything that you've done. Um, everyone in this place knows, and we've heard tonight about your, your passion, your commitment, your respect for the dignity of humanity, um, you know, wherever and wherever you find it. Um, I've also greatly respected and sometimes been the benefactor of your uh, uh, very uh, deep honesty um, and your very loud <laughs> uh, honesty, but holding us now on this side of the chamber to account. Um, but as everybody else here has said, it is absolutely clear that you have always been driven by your passion um, for justice and your commitment uh, to, to people and to, to what you believe in. Uh, like other people here, um, it took me about five minutes in this place to also see your incredible knowledge and the width and the depth of your knowledge in social policy. Um, it, whether it's in this chamber, whether it's at committees, whether it's estimates. And I've sat again on the other side of the table and uh, also with uh, officials who are suitably uh, prepared because they know the level of which that you come and you've always come to the table. But you also, because of that, do speak with authority uh, on the matters and when you speak, we all listen. Sometimes we have no choice to listen <laughs> with the passion and the, you know, the volume, but we always listen and we respect. And as uh, Minister Rustin has said, is uh, you always uh, show us where to look, quite often before we even know that there is cause to look at particular issues. Um, I've also admired your, and I don't understand how, how you have not only the work ethic, but the capacity to work and manage multiple uh, hearings um, and whipping and everything else that you do. And as you've pointed out, um, one of the dirty secrets that probably shouldn't be such a dirty secret and one of the absolute joys of serving and privilege of serving in this place is the collegiality between those on all sides of this chamber. Um, and while people wouldn't necessarily think that uh, Senator Seawitt and I have a lot in common, uh, given our positions on things and our, our party positions, um, you really, along with you know, the wonderful Claire Moore, uh, did show me that we can work together and we can find common ground uh, in our committee work to make a real difference uh, for Australians. And that is one of the many powerful things about this place. Um, we did find many, and as we've heard with you know, everyone else who's spoken, common ground on a number of issues. I just want to highlight three. Um, I'm incredibly grateful that you uh, supported my very first inquiry I put forward into young people in aged care. And again, that is an inquiry that made a huge difference to the lives of thousands of people in disabilities who had been consigned to life in an aged care facility simply because they were disabled and there was nowhere else for them to go. I'm particularly proud now that I have carriage of that and I feel a great sense of responsibility for that and so I'd like to thank you uh, for that. Um, we have some unfinished business in the uh, interrupted inquiry into uh, the plight of Australians with Lyme disease and the disgraceful way that I believe and we share a belief that they are, not, they are not heard, they are not seen and they are certainly not getting the treatment they deserve. So that is still unfinished business for me and so I will be taking so take that forward. Probably the one that, that possibly bemused you the most 
Um, but I'm very grateful for your support as a senator for Western Australia. It was the inquiry into Western Force, <laughs> um, and I, again, you, you had faith, and you said, "Okay, we'll have a look into this." And while we couldn't change the outcome of the, disgrace, you know, of the disgraceful behaviour that we just discovered from Rugby Australia, you know, Rugby, Rugby Australia, we made a huge difference to tens of thousands of Western Australians and to the players in getting answers on what had happened uh, to their much-beloved team. So, Rachel, in, in conclusion, um, I've only ever experienced this chamber with you in it, and not only with your leadership as the whip, um, but also with your leadership in community affairs and on social policy. And you have certainly inspired me and sometimes also made me want to be that better senator and that better person on a lot of these inquiries. The Senate will certainly be uh, the lesser, and I think we'll also be the lesser for not having you in, in the chamber. But as so many people have said, and I know we'll continue to say, you have made every single day of those, what was it, 5,000 odd days that you've been serving in the Senate. I thank you very much uh, for the dignity that you've brought to the Senate, and I think for the contribution you've made to our democracy as well. So I wish you and your family well in whatever you decide to do next, on and off the paddleboard. I know you'll do it with great passion, you'll do it with great commitment, and you'll do it you know, so that everybody will hear. So, Rachel, thank you for everything you've done. Thank you for what you've given to me in this place, and um, good luck. Senator Lyons. Thank you, Mr President. And um, I too rise to add my contributions to your service, Rachel, and uh, echo everything that's been said about you today. I was thinking earlier today of when um, you and I first met, and you won't remember this. Uh, I was at the union, uh, at United Workers' Union, and uh, there was some protest in Subiaco, and I want to say aged care, but it was outside the council chamber, so I don't know, maybe it was childcare. It was one or the other. And uh, we had a bunch of members there, and uh, we were protesting, and you came along, um, and you, you must have just seen us there, or maybe you'd heard about the strike, and you offered your support. And um, you know, you know me, I'm dyed in the wool labour, and I thought, hmm. But I was really impressed that you'd taken the time to come along and, and support the members. So whether it was aged care or childcare, you were there supporting us. Um, the next time I met you was again when I was still at the union and I was the person that had responsibility for getting those um, reforms through, which Mark Butler did as, when he was minister, the Living Longer, Living Better. And um, it was my job to take aged care workers uh, to meet you and to lobby you. Um, I didn't know what your view was, but now knowing you uh, much, you know, many years after that, I'm sure that you did support. Um, you probably always supported the reforms, but nevertheless, we had a job to do, and that was to, you know, harangue you to death with aged care workers uh, who came to um, tell you their stories on more than one occasion, I'm sure. Um, so, so thank you for that. I want to echo the other things that have been said about you. You, you are a woman of great humanity. You, your integrity comes through in everything that you do, as does your advocacy and passion. Your drive and commitment that everyone has spoken to about tonight. But the, the two areas that um, our lives and paths tend to cross are on First Nations issues. And uh, I'm sure that uh, secretly you're quite pleased that the Labor Party, Party finally got there on the cashless debit card. Thank goodness. Um, and uh, I know that we've often shared um, platforms at protest meetings outside of the Senate. Um, but we've also shared a lot of work um, on Senate committees. And um, yes, Senator Reynolds just reminded me of that Western Force one. I think I had to be there reluctantly because there wasn't very much of that committee uh, work I enjoyed at all, but the rest of it's been good. Um, we've had, we've, I think I've got to know you better um, th this year and last year on the, all the spa flights that we shared. We, were, we usually sat together and had great chats about family and uh, all things outside of the Senate, really, as just a couple of women that had a lot of interests in common. I look forward to your journey on uh, building your house 
I know we had lots of chats about that. You will be missed in this Senate, um, your advocacy particularly and your passion, but I know that um, you've served Australians well and uh, you'll continue to do that in um, whatever uh, you do next. And I'm sure Chris will <coughs> welcome having you home. Um, well, it might take a bit of time getting used to it, because sometimes our partners, even though they miss us, I think they get a bit used to us coming and going, so that'll be an adjustment. The FIFO worker is FIFO no longer. Um, all the best, and thank you for your absolute commitment to this place and, and, uh, and to ordinary Australians who do it tough. Senator McKim, remotely. Sorry, Senator McKim, we're missing you. If you're no, I, Senator McKim, what I'll do is I'll go to the next speaker to allow you to log in and log out again. That seems to be the, an effective. It does seem to happen towards the end of the day after we've had a lot of people online. Uh, Senator Brockman. Thank you, Mr. President. I'll just make sure my speaker is working. Uh, I won't take up much time of the chamber tonight. Uh, Rachel, I know you've got colleagues who are still waiting to speak. And I know that many people in this place have spent a lot more time than me with you here, and so I certainly want, want to give them the chance to speak tonight. However, I do rise to speak um, because you have made such a contribution to this place, and I think it is really important that we acknowledge that. Uh, I go back to 2000 and 2006, 2007, when I first started travelling to this place, and I don't really believe you remember me. but. Uh, I, I first met you, Senator Seawitt, uh, as policy director for the Pastoralists and Graziers Association. And I guess I came to this place as a pretty green individual uh, in, a, uh, in terms of the political process and politics. And I guess I had a rosy eyed view that everyone sitting on this side, uh, uh, not sure it was this side, oh yes, it was this side then. Uh, would be in favour of what I was ad advocating for and what the Pastoralists and Graziers Association was advocating for, and everybody on that side would be opposed. And uh, Senator Seawitt, you were one of the, my very clear memories of that period of someone who, because of your background, because of your background as a West Australian, as someone with experience in agricultural science, uh, experience out in the bush in Jeremungup in, in Western Australia and many other places, uh, who actually understood the issue. Uh, not very many people in this place actually did. And so my first experience of you was of completely putting on head those, I guess, green preconception, preconceptions about, uh, inexperienced preconceptions about what people would believe in this place. Uh, and then I came to the point where I realised that uh, some of my uh, national colleagues, uh, not colleagues at the time, some of, some of the nationals actually vigorously opposed what I was there representing. And even many in the Liberal Party were pretty wishy-washy about it all. And this is, of course, the, the ending of the export monopoly of, of wheat, the single desk, as it was called. But you had a very clear-eyed view of the economics of that. And I recognise that maybe we shouldn't always come to this place with preconceptions about what people are going to think. Then on entering this place as a senator, on uh, my first day on duty, I was given the, the chair of the uh, Community Affairs Legislation Committee and deputy chair of the Community Affairs References Committee. That says more about the lack of backbenchers in, in, uh, in the coalition than it says about my talents and skills. But it was, uh, was wonderful working with you for, that, for the year that I was on that committee. It wasn't a space I was particularly comfortable in. Uh, it, it wasn't a policy area where I had a great deal of knowledge. We uh, dealt with things in the, in the References Committee. Uh, such as the inquiry into transvaginal mesh and the inquiry into mitochondrial donation. Now, neither, neither of those have been brought up here tonight, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure they're not. Uh, you know, clearly, you've worked on a number of inquiries that have a great deal of import, um, but they were both inquiries where we managed, and you managed, as chair of that committee, to work through a process where we could highlight the issues, come to a unified position on a references committee report and advance the interests of two groups in that, in that situation, and we've heard of many more tonight, two groups who hadn't been heard, two groups whose 
uh, 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 issues needed to be much more widely ventilated and as a result of those two committees, two small, thing, two small things for us, two very big things for those people involved, but those issues were ventilated, they were heard, actions were taken. So I honour you, Senator Seward. I think you have done an amazing job in this place. I wish you all the best and your family for the future. Now I'll try Senator McKim again. Thank you, President. Um, I, thank you very much. And Rach, it's so sad that so many of your colleagues can't be with you personally this evening to, to support you and to show you personally just how much we love you and how much we're going to miss you. I, I really wish we could all be there with you. I'm going to begin by sharing some words for you from two friends of mine who are two really, really good friends of yours. Firstly, these words. Rachel is one of the most unsung heroes of progressive social action in our national parliament. She also had a big hand in freeing our southern hemisphere from the bloody scourge of whaling. Students of political botany looking for a flower in the swamp will do well to study the career of Greens Senator Rachel Seward. Those beautiful words are from former Senator and former leader of the Australian Greens, Bob Brown. And I'm sure you'll guess who the next words are from pretty early on. Rach, what can I add to all the accolades that you so deserve about your exemplary career in the Senate? We were elected together in 2004 and took up our seats when there were only four of us. Bob Brown, Kerry Nettle, you and I. You've been a relentless campaigner and a staunch, staunch advocate for the Greens and for our vision of a just world and a planet capable of sustaining life in the face of the global climate and biodiversity emergencies. Whether it's sharks or the forests or James Price Point or the Aboriginal petroglyphs of the Burrup, you've been there advocating for protection. You've travelled the length and breadth of the country to support Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and secured an important milestone by addressing petrol sniffing and securing non-aromatic opal fuel. You stood up courageously from day one against robo-debt and the cashless welfare card, and you were right. In your service to the parliament and the people of, the Tas and the people of Australia, it has been so special. In an age when people are so cynical about parliamentarians, you have demonstrated what integrity, fairness and commitment mean in your role as the Chair of Community Affairs Committee and also in your role as Greens Whip. One of the moments I treasure is the day in 2013 when Prime Minister Gillard delivered the apology to the people who suffered so deeply because of forced adoption practices. Rach, you moved for and drove that inquiry and chaired it, and you were there in the Great Hall to witness how much it meant to so many people. Your compassion and commitment delivered for so many. Thank you for your service to the Parliament, to the Greens, and for your friendship and support during my time in the Senate. And those words, of course, are from former Senator and former Leader of the Australian Greens, Christine Milne. As usual, Christine and Bob are far more eloquent uh, than I'm able to be, so I'll just add a few brief words of my own, Rach. Rachel, you are genuinely one of my political heroes. I'm in awe of what you have achieved, and I'm also in awe of how you've achieved it and how you've conducted yourself on your political journey. You've been a mighty, mighty voice and activist for First Nations people, for climate action and for nature, particularly for your beloved marine environment and even more particularly for, you, for your beloved marine environment in your beloved waters of Western Australia. Your advocacy for people doing it tough particularly those who've been left without work in our sometimes very brutal modern society, 
has been without equal in the political arena. Your participation in the campaign to increase the rate of JobKeeper helped to build a movement, and it helped give a voice to so many who at that time did not have a voice. Please be proud of what you've achieved, Rach. It's truly the most amazing record. And if I've been or, or can be half as effective as you have been, half as passionate as you are about the issues that really matter and represent people and nature with half the integrity that you have, I will end my time in politics a very happy person. As an aside, uh, I know that I've got large shoes to fill as the whip for the Australian Greens, and I might say um, my shoes will be nowhere near as fashionable as yours have consistently been during my time in the Senate. And uh, if I can whip um, our colleagues who can, I'll put it kindly, sometimes be slightly recalcitrant, uh, if I can whip them half as hard and half as well as you did, Rachel, I may have some small hope uh, of keeping them in line as well as you did. Um, Rach, I know um, for you this is not you know, retirement from active life. It's not retirement from activism. It is simply retirement from the Senate. And I have no doubt there'll be so many people uh, and, in fact, our planet will have cause to thank you for your relentless advocacy and your relentless activism into the future. Please take great care of yourself. Take great care of those that you love. And you and yours are always welcome back to our rustic little shack in the bush down on the Tasman Peninsula. You are, Rachel, truly the most beautiful and amazing human. All the very best. Senator Dean Smith. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Um, Senator Seward, Rachel, uh, as whips, I know that uh, the brevity of my remarks will not be taken as uh, disinterest, but as uh, whips in this Senate, um, and no one knows this more than you as a result of the length of service that you have been the whip for the Australian Greens, our job is to make it work for everybody else. Uh, and often that means uh, sacrificing the things that are important to us and sacrificing the contributions that we might like to make. But I will make my comments brief in order to allow the many others that are still to make their contributions have an opportunity. In your contribution, you talked about uh, being disappointed and frustrated with the action on climate matters. But I think uh, by any measure, your contribution on so many issues leaves no space for disappointment, no space for frustration. And I just want to reflect on one, and it's probably not I don't expect you to remember the time that you first met me, but I certainly remember the time that I first met you, and we were in Alice Springs, and we're doing a committee inquiry into low aromatic fuel. Your contribution in keeping young indigenous people safe in remote communities across our country has not deserved the has not had the heraldry that I think it deserves. That private senator's bill that you brought to this place and which was agreed, and which was sent to the other place and which was agreed, is just one of thirty private senators bills or private members bills that have made it into law in the history of this country since nineteen hundred and one. That is a remarkable achievement on an issue that has absolutely gone a long way to ensure that young people, not just Indigenous but predominantly Indigenous, are kept from harm's way. I have admired the way that you have worked. Your conviction, your integrity is a model that senators in this place and senators that are yet to come can style themselves on. You reflected quite accurately that not enough gets talked about all the things that we do agree on and all the things that we work so constructively on and that change the lived experience for so many people in our country. Our names will not be remembered in the future, but the legacy 
that some of us have been able to live, to, to, to deliver for other people will be felt. And I just, it's hard to imagine someone who has made a more lasting contribution to improving the lived experience of so many people. One of the things that I have observed working closely with you is how important it is for people to have a voice on issues. How important it is and how empowering it is for those people when they get heard by senators through the parliamentary committee process or through other means. You drive a hard bargain as a whip, um, but what I have always enjoyed is that yesterday's challenges are not carried over today or into tomorrow. And that is a real testimony, testimony to your graciousness and your decency as a, as a person. And you mentioned that, uh, you, know, um, that you, you come to this place um, having, come, having followed other Green senators, um, and as significant as their contributions were in their own way, uh, your contribution is the force from the West. Your contribution is the one that I think that many, many people uh, should set themselves and style themselves upon because it has just been so significant. I've enjoyed working with you on grandparent carers. I've enjoyed working with you on the important issues around the National Redress Scheme. I've enjoyed hearing your contributions about the Kimberley in the adjournment debates, even though we might disagree with what is, getting to, what, what is the right way to get to, to improving Indigenous disadvantage in this country and preserving the Kimberley's wonderful environment. Uh, congratulations. It has been a remarkable achievement. Uh, I'm sure there are more things for you to do, uh, and I look forward to supporting you in whatever way I can uh, over the future. But congratulations to you and uh, best wishes to you and your family for the future. Senator Rice. Thanks, President. And Rach, we're just going to miss you so much. The contributions that people have made this evening just show how loved you are and what a massive contribution you have made, what a difference you have made to the people of Australia, to the other creatures that we share this planet with, to the people of the world. Um, and it's a, a huge contribution. And you are such a, a role model that I have looked up to and think in terms of working together and working collaboratively of what you can achieve by doing that. Such a combination which is so rare in this place of being that mixture of absolutely steely determination and on top of your game and determined to go for it, but with a heart of gold and that love and care. And I think that's at the core of what makes you and your contribution so special, that it is grounded in love. It's grounded in love and care. And so then it's treating everyone genuinely that you have invited in, that you have worked with, that um, you want, you genuinely respect them and want to see people to be able to achieve their best. You want everyone to have the opportunities that you know that we all deserve. Um, and as that, you, that's why you have achieved so much and that's why everyone respects you. And it's why, and I think it's, it's grounded, I mean, you said in your, the beginning of your contribution tonight that you said you took a bit of time to work out whether you were really a politician. And in fact, that makes you the best sort of politician and of which there are so few people in this place that have got that, that genuineness, that care, that, that love for people, for humanity, for the planet, that you bring every ounce of your being um, with and every ounce of the work that you do is imbued with that love and that care. Um, I think the thing that I really appreciate about you and having worked side by side with you, it is that combination of being on top of your game and knowing that, that such, such knowledge, such ability to, to know what, what has to happen and with that determination, but that collaborative approach. And, and it's a, working with people to achieve those outcomes. The other thing that I really think 
and um, we know your amazing suite of work that you've done in this place on making life better for people and sort of the social services and improving people's lot. But I know that your passion for nature is just as much there and particularly your, the, the wonderful, beautiful environments of Western Australia, from the forests of Southwest WA through to the Ningaloo, roof, Ningaloo Reef, and, and, and that you derive so much joy and so much support from being in nature. Um, and for that, you know, I really feel that, that so much resonates with me as well. The other thing that I have really, you know, it's just been so so wonderful to work alongside you is both being women, we're a very similar age, having come through the environment movement and then in the Senate and coping with, with you know, the issues that go with being a woman of the age that we are, of, you know, who aren't always treated seriously. And so, you know, women in their 40s, 50s and 60s who the world can just look through and having to actually speak up and 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 have attention paid to you and the way that you have done that has just been a lesson for everybody um i agree with with senator smith that and others that your record it's been understated I mean, people don't know what you have contributed to the country and to the world um because you are so humble and i hope that having this you know valedictory speeches tonight people will realize what a special contribution it is and it should be sung from the you know from the rooftops um because it's the sort of thing that people want to see in their politicians people are cynical about their politicians because they think that they don't really care with you know they're just in it for themselves whereas your experience and your contribution has shown that that's not the case um, that you are there out of love, you are there out of care, you are there out of, out of that determination to be doing good for people on the planet. So, look, we're going to miss you. Your shoes are enormous. You absolutely are the hardest working person in the place. You know, it would take six senators, I think, to, to replace you. So we're all just going to have to struggle along to get by without Rachel. And I just, yeah, really... Um, Thank you. What well, just want to thank you for your contribution, and and really wish you all the best. You have more time with your family, you know, looking after your your elderly mum. Another thing that we've got in common, and sort of juggling those family responsibilities, and know that yeah, just just have a bit more time to enjoy yourself and to really enjoy the fruits of of knowing that that you've done what you were able to do in your time here. So thank you, Rach. Senator Wish Wilson. Thanks. Rach, I was thinking you didn't deserve to be here tonight without your without your colleagues and, and a full Senate. Um, but on reflection about that, I thought, well, you know, there's a lot of battlers out there, there's a lot of Aussies doing it tough. And and you've been such a champion for those people for so long that I'm sure you'd be taking this in your stride. This is a time in history that it is what it is, and tonight is what it is. And we would all love to be with you tonight and, and share in this moment, but we can do that through this remarkable technology um, that we're seeing this through tonight. Um, there's been so much said already that I, that I agree with. Um, in this kind of age of populism, uh, you know, the, the age of demagogues, which go all the way back to Roman days, where it's about getting short grabs on media and it's, it's about getting attention and uh, getting in the media frame. You know, I reflect on the work that you do. Christine's absolutely right about you being an unsung hero. The, the amount of hours you put in, it's been talked about your committee work and the work you've done for the Senate, but we also know the work you put into our party. Uh, to you know, to work across the states and across our national council, uh, it's just it's remarkable. It's remarkable how you do that. I think one of the most common questions we all get as senators is, how can you do this? How can you do this every day? How can you deal with the things that get thrown at you and and seeing people constantly undermining climate action, all the things we stand for? And I think it takes a very remarkable person to be resilient in the face of that and continue to chip away and never give up and always remain optimistic and always take action. And I think um, 
you know, you are you are a siren song to that, and and, and your career is is so. Um, like me, I know you're a saltwater person. Took me a few years to wrestle the uh, healthy oceans portfolio off you, but I just, I just wanted to acknowledge tonight. Um, it has been mentioned in a few of the contributions. Uh, your background, the work you've done to the oceans, all the work you put into the National Marine Parks campaign over many years before Parliament and in Parliament, the work you've done for Ningaloo, for sharks, for whales. You know, you've been you've been a great role model for me, and I thank you from the bottom of my heart for all the work that you've done for the oceans. And you know, it, it's an interesting reflection. We people often frame the Greens as being either social justice greens or, or environmental greens, and the media love to have a field day with this as to our detractors. But look at you as an example. You, you've been, you've been, you've got an amazing history working for the environment, uh, on climate change, on oceans, and a whole range of issues. And here you are, the accolades you've received tonight, uh, all the work you've done, tackling inequality and standing up for the battlers of this country, for the underprivileged for those doing it tough. Um, in many ways, you are the complete green. Uh, and can I, can I say, can I say, watching all this, these speeches tonight, what a bloody great minister you would have made if the Greens had been in government. Seriously, like, who else, who else has got the talent pool uh, that we have got? And you are a classic example of that. Like the country is missing out by not having people like you, Rachel, uh, in ministerial positions. If you've been able to do what you've been able to do without being a minister, imagine what this country could do with the Greens in government. Um, I don't want to be political and this say, but I actually really mean that. I really, really mean that. Um, I've, I'll be honest. I, I will. I will finish up very soon. I, I don't get intimidated by many people, being the person I am, but I've always been a little bit intimidated by you, Rachel. I've known my place around you. I might have, I might, I might well be one of those recalcitrant uh, senators Nick McKim was referring to earlier, but um, I remember when I had my first weekend with you and Fluff down in yelling up. Uh, Nat and I got there quite late. It was getting dark and you'd arranged for me to have a mini mail and you gave me a vest to wear and Fluff said, come on, let's go and get some waves. And you and I and Fluff walked down to the beach. Nat was uh, up, at, up at the reading a book. And I was thinking to myself, crikey, it's getting dark. What are we doing? And I paddled out. There was still some light to see a couple of waves. It was pretty big. I think we'd been informed there'd been a white shark in the area just a few days before. Uh, and there were, there were Fluff and I sitting out there. Got a few waves. Took me maybe two or three attempts to get out. And I said to him, mate, it's getting a bit dark. Don't you think we should be going in? And he's like, no, that's, that's the whole point. The show starts when it gets dark. Who's going to turn the lights on on his surfboard? And I was sitting out there a shark bait thinking, I'm caught between the devil and the deep blue sea here. I don't want to let down Rachel. <laughs> I don't want to look weak. Uh, or, or I'm going to get eaten by a shark in, in the dark at yelling up, um, which is a pretty intimidating place to be. So... Um, look, you know, I'd also like to say that your wedding uh, down at Yelling Up, uh, I think was my happiest moment uh, in the Greens, with the Greens party room. The way you pulled everyone together, it was just such a beautiful night. In fact, it was, it was just an amazing weekend. So um, thank you for being a friend to me when I started. Thank you being, for being a mentor. Thank you for putting up with me as a whip. Uh, and I look forward to working with you for many, many more years on oceans and on the issues that really matter. Good on you, Rach. Just for the information of senators, it's 7.20 when the adjournment is scheduled to commence. I'll be seeking the leave of the Senate to continue this until 7.55 when I have one adjournment speech to turn to. So I'm going to ask senators, particularly those not from the Greens, to be considerate of their Greens colleagues who have yet to speak, because I still have a dozen speakers on the speakers list. Senator Askew. Thank you, Mr President, and I will be brief. I just simply wish to associate myself with the comments made around the chamber this evening, um, especially in recognition of Rachel's service to this place. Um, as we heard earlier, Rachel has been the chair of the Community Affairs Reference Committee for many years, 
And upon my arrival here in 2019, I became her deputy chair and chair of the ledge committee and have had the opportunity to work very closely with you since. I cannot express more sincerely my thanks to you um, for your support since that time. It's been amazing and I've really enjoyed having the opportunity to work with you, I've, um, especially like in committee hearings especially, but also when we've had the opportunity to attend hearings around the country when we were able to travel. Um, it just gave us that opportunity to work closely and to get to know each other better. I've found that you're a very genuine person. You genuinely believe in what you do and you represent your constituency faithfully. And as many people have discussed it this evening already, your immense capability and your capacity for workload is beyond belief. Your passion for the portfolio areas that are encompassed by the, human, uh, the Community Affairs Committee um, it's clearly evident of your commitment to the cause and the way you undertake your role, so well done and thank you. Although we don't always agree on policy, we have always been able to respect each other's differing opinions and work together in a professional and collegiate manner. And I think most people around the, the chamber have mentioned similar things today, so thank you for that. I'd like to take this opportunity to wish you all the best for the future, genuinely, for whatever comes next. And I look forward to no doubt crossing paths with you in the future. And I just want to wish you all the best for your family because I know that that has been the driving force behind your decision and I hope that everything goes well with your mum and your family and that you enjoy spending more time together. So thank you for your service to this place and thank you for your caring friendship. Thank you. Senator Steele John. Thank you, Mr. Mr. President. Now, in talking with Rach about uh, this speech um, uh, tonight, I repeatedly uh, promised that I wouldn't say anything embarrassing or that would make her cry, um, and I will endeavour to keep that promise. Um, I have also taken an unusual step and written most of this down um, in the knowledge that probably at some point during this uh, contribution I am likely to start crying myself. Uh, but here we go, anyway. So, Senator Rachel Seavers or Rach, as anybody that's ever met you, uh, actually always calls you at all times, apart from committee um, and during question time. Uh, you are one of the most impressive people I have ever met. I've been in awe of you since the first time we ever interacted uh, in the Greens WA. Rachel, you generously share your experience, your, your wisdom, and your ability as an authentic and fearless campaigner with anybody and everybody that asks you. You are truly the master of Senate procedure. Um, nobody uh, after you will ever, I think, come anywhere near as close to your knowledge of how the chamber works as you, and we will do our best uh, to fumble on in your absence. Uh, but I thank, I thank the stars uh, that you will, I'm sure, after a break, be at the end of the phone for us to ask some questions of. Your commitment to our green movement runs so deep that I swear that if you banged yourself, you would literally bleed green. Your commitment to consensus, our four pillars, and your loyalty to ensuring that our members and their needs and the needs of community are centred, as well as the environment, is absolutely incredible. You are a true custodian of our movement, determined, driven, and deeply passionate. You, can, you possess from those things this incredible frustration uh, and indignity in the face of injustice that I think echoes the feeling of so many in our community and gives all around you the energy to continue the fight. In thinking about how to summarise such an incredible career and such an incredible experience of working with you over the last three and a half years, these words of determination, of passion, and of deep commitment spring straight to the front of my mind. A defining thread that weaves through every aspect of your work is a soul-deep commitment 
to centering the needs of the community who are so often shut out of this place. This commitment has shone through with the number of committees, inquiries that you've established, chaired and participated in. And I am absolutely sure if the Guinness World uh, Book of World Records ever decides to name it up and test uh, the, the, the record winner of the person that has spent the most hours in committee, it will be you easily. So I suggest you take some time in your retirement to send them an email because you'll surely get the record, I think, in the post. Um, and my goodness, the, the outcomes that you have achieved for the community in this time are an incredible testament to all the values and the hard work that you bring. And I, I want to name up a few of them, uh, because if I spent the whole time doing it, we would be here until tomorrow morning. And as Whip, you'd probably be texting me halfway through telling me to shut up. So I'll name just a few. Um, your work uh, leading the campaign to increase income support uh, is absolutely defining. You have fought tooth and nail for your entire career not only to support uh, people that need it across the spectrum, but also on that specific issue of increasing income support, and also uh, in ensuring that the robo-debt scandal was called out and called up immediately. And it is you, I think, uh, that deserve, deserves the lion's share of the, of, the, uh, of the congratulations alongside the community for the work that you did in revealing the absolute scandal uh, of robo debt, uh, others may well have come on board, but in the curry, in the wake of your courage and your fearlessness, they swam. And because of that dedication to that issue and that community that was affected, uh, there is now an opportunity for justice and redress for people that were affected. And so too. Uh, in your opposition to the cashless debit card. Absolutely incredible, vital work that you led alongside the community from the front, fearlessly always. As a disabled person and as a member of the disability community, I feel a great sense of debt and gratitude to you for your work uh, in the inquiry into violence, abuse and exploitation of disabled people. That was in itself a historic investigation uh, into those issues that resulted in a recommendation which ended up in the realisation of a Royal Commission. And just today, um, we have seen another opportunity to strengthen that investigation, uh, an investigation that you played an incredible role uh, in bringing together and making the case for. Also on older Australians, I, I will never forget uh, the first time we had a detailed conversation about aged care uh, and you spent i think somewhere in the middle somewhere in the midst of 30 minutes explaining to me the acfi um the aged care uh, funding instrument which i have never forgotten uh that acronym and what it means and the fact that nobody else seems to know what it is how it works or why it's listed at the levels of funding <laughs> Um, that it is. And, and it was this window into this incredible uh, cache of knowledge that you hold. And in reflecting on, on adding it to this yesterday, uh, I was triggered to think about how many times in the last three years the sentence, oh, I'll ask Rach, or Rachel, no, or I bet Rach was around for that, I'll give her a buzz, have gone through my head. Um, and the reality uh, that that's uh, you are, are ending your, your time formally with us, uh, is tempered only in the uh, anxiety that induces by the knowledge that after a very good rest, um, I know that you will uh, be at the end of the telephone uh, or at the end of the email uh, if we need to know what a committee did in 2005 in relation to a detailed piece of legislation, because you will still know, I'm absolutely sure. Um, on, on the environment and on marine parks but, uh, particularly, there is nobody that I have ever seen um, speak with passion, um, with such passion and intelligence uh, in relation to 
not only the need to protect our precious places, the marine environment, but also the knowledge of actually how to get it done. Um, and the work that you did in establishing that uh, system of marine parks, um, it stands, I think, uh, as still the model that we should now be working uh, to go back to and to improve on. You've been a fearless champion uh, for the natural precious places of our uh, state of WA, um, and there is so much good that has come from your commitment, uh, particularly to places like James Price Point, uh, the Kimberley generally, and in, indeed to Ningaloo um, as well. Through the, through the highs and lows of the last 16 years, you have always been there for us as a movement, prepared to advocate for community and our planet, always offering a way forward. I would, in, in talking about your incredible contribution tonight, be remiss not to acknowledge the, the fabulous team that you have had over the years. Uh, to all of Team Rach, I'd like to thank you for your energy and your commitment to our movement. You have supported, led, managed, rescheduled, drafted and campaigned like the best of them. And I want to thank you for that, as Rachel has done too. Uh, to, to Rach, my, my, my very good friend and dearest Senate colleague, I hope that your days are filled with as many peanut M&Ms as you can eat. Ocean, ocean paddle boards and sunny days in the southwest. You are truly one of the great, powerful women from the West of Greens movement. I look forward to continuing to see you on the floor of every Green event with <laughs> showing us all absolutely how it's done. If you haven't seen Chris and Rach hit the floor at an event. You haven't seen two people hit the floor. As we continue our fight for people and planet, I want to thank you sincerely from the depths of my heart for your wisdom, for your encouragement, and for setting an example of what it means to be a Green who advocates for our community and for our planet in this place and at all times. I will miss you, mate. I will miss you dearly. Although, as I keep having to remind myself and everybody around me, it seems, you're not actually dying. You're, <laughs> you're just going for a good rest that is damn well, well deserved. Um, and then you'll be on to your next big thing. On behalf of everyone in WA, I want to thank you for all that you have done, for every moment of service and devotion and dedication, all of the weekends, all of the long weekends, all of the calls taken even though you were on holiday, all of the committee meetings chaired at four o'clock in the morning, all of the times that you've had to grit your teeth, and uh, suppress what you might have said uh, because we haven't turned up to the vote or we don't know what we're doing. Um, for your forbearance and your fearlessness, I, I thank you uh, from the depths of my heart um, and wish you the very, very best in the next chapter of your incredible life. Wow, a green spoon. Okay, I'll remind senators we have 35 minutes to go and a dozen speakers left, so particularly with a couple of Senator uh, Seawood's colleagues to go. Senator Davey. Thank you. And uh, acknowledging the amount of people that are left, I will um, keep it brief. Uh, but I really did want to rise to say thank you to Senator Seawood. Uh, when I entered the Australian Parliament in 2019, which is a very short time ago compared to um, Rachel, but like Rachel, I was thrown into the deep end, and on day one, I became my party's whip in the Senate. 
Um, I had no idea what the job entailed, where I needed to be or what I needed to do. And the only way I was able to learn was from my fellow cross-party whips, Senator Urquhart, Senator Smith and Senator Seawirt. And I think together we've been a very good team. Uh, Senator Seawirt has been a role model in this regard. She's been open. She's been very patient with me. Uh, and I, as I learned the ropes, she's shown a willingness to work across partisan lines on procedure and administrative operations in the best interests of this parliament that allows us to focus our attention on what we are actually here to do, which is to represent our constituents. And she does that to her fullest. She is proof that showing people respect does not compromise values or ideology. And this reflects the kind of person she is. She is thoughtful, she is driven, and she is highly, highly passionate. Uh, and for that, I thank her. I mean, one of the greatest things any of us, any Australian, can do is put their hand up for federal parliament and office. And uh, Senator Seawirt did that in 2005, and many people before me tonight have spoken on all her achievements. Um, and so I want to let other people have a turn to say their thanks and their piece. So I'll cut out half of what I was going to say. Um, but I do want to highlight that, uh, Rachel, you are one of the lucky ones in this house, uh, in this chamber. You get to leave on your terms, not those of the Australian voters, nor those of a party executive. And that is to be commended. Uh, and to be valued and to be cherished. And although most of our political views differ, one thing we do both agree on is that we both want to leave this place better than when we entered. And I certainly think that through your work, you have achieved that over the 16 years. Um, and I congratulate you for all of your efforts. And I want to just say thank you, Senator Seward. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you for your patience, your help and your support. Thank you for your kindness and thank you for your contribution in this chamber on behalf of your constituents and your party and all of Australia and our parliament over the years. So from whip to whip, senator to senator, person to person, I wish you all the very best in the future. Thank you. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Mr. President. Rach, before I joined this Greens dream team in the Senate, I had heard about a Senator Seward from others who had met her. I had heard about her fierce advocacy for marginalized people and for the environment and oceans. The forced adoption inquiry is one in particular that so many people and so many women I met were so thankful to you for. But Rach, what I had heard pales in comparison with what I actually saw. Rachel is a powerhouse, a powerhouse full of heart, passion, and compassion. But she also does know how to crack the whip, figuratively, of course. Keeping us unruly mob in mind, I tell you, is no easy task. But in our party room, we are all scared of not following Rachel's instructions as a whip. And weirdly enough, I will really miss your whip crack. Rachel, you're also one of the hardest working people that I have ever come across. You must surely have a few clones running around helping you out. The depth and breadth of work that you do in the party, in parliament, in committees, with communities, seems humanly impossible. Yet you do it every single day. One of the things that I've appreciated most about you, Rach, is your total no bullshit attitude. More often than not, you is inside and outside this chamber, in the party room and outside it. And this is so refreshing in a place where politicians spend so many hours honing their message that the substance often gets totally lost. I can't tell you how inspired I've been when you've just jumped on your feet and blasted the government, not just once, but again and again, 
for their punitive policies like the cashless debit card or their lack of support for the disadvantaged or when you spoke out about the illegal debacle that was RoboDebt, which harmed so many people, or when you called the abolition of motions an act of political bastardry. There are countless examples, really. Um, you are never in doubt where you stand in the sea word. I cannot tell you how, many, how much I have respected your honesty and forthrightness, even when at times it may have been something I didn't want to hear. It has been an absolute privilege and an honor to work with your age over the last three years. You're such a formidable force. You stop at nothing in your fight for some of the most vulnerable people. I will sorely miss you in the Senate. I mean, 16 years is a bloody long time to serve your community and your party so diligently and with such integrity. In your first speech, Rachel, to this chamber in August 2005, you described yourself as the fourth in line of determined green women from the West. As you said, at the heart of our green value it is a vision of community, a community that extends beyond the borders of a neighborhood, suburb or state, a community in which people care about each other and the future of our planet and act carefully and responsibly to ensure its ongoing success. Well, Senator Seward, you have left no stone unturned to push for this vision to become a reality. And you have made us all so proud to be part of the Greens movement, to change the world, to be a better place for all. From the bottom of my heart, Rach, thank you and all the very best for this new phase in your life. We love you. Senator Thorpe. Uh, thank you, President. Well, I've uh, learned so much in, in just hearing these incredible uh, yarns about an incredible woman. Uh, I haven't been as fortunate as others in spending so much time um, working with Rachel, but I've certainly been watching uh, from afar for a long time and being part of the Aboriginal community across the country, I've certainly heard a lot about Rachel Seawett because the respect and admiration that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have across this country for the work, for the dedication, for the genuine commitment, the genuine time that you spent with so many blackfellas around the country, that will never be forgotten, Rachel. And I've certainly learnt a lot from you in the short time that I've been there, but I continue to hear stories from blackfellas across the country about what you did for them way back then. Uh, and the first, first time I'd ever heard um, a whole community actually speak so strongly about their love for you was the community that were fighting the Northern Territory intervention. And I was uh, inundated with calls of support at that time, but they were very clear in saying, but we got Rachel Seward in our, you know, she's got our back, she's fighting hard. And they were sending me speeches at that time and showing me uh, what an incredible um, ally we truly had working in our space, being respected in our space, but also, um, which doesn't happen very often, is that you were welcomed into our communities and you were respected and trusted by so many communities. And that in itself um, takes a very, very long time. Um, our people are so used to you know, people saying they're going to do things and that they're going to call them back and they're going to follow up. But not one person have I ever heard say to me, Rachel didn't follow up or Rachel didn't get back. It's always Rachel has done this and Rachel has done that. And, you know, they, um, they say that uh, Nick has big shoes to fill, but I also knew that I had big shoes to fill. And I'm a black woman, got, you know, going into that space and taking on the First Nations portfolio. But 
you know, inside I was thinking, oh my gosh, I've got to do justice to this space now, uh, given what you have done. And um, I just want to say on behalf of all black fellas across the country that have shown um, their dedication to you and uh, respect to you that, you know, we are all truly thankful for what you've done. And as previous senators have said, uh, it, it has meant that you've had to take time away from your family and away from your mum. Uh, and you've done that because it's just the incredible person that you are and you, you, you want to please everybody and you do, you know, you still, I've been in situations with you where we're having a hard meeting and then mum calls and then you run out and you run back and you're straight back on the ball. Um, and yes, I am too one of those uh, green senators who is quite scared of you too and was always frightened of missing a vote or stuffing something up. And when I did stuff things up, I just think, oh gosh, Rachel's gonna kill me. Um, but you never did. You, um, you still mentored, you still provided guidance. You didn't make me feel like, you know, I was dumb. You, uh, you're just an incredible, um, an elder in my view, uh, because of your wisdom and because of um, the respect that you have from so many people um, that in my eyes is, is a true eldership that um, you've shown. Um, and, you know, elders fight for their families and fight for their communities and fight for country. Well, that's what you do too. And you also look after people. So I want to, I want to say thank you um, for that. I also want to say um, thank you for paving the way and, and walking the talk. Uh, I think Sarah was right in, in what she said about, you know, who would have thought that a black senator was going to come into that place through the Greens and, and um, you know, be an activist at that. And it's, it's work like you've done over these years that has created these spaces and allowed for, for people to wake up and realise that we, knew, we need black voices in these places, in every place where uh, decisions are being made about us. And I also want to say thank you for creating the space for Dorinda Cox um, and the mentorship over years I've been told from her uh, that you've mentored her. And now, you know, this space has been created and, and another black senator's coming in. I mean, you know, you walk the talk, Rach, you always have. Uh, someone said earlier, you know, there's basically no bullshit that comes from you. It, you say it how it is. Sorry for swearing, President, uh, but you just, you're just real. And we need real people representing real people. And the fight that you, you fought for the cashless debit card, for all of our people that have been ripped off through the, through the robo debt, you know, you, you made my heart bleed from the contributions you made because they were, they were from the people's heart and they were from the people's mouths who were suffering from all of those bad decisions. So you genuinely represent the grassroots people that are fighting for a voice in that space and I truly thank you for that. Um, and lastly, because I know there are a lot of speakers and I've, and I've only been able to work with you not quite a year because I haven't been there quite a year yet, but uh, how you run that place, I think you'd give the, the president a run for his money most of the time. I'm sure you, you know, eyeball one, one another every now and again over a certain parliamentary procedure that I have no idea about, but I can see it all working because you hold everyone to account uh, there also. Uh, but finally, Rach, um, you know, I, I just want to say that uh, I was really honoured to have you walk with me into the chamber that day. I'm sorry that um, I frightened you just before we walked in and said, I'm, a, I'm about to put my fist up 
and you went into a panic, like, oh, my God, we haven't told the president that. And I'm like, oh, does that mean I can be kicked out? And Rachel's just explaining everything really quickly and fixed it really quickly. And uh, it was just an, an absolute honour to have you walk me into that Senate. And I'll always uh, be not just a colleague, but, I, you know, a friend. Uh, and whenever you need anything, I'd love an excuse to come over there. Uh, and, yeah, our mob love you. And thank you for everything that you've done for us. Thank you. I'm just going to transact one item of business before I go to the next speaker. Senator Davey. I present reports of committees as shown at item 18 on today's order of business and I move that the reports be listed on the notice paper for consideration and I seek leave to incorporate tabling statements into the Hansard. I'll first put the motion. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Is leave granted to incorporate the tabling statements? It is. Thank you. I'll go to Senator Firavanti wells Oh, thank you, Mr. President. And um, Rachel, um, I too wanted just to add some comments. A fitting, uh, given that um, we're of the class of 2004, and uh, I'm uh, I snuck in a bit before uh, you all uh, uh, after that 2004 election. But I just looking at the order of seniority. There's me, there's Senator Polly, there's Senator Stirl, and then there's you. So then there were three. So, um, look, I just wanted uh, just to say um, you've done a fabulous job here. I know that uh, people have mentioned about you being the whip. Even though there was a small number of you, I think that at times it looked like uh, it was a bit of an arduous task at times, but um, you were a bit like the duck, you know, paddling underneath and serene on top. Uh, look, you and I worked very, very closely together on community affairs. I served on that committee. Um, you chaired and you were involved in the, in the committee and you chaired the references committee. And I know that what a lot of people don't understand is that a lot of the work that we did on that committee was bipartisan. We produced some really good reports, reports that others have referred to, but we always strived on that committee to ensure that what we produced was as bipartisan as it could be, tripartisan as it could be, because we knew that that made the report stronger and that there was a greater chance that action would be taken in relation to it. Um, when I was uh, Shadow Minister for Ageing and Mental Health, uh, I know that uh, for many years, 2009 to 2013, we worked very, very closely on that committee on so many different things. And also when I was parliamentary uh, secretary to the Minister for Social Services. And I know that there are things that we've shared in common, particularly on aged care. And can I thank you um, for the work that we were able to do uh, on so many different areas, particularly in aged care. And it doesn't surprise me, Rachel, um, to know that you know now you've got your commitment with your mum. I too share that, uh, and I know what it's like um, to have aging parents and feel that need um, to be with them at this particular time. Um, can I just say I've always um, respected the passion and commitment uh, with which you have undertaken uh, the work that you've done in the belief that you were standing up for uh, your values and beliefs different to my values and beliefs at times, but um, I respected your passion that you were doing so because that was in the best interests of the people that you were representing. And uh, can I wish you all the very, very best to you and to your family. I know that you are not retiring uh, from public life. I'm sure that you will continue in your inimitable way uh, to ensure that your voice uh, is uh, heard. Um, can I congratulate you for your many years of service uh, to the Senate and wish you and your family all the very, very best uh, in the next phase of your life? Senator Pratt. Rachel, uh, you are a woman of great conscience, discipline and influence, and it's been an honour to work with you in this place. The, your in-depth knowledge of the Social Security Act is something I can aspire to, but mostly uh, that's come from the way you've listened to people and their experiences. And I want to really acknowledge how you've been 
a good conscience in this place to call people out. Um, I hold you in the same esteem as I do my good friend Giz Watson, and uh, it's a great. <laughs> That's uh, by creating a parallel with her for your influence and friendship. That is the best way in as short a words as possible as I can indicate the esteem uh, with which I hold you and your contribution. Um, and so with that, I wish you all the best and I know that you will continue to influence decisions in this place just as um, the likes of uh, Joe Valentine, Dee Maggetts and Christabel Chamaret. Thank you. Senator Colbert. Thank you, Mr President. Um, and I know I would very much like to associate myself with the comments of so many across the chamber, not necessarily in respect of all the philosophy, but uh, to pay tribute to you, Senator Seward, um, Rach, um, for the work that you've done. Like so many others, we've crossed paths on and around community affairs, on the same side of the table at times, but also on opposite sides. Um, one of the scarier moments for me, uh, I have to say, was the number of times we were asking almost the identical question. Now, I'm not sure whether it was from the same perspective or not, but it usually was, uh, because what, what we were both trying to achieve, and I think it's a hallmark of uh, your service to the parliament and to the Australian people. We're always looking to achieve the same thing, and that's to make things better for people. Now, we might not always have had the same solution, but we were certainly looking to achieve that. And I, and I have to say that's something that I very much appreciate um, from you in the context of our dealings um, through portfolio work that I'm doing now and the things that I know that you're passionate about. The fact that I could sit down with you, we could work through something, um, we could come to a solution. Uh, and the fact that you have been able to get so many things done, which has been something that's been reflected on uh, during so many speeches tonight, is the way that you have gone about your business here in this place. And I know that that's very much appreciated by people across the chamber. Um, very much in the context of respect trust and integrity, and those are really, I think, important values um, that you bring here. I know that I could sit down and work through a, progress, a process with you, and then that could be seen to fruition. Um, colleagues always have listened to you, perhaps not so much when you were shouting at us, but the reality is that you actually didn't need to because you had built that respect, you had built that trust, you had built that um, integrity with people so that, um, so that you didn't have to shout at us. Because, as has been said so many times, you, we knew you were across your stuff, you knew that you were looking for a genuine solution. So, and, and I wasn't aware of the, the fact, and it is in the context of the operation of the parliament, the fact that there's one of 30 pieces of legislation that are private senators' bills in the history of this place that have been passed through both houses of parliament um, is one of those things that you can take with you as a person who's served in this place um, as, a, as a, a point of moment, because there are obviously so very few of them. It's a demonstration of the respect that you've earned. Uh, it's been expressed by so many here, uh, and that you now go on to play an important role in a family sense, and that's part of your decision making. I understand very much from our private conversations that we've had, um, and I wish you all the very, very best for that. Uh, and, and thank you for the collegiate nature under which you've uh, interacted with all of us in the chamber. Uh, all the very best for the family things, but also whatever else it is, and, and congratulations uh, on the service that you provided to this place but also to Australia as part of what you've come here to do, which is to make things better for people, and you certainly are one of the people who's actually achieved a lot of that. Congratulations. Senator Patrick. Thank you very much, Mr President. Look, Rachel, I'll be very, very short. I actually don't have a perfect relationship with you. I've spent lots and lots of time 
talking to you and the reason I don't have a personal relationship is because you're always working. You are a machine. I, I say that with an engineering background, it's, it's a compliment. I'll <laughs> be running on renewable energy. Um, look, the Senate will be a worse place for you. I just want to say one last thing. Uh, back in the moment, uh, you were in a committee room asking for a document that uh, Services Australia claimed was uh, cabinet in confidence. The matter made, made it to the AAT, and the moment I get that document, I'm going to uh, I'm going to be giving you a phone call. Thank you. Um, I'll bring the statements to a conclusion myself, if I may. Um, being a senator from Western Australia and other parts it poses unique challenges. Um, the distances travelled, the time spent away from home, uh, are so much greater than those of us um, who um, happen to reside closer to Canberra. Um, a number of senators and yourself, Senator C, would have commented upon the unique burdens and appreciation of your family uh, and the challenges you have faced. And um, those of us who have you've spoken to about it particularly acknowledge that. Um, the, the burdens of serving from Western Australia, particularly with your work workload over such a period, are quite extraordinary. Um, I would like to associate myself with other colleagues' statements, um, but particularly make some observations from my role as president. Um, through all my time here, you have had a unique standing amongst the stakeholders with whom you have worked. Uh, as Senator Birmingham outlined, your passion reflected your genuine concern at those often lacking a voice or feeling like they lacked a voice or lacking someone that spoke for them in this place that you sought to represent. But as president, I'd like to acknowledge your role and contribution in making this place work. Um, a couple of people have commented that whips have a reputation outside this place that doesn't reflect all their work, um, as well as being disciplinarians, as your colleagues have so graciously outlined. Um, the whips really do so much to facilitate the operation of the Senate, and we must remember it is the Senate that effectively decides the passage of legislation in this country. It is a hard, not fairly acknowledged role, but it is utterly integral to the role and the work we do here. Not only are you, as I understand, the longest serving whip in the building, um, I understand also the longest serving committee chair in the building, uh, in this place or the other place. You have been an absolutely critical cog in the machinery of the Senate and therefore the entire parliament. Others have rightly acknowledged your enormous contribution and your work in social, community and health policy. But as president, I'd like to acknowledge your critical work in making parliament work and offer my personal thanks for the work and all the efforts you've done to assist me in my role. You have always been honest, clear, trustworthy and committed to ensuring all senators can be their best and seek to strive the people as much as they can. Congratulations, Senator Seward. It being near no other contributions, um, we have one adjournment speech, so I'll propose that the Senate do now adjourn and call Senator Patrick. Thank you, Mr President. I wish to speak this evening about Australia's bushfire preparedness. We are now in the last week of August 2021. It's worth remembering that the fire season of 2019-20 began in September and lasted until March. By the time those terrible fires subsided, some 18.6 million hectares had been burnt, 34 lives were lost in flames, and another 445 deaths caused by smoke. Economic losses were $103 billion. There had been plenty of warnings. As the bushfire season approached, 23 former fire chiefs and scientists warned the Prime Minister of the looming danger and urged him to boost the nation's aerial fire capacity. Scott Morrison couldn't be bothered meeting with them. As other experts uh, issued a stark warning of above normal fire potential for southeastern Australia, the Commonwealth Government sat on its hands, afraid to acknowledge the reality of climate change. And, a, and huge areas of New South Wales and Victoria were already engulfed with flames when the PM went on a holiday to Hawaii. He sought to defend the dereliction of duty with his infamous line, you know, I don't hold a hose, mate and I don't sit in a control room. He should have been sitting in a cabinet room. The Commonwealth did not provide assistance, um, oh, sorry, did provide assistance, especially defence force capabilities, but it came much too late. This year's scorching uh, heat waves and wildfires of recent months across the Northern Hemisphere again tell us that climate change is impacting across the globe. We don't know what the next Australian uh, fire season will be like, 
but it's inevitable that our turn will come again sooner or later. In October 2020, the, Royal, the Bushfire Royal Commission recommended that the Commonwealth, State and Territory Governments develop an Australian-based and registered national aerial firefighting capability to be tasked according to the greatest national need. The Commission recommended that sovereign capability include large air tankers and Type 1 helicopter capabilities with supporting infrastructure, as well as other surveillance, transport and logistic assets. The Morrison government offered support in principle for most of the Royal Commission's recommendations, but notably the proposal for a national aerial firefighting fleet, not for the uh, proposal for the national aerial firefighting fleet. Instead, they indicated that it was a matter for the states and territories. In February, in a letter tabled in the Senate, the Minister for Agriculture, Drought and Emergency Management, Mr Little Proud, claimed that the government still needed, and I quote, a full and evidence-based understanding of the uh, capability actually required. I was huge, hugely unimpressed by that. After all, we've had multiple inquiries, investigations and reports, including the 2020 Royal Commission. But once again, the government was kicking the can down the road, finding excuses to avoid substantial commitments. Now, in the 2021 budget, the government did commit to a modest $11 million per annum boost in the funding for the National Aerial uh, Firefighting Centre, bringing the annual Commonwealth commitment to $26 million, a very small change in the overall budgetary context or the potential cost of future fires. There's still no acceptance, acceptance of the need for a sovereign aerial firefighting capability and the substantial Commonwealth commitment that must go with that. The Prime Minister just can't bring himself to admit that he should have listened to the fire chiefs. The need for a sovereign capability is ever more apparent in the northern and southern hemispheres uh, as, as the northern and some southern hemispheres uh, fire seasons get longer and increasingly overlap, limiting the availability of least large firefighting aircraft. I don't expect that the government will change its mind. However, as we approach the fire season, I think that the Minister for Emergency Management and National Recovery and Resilience, Senator McKenzie, or better still, the Prime Minister, should make a comprehensive statement uh, out uh, to, as to the Commonwealth Government's preparedness to respond to a national bushfire emergency in the 2020-21 uh, fire season. Such a statement should cover the Commonwealth's support for aerial firefighting, uh, Australian Defence Force capability and readiness, the, the capacity of the Emergency Management Australia and all other agencies that would support bushfire response and recovery efforts. On the basis of such a statement, we could all evaluate just how ready the Commonwealth Government is. More dangerous fire seasons are coming and we need to be prepared. Thank you. Mr President. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Mr President. Over the last two weeks, we've seen alarming revelations in Australian media about the extent and character of far-right organizing in this country. The Nazis Next Door investigation conducted by the Nine Papers and 60 Minutes in collaboration with anti-fascist researchers has revealed some dark truths about the growing threat of white supremacy and far-right extremism. The investigation was shocking but not entirely surprising for those of us who have followed the rise of the far right closely and are impacted by racism and its deadly consequences. The far right is organized, security conscious, and internationally connected. Alarmingly, some members are military trained and have access to weaponry. The potentially horrific consequences of this should not be understated. These people, mostly men, want nothing less than a white ethnostate and violence against minorities and anti-racists who seek to stand in its way. They pose an existential threat to our multicultural society. We have to deal with right-wing extremists and also the political environment in which they are emboldened and led down a path of hate. Too often, racism is given a free pass in media and mainstream politics. In some situations, far-right figures are given sympathetic platforms in broadcast media and have connections to sitting MPs. The former Australian neo-Nazi leader Blair Cottrell was infamously given a very soft interview on Sky News in 2018. Earlier, Cottrell contributed to a panel discussion on the ABC. While he was subsequently banned from Sky, the channel continues to platform extremists and racists. 
Right-wing politicians have fueled racism in Australia and created an environment that is ripe for this rapid growth of the far right through mainstreaming their dangerous ideologies and enabling far right groups to recruit members. Some have been directly supportive of far right groups, like the member for Kennedy, Kennedy Bob Catter, who in 2017 made a pledge of allegiance to the Proud Boys, a far right extremist group that has since been labeled a terrorist organization in Canada. Former Senator Fraser Anning was a member of Mr. Catter's political party. Let's not forget Mr. Anning associated with neo-Nazis and white supremacists and blamed Muslim immigration for the Christchurch mosque massacre. The member for Dawson, Mr. Christensen, who is a nationals member of this government, also has long standing and documented links to the far right in this country. From his appearances at so-called Reclaim Australia rallies as far back as 2015, to his interviews on far-right podcasts that have also hosted neo-Nazis and white supremacists. It is impossible to deny that Mr. Christensen has contact with members of the far-right. There is also a relationship between the youth branches of right-wing parties in this country and far-right extremists, the likes of which we saw in the Nine investigation. In 2018, the National Party in New South Wales was rocked by revelations that far-right activists had infiltrated the state branch and taken up office-bearing positions in the Young Nationals. In the Nine investigation, an identified member of the National Socialist Network shares the same name as a former office-bearer of the Liberal Club at a university in Victoria. Now deleted Facebook posts show that the individual rather terrifyingly spoke on the affirmative side of a Liberal Club debate about whether Australia should legalize the death penalty. These connections and links go on and on and on. Honestly, I could speak at length tonight about the documented and extensive relationships between far-right extremists, mainstream media, and politics. To this point, I think this aspect of the debate has largely been missed in the response to the Nazis' next-door investigation. Yes, these young men are dangerous. Yes, their ideas are still considered repugnant and terrifying to the vast majority of people. But they are not so far removed from mainstream politics and media as many might expect. And the government continues its refusal to take these matters seriously. Thank you, Mr. President. The Senate stands adjourned and will meet again tomorrow at 9.30 a.m.